Welcome to Ooh, Hey, Great Shot. This is the Great Shot Podcast, a Crack Rackets and Tennis Channel Podcast Network production. My name is Alex Gruskin. We have reached that point of the fall college tennis season, folks. The ITA National Fall Championships are upon us. The final major fall event of the 2021 college tennis season. And joining me on today's podcast to help preview all of the action is a now returning champion here on our Crack Rackets shows. Of course, you may know him as a Crack Rackets contributor at as the writer of the No Ad, No Problem but, uh, blog, I say potato, he says potato. You know him as John Parsons. John, hey, great shot. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? Always feels good to get that returning champion title. I've been waiting for that one. I'm just moving on up here uh, in the Cracked Rackets HQ, so I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Anyone who's willing to come on a third time, you must really be willing to tolerate my nonsense, so I am greatly appreciative. <laughs> I have a high that. pain tolerance. Yeah, that's what I'm starting to figure out here, but of course, the ITA National Fall Championships, a relatively new event. This used to be the National Indoor Championships. They met, then moved this event towards... Uh, in that same calendar location, excuse me, but they moved the event outdoors. They moved it onto the West Coast. It's been an exciting event over the past few seasons. And something we are extraordinarily excited about here at Crack Rackets is the fact that we're going to get to broadcast all of the action. You can follow coverage of the event from first ball to last over on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel. We will be providing what we call our red zone coverage, hopping from court to court throughout the day, covering the men's action, covering the women's action, singles, doubles, front draw, back draw, you name it. We'll be broadcasting it on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel. A couple of long days ahead, certainly and a shout out in advance to super producer Daniel Westoff. I know the, f- the job he's going to have over the next few days. I had to do the producing of the live stream for Damian Koost and uh, David Gertler this past weekend for their challenger action. And I was like, oh my God, Westoff, I'm so appreciative that you do this every time and that I don't have to. And so a shout out to him in advance, a shout out to Dan Johnson, Tim Russell, the ITA team for allowing us this opportunity. Obviously, we're extraordinarily excited to be able to highlight some so many of the top collegiate athletes across the country as they do participate in what is the final major event of the fall calendar. That's a lot of talking. I know I do apologize for that fact, Jay. I'm going to let you get a word in at some point. Before I do, though, one last piece of maintenance I have to cover here at Cracked Rackets, and that's the fact, notably, a couple of people are missing from this podcast. Matt Stachowiak, Chris Halioris, both busy this week with various things in their real world life. For Chris, as a matter of fact, it's his birthday. And look, do I like Chris? And I know I tweeted this out earlier. Absolutely not. Do I respect his opinion? Hell no, dude. Do I think he's funny? Trust me, he is not funny. Is he one of my closest friends that I've made since college? One of my closest friends, period, at this point? Absolutely. So happy birthday to the professor without whom much of our Crack Rackets content would not be possible. Westoff, cue the happy birthday sound effect for us, please. All of that said, that's the only love those two are going to get. I've moved on from them. I've told them as much. I'm like, college uh, holy trinity out. College dynamic duo in. And it's me and it's you, Jay. And what would this dynamic duo is going to be doing today? Again, previewing the ITA Fall National Championships. We're going to talk singles. We're going to talk doubles. We're going to answer four questions for each of the draws. We're going to talk about the most exciting first round matchups. We're going to talk about the seeds on upset alert, the dark horses in each draw. And then of course, it wouldn't be a draw preview if we didn't offer some predictions. So we'll do that as well. But before we get into any of that, let's go back And again, talk about this ITA fall national event, because it is one of the newest ones on the ITA calendar. I believe they started this event, and I'm going to look up the exact date now as I'm talking, but I want to say 2017 was the first year that they held this event. You look back, that event uh, was won in singles on the men's side by Nuno Borges, obviously of Mississippi State. I believe, yeah, he beat Michael Redlicky in the final of that one. It was won by Petros Frisokos. The next year, you got Ito in 2019 on the women's side. 
fascinating champions over the past th- uh, three years. You look Andrea Lazaro, 2017 out of FIU. You then had, you know, again, Jokic sort of putting her foot and establishing herself at the top of the game. She goes on to rip off an incredible 2019 season. That was the year Georgia, Stanford, UNC, all one loss essentially heading into the NCAA championships. And Jokic, I think, was an NCAA finalist uh, that season as well. You look 2019, it was the start of the GOAT ship, Sarah Dava. Tella extending her excellence into the fall individual calendar. Again, it's been a really fun event thus far. And I'm curious for, and you know, I, this is also the byproduct of the ITA regional uh, event track, where of course there are various regionals hosted across the country. The winners finalists of those regionals all earning berths into this event here this weekend. Your thoughts on the ITA national fall championships. I'll say this. It's a lot easier to say ITA Fall National Championships. If we could get a branding redo, you know I love you, Dan Johnson, but National Fall Championships just doesn't flow off the tongue as easily. Every time I say it, I have to correct myself. It would just be easier to say ITA Fall National Championships. That's the most minute thing, and that's my only criticism. What say you? Um, so first off, happy birthday to Chris. Uh, before we move <laughs> I'm glad on. you stuck I, that in. I don't want to uh, bypass that. Um So I will say this, I think one of the things that this tournament does really well is the structure. You mentioned the advancement from regional to nationals. I think that's something that's missing within the fall tournament chaos. Um, The fall schedule is pretty much a grab bag. And even for people like us who are trying to follow it as closely as possible, all of a sudden it's like XYZ Invitational, Collegiate Championship Invitational over here. It's really difficult to follow. And so the structure of you you know, two people advance from your regional finalists, you make it to this. Um, I think is one thing that the ITA does really well here. And I actually think they could extend that to something broader. It'd be great if the entire fall season led up to kind of the, the, the pinnacle tournament. So I really like that aspect of it. It feels a lot easier to digest and follow for the more casual fan, particularly giving weight to the regional tournaments, which I think can get underlooked. Um, so that part of it, I really enjoy, um, The downside of it is we need to figure out a way to keep the top collegiate players invested in the fall. And I think that's a through line of both all Americans and also this tournament as well. You know, no men from the top 10 playing in this event. And it's something that by kind of having this regional requirement, um, you see a lot of guys who don't play that and therefore aren't able to qualify. So um, on one end, I I really like the structure. I think it, it makes sense. It's easy to follow, but on the flip side, makes it a little bit more the the bar a little higher for your kind of more in and out uh, top players during the fall season to qualify. Quick correction. Whilst off, give me the correction sound effect. There was a 2020 event held. It was just only singles and it was held in Orlando uh, at the campus in Lake Nona. And so that uh, was why it didn't pop off at the meet at the top of the head. There was a singles event held last season. I believe it was one, was it DeCamps for UCF won it on the men's side or it was that an all, right. or maybe it was Hildebrand or it was an all UCF final. If memory serves me correctly, I don't remember who won it. it on was the Alexa women's. Graham on the women's yeah. side, right? Sure. If I believe it, she won she was everything. She was at least in the final. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you're right. It was the All Americans that was canceled. Yeah, um, we had no tw- All Americans 2020. This was the one that they snuck in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so under the radar. But to get well, snuck. Yeah, exactly. Hey, great shout to you. Um, two things. A, just quickly, how do you qualify for this event? Generally, it's a 64 size draw. You have the 24 regional finalists from across the country. Again, 12 regionals held. All You make the finals, you win the event, you get into it. Uh, you also have, you know, back in the day, it was it, when they do the 64 size draw, this was 2019, you would have eight ITA All-American quarter finalists. I believe they just went with the semifinalists this year, if yeah, memory so serves me correct. It's a 32 size draw. Yeah, so exactly. Strengths. And then a couple of wild cards thrown into the mix as well. Uh, obviously, it makes sense given, as you mentioned, not all of the top players will play every fall event throughout the course of the fall season. And that does get back to your point. And I do want to talk about that because I think that's interesting. And I was joking around. I don't remember if it was with Chris or with you before the podcast. I think it was with Chris when I was talking to him on his birthday here. And I was saying the uh, Fayetteville 15K this week, it might as well just be a Baylor scrimmage because literally the entire Baylor roster, excluding maybe Sven Law, who's in the draw here in San Diego and Finn Bass as well, uh, is down there competing. And 
you know, there are a bunch of other players, Alexander Rico of uh, Arkansas, who's had a fantastic fall. He's down there competing. Duarte Valle of Florida. He's down there competing as well. Uh, as you mentioned, there are plenty of players who elected to play. Uh, Liam Draxel. That's another one. Guys who yeah. went to play there. I'm sure Kingsley's in the draw. There's no way he's, he's, he, he's an Ithaca. Yeah. So here, oh, excuse so, me. Yes. Exactly. So here's, here's a stat for you. Top 10 men in Fayetteville, five. Top 10, <laughs> top 10 men in San Diego, zero. So... Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think you are insinuating it is not the best thing. I don't, I don't I want to insinuate that you're saying it's a bad thing. I think it's fine because we say it all the time here on these podcasts and we celebrate the fact of what is it, 11 men right now in the ATP Top 100 with college tennis ties. And, you know, it's four right now on the women's side, but certainly we've seen plenty of successful players make that transition as well. If college tennis is a pathway to the pros, the best in college tennis have to have opportunities to play pro circuit events. And quite frankly, you'd rather have them do it in the individual portion of the season than the team portion of the season when you're so reliant upon them to contribute to your, your lineup and to help you earn victories as a team. And if that's the sacrifice we have to make, I don't love it. You're right. It, it would be great if we could find a better way to schedule this or a better way to incentivize players playing but everything could be better. I do think this is the best you know, scenario of the situation because you have to give the top players an opportunity to go play pros. Otherwise, it's not worth it for them to you know, spend four years in college. Otherwise, you are going to get more ones and duns, twos and duns. And if we, I'd rather have four dual match seasons and only one fall than you know, just one fall, one dual match, and then you're done. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, That's, I, I, and I didn't mean to insinuate you were. I think it's just an evolution that things like ITA rankings haven't quite caught up with. Sure. Um, and, you know, the, the importance of the fall season, I think, is changing. I um, mean, some of those guys you mentioned, right, aren't even eligible for this tournament because they're just straight up <laughs> not enrolled in, yeah. in their university this fall. Um, so, I mean, look, I want to find as many opportunities for these guys and women um, to get as many pro opportunities as possible. It would just be nice to see the ITA try and find more ways to incentivize them to play. I think there could be stronger partnership opportunities with some big pro events, right? Um, where these sorts of events kind of lead to, to wild cards and have a stronger incentive structure. I would like to think that there are two ITA majors in the fall season that assuming you're enrolled in school, there's enough of an incentive to play those over a 15K um for the two weeks of the of the fall season it's an interesting debate i don't think there's an exact correct answer because it would i, I agree in the ideal world maybe you know again playing for, it, it, when oracle was involved in the event you could say an oracle had the challenger series and i know there was an absolutely a tie-in to hey you won our oracle national fall championships guess what you're going to get some wild cards into our oracle challengers if you would like unfortunately that avenue is no longer open and obviously that's a devastating development for all of us tennis fans at the same time Ithaca, you know, Cornell, obviously home of as uh, Ithaca is the home of Cornell and obviously Fayetteville, home of University of Arkansas this week. Um, the fact that we have ITF 15K events on college campuses, that's a victory like, in itself. That's something we've been clamoring yeah. for for years. And again, it's a byproduct of that fact. Now that these playing opportunities are more easily available for so many different schools, Baylor can afford to send five players to the University of Arkansas much more easily, realistically, than they can send five players to San Diego. It's not an unreasonable trade-off. And I disagree. I think, especially for those who want to make the big pro jump, like let's say Rinki Hijikata, the reason he doesn't have to come back to school is because he has killed these past five months. And he has put himself in a position to now explore the opportunity to turn pro. And ultimately that's the goal for a guy like Rinky. And I think long-term for him, it is better for him to have these competitive playing opportunities on tour right now than it would be for him to go play an ITA fall individual event. And I think that's always going to be the case because that's always the built-in incentive structure short of offering U.S. Open wildcards, because of course that, and that's a different ball game, but to ask the U.S. Open to offer three college wildcards, that's a stretch too far. That's just never going to happen. And so again, it's, I probably lean on the side of, you know, I'm asking all these college coaches in our power five interviews, NCAA uh, individuals should it be in the fall, should it be in the spring. And 
if if the entire individual season is played out in the fall, including NCAA tournaments, now it's a different discussion. Now I think you should have to play the first two events to be eligible to play for the third. But unless that's the format, I think this is it. Like this is the happy medium we have to accept because we still have plenty of good players in the field. But you, you're right; it does, you know, it does suck because we don't have the top ten guys, and there are plenty of top ten women missing as well. Yeah, I think final point on this. I think the really the 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 reason it matters most to me is because of the ITA rankings. Okay, and the we have not evolved from a ranking perspective for this notion of the top players just completely skip the fall season and come into dual play with zero points, right? We're going to enter into the fall season where most of those top 10 guys have played zero uh, college tennis matches and their ranking will be unranked. Mm -hmm. And the, the thought of them climbing back up, we're going to be in another situation where some of these guys, especially if they miss some dual matches against programs because of like pro tournaments, we're going to be in a pickle and those guys might not be ranked as high as they need to be to get into NCAAs. That's entirely what it comes down to, which is why I think this idea that the ITA is moving towards UTR for seeding is very interesting and something that we should discuss during this pod. Well, Jay, that's hand in a glove stuff there right now, because you have segued us perfectly into our next topic. And that is to help us start getting into this field here at the ITA event uh, over the course of the weekend is let's start with the seedings. Did they get the seeds right? And what was so fascinating, and obviously this is a stat I got from you in our uh, you know conversations prior to starting this podcast, is how UTR-based the seeds are here. And of course, as you mentioned, it's draws of 32 for both the men and the women in doubles. You look uh, at the seeding that they ended up having in each event, all but one exception on the women's side. It was straight UTR. You look at it, top eight seeds for the men are just the top eight UTRs. Top eight seeds for the women, seven of the top eight UTRs, uh, one exception. We'll get into her uh, in a second, I am sure. You okay with these seeds? You look up and down the field. You think they got it right? Yeah, I think they actually vary by by gender. And I, I mean, I actually think that exception probably was not intended to be an exception. We can chat about that later. Um, but you look at the top eight seeds on the men's side, it feels, de- it feels decently right. Like I would probably take the seeds against the field in this case, in terms of who's winning. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure that's the same on the women's side. The women feels a little bit more all over the place. You look at two examples, um, Irina Kanto Seamers and Natasha Subash of UVA. Of UVA. Um, they're both in the ITA top 10, but they're not ranked at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so the women's feel a little bit, maybe not quite, um, as if I were to see these myself, one through eight, where would I land? Um, there's a few outliers, whereas the men feel a little bit on the nose. Um, and yeah, I don't really have any uh, too much issues with the, with the men's side. I think the two things you call on the men's side is Aguilar and um, Finn Reynolds are two of the three highest ITA ranked guys, uh, and they're next up on the UTR list. So those are guys you might flag as maybe they should be a top eight seed, um, but otherwise feels okay. You mentioned it already, Jay. We don't have any of the top 10 men on in the men's singles field. As such, you look at the seeds, they were always going to feel a bit funky. And I think when you look up and down the list, the only guys who I think you just you had to seed regardless of order, August Holmgren, whether it was his success on the ATP2 or what he was able to do at the ITA All-American, I think we know he's going to be one of the guys at this event. And so to see him as the number three seed, I think that makes sense. Dostonic at the number four seed. We'll talk about my thoughts on his performance here. I think he's got a great draw to do some serious damage at this event. Welcome to our Crack Rackets coverage of the 2021 ITA National Fall Championships. Alex Gruskin on the call here as we watch 32 of the top men's and women's collegiate tennis players from across the country compete for the chance to be named an ITA national champion. Now, before we get to any of the matches, I want to talk all of you through our coverage planned here over the next four days. We are going to employ what we call our red zone coverage. And yes, that's a ripoff from the NFL Network. Helps all of you listeners hopefully get the picture of what we plan to do. There is so much fantastic 
tennis planned over the next four days. We don't want to miss out on any of that action. And so what we are going to do to try and A, highlight as many players as we can, but B, ensure you listeners are able to see all of the dramatic finishes, all of the thrilling action we expect to unfold throughout the course of the day. We're going to jump around throughout the course of each day's matches, go from court to court, show the break points, the set points, the match points to ensure you all have a picture of the entire scene unfolding in San Diego. We're also going to be covering this event from first ball to last. What does that mean? We start here Thursday morning at 9 a.m. on the West Coast. Of course, noon here on the East Coast. We'll go all the way through Sunday's finals. We'll be covering the doubles as well. We'll be covering the consolation action again. Again, we want to ensure you viewers, you college tennis fans get to see the entire picture as we celebrate one of the final events, if not the final event, the coup de grace of the fall college tennis season. With that in mind, let's get to our coverage. And we've got 13 courts, I believe, of action. We are uh, courts of action. We are going to be able to cover here on this stream. You're able to follow all of the action yourselves via tennis tracker and tennis ticker. You can find the links to this tennis tracker where if you want to lock in on any match in particular, you can do so on the ITA website. We are College Tennis, beautifully named, uh, of course. You can follow uh, the tennis ticker uh, app there as well tennis ticker going to have the scores for each of these matches as they unfold throughout the day but again we're going to start here in our morning session by going court to court we're going to jump around introduce each of those players competing here this morning we'll then lock in on the matches that are closest again we've got various waves of singles and doubles play scheduled here throughout the day with that in mind Let's get into it. And of course, you'll hear me reference this man constantly. He's the man behind the scenes helping all of this coverage happen. That's Super Producer Daniel Westoff. And Super Producer Westoff, if we can, let's go to our stadium court where we have the number two seed on the men's singles side in action. Stanford's Arthur Ferry on court. He's got a tricky one in his first round match as he is taking on uh, an unseeded player. Obviously, you look for him, number two seed Ferry, taking on Jordan Hassan of Oklahoma. Of course, both of these programs in interesting places. Entering the 2022 team season, you look for Stanford. They weren't able to compete much last season. They, of course, had their uh, season start delayed until the start of February. And as such, they weren't able to flex one of the top recruiting classes in the country. Guys like Arthur Ferry, a guy like Tristan Boyer as well. Now, for those of you curious at home, we the seeds here at this ITA National Fall Championships done by UTR ratings on the men's side. The top eight seeds, all your top eight UTR players. Arthur Ferry, rise sophomore at Stanford. He's got the second highest UTR, and that's a testament to some of the pro success he had over the summer, uh, a testament to his success, obviously, at the regional as well. And we'll get into how these players qualified this for this event throughout the course of the day. But again, here on court number six, you have Arthur Ferry of Stanford taking on Jordan Hassan of Oklahoma. Of course, the Oklahoma side of the equation Feels like a lifetime ago, given what we've all gone through these past 15 months. But let's remember, this Oklahoma men's team is not that far removed from making three consecutive NCAA men's team championships during the 2010s. Of course, they accomplished that 2014, 2015, 2016. Now, it's a new group of players, a new head coach in Coach Nick Crowell. But you look at this Oklahoma team, an SEC conference move on the horizon. They're still one of the power six in the Big 12 Men's Tennis Conference. You've got teams like Baylor, TCU, Texas in that conference competing as top 10 schools in the country. Obviously, that's a difficult standard for any other school to meet. Uh, but that's what Oklahoma faces here as they look towards the 2022 season. And, of course, for this Oklahoma team, they've got a couple of players in this ITA men's singles draw. So they're a school we'll be looking for throughout the course of the weekend. Again, your court six match, Arthur Ferry, number two seed, uh, uh, excuse me, stadium court match. Arthur Ferry, number two seed of Stanford, taking on Jordan Hassan of Oklahoma with that in mind. Let's move to court number seven, West off. And again, just want to introduce all the players we have competing here in the morning session before we harp in on any specific court. You look here in, in uh, our 
court number seven matchup. We've got a guy who's familiar to having success at this event, Trey Hildebrand of UCF. And for those of you uh, who are college tennis fanatics like myself, you will remember that the 2020 ITA National Fall Championships was a singles only competition. It was a condensed field. It was uh, a field, an event, excuse me, held at Lake Nona. It was event one by a UCF Golden Knight. And so obviously for Hildebrand here, he's part of, was part of that UCF team. I believe he made a run to the final in last year's event. This is an event he's had success in, in the past. And you look for the UCF team, no denying little bit disappointing with how their season ended in 2021 they were hosts in orlando to the national championship the women's team able to make the round of 16 the men's team upset in the round of 32 so you look for hildebrand and former oklahoma coach now ucf men's tennis head coach john roddick certainly uh, a big year for them here in 2022 hildebrand on the near side of your court take out nicola slavic of Mississippi and of course Mississippi a run to the NCAA round of 16 last season now they lose Tim Sancolin from that roster but they bring back Slavic they bring back Finn Reynolds who we're going to see on a, an additional court competing here this morning of course you recognize that Mississippi blue on the far side of the court just about anywhere that the Rebels compete uh, but you look for Slavic here again opportunity for him to step up in the absence of Sancolin assert himself in the top three of that lineup with a big result here. Hildebrand, far side of your court, uh, near side of your court, competing against Slavic of Mississippi on the far side of your court. That's your action on court seven. And again, for score lines for all of these matches throughout the day, you can follow along on the Tennis Ticker app, a link of which you can find on the ITA website. We're firing through. Want to introduce all of these matches if we can. Super producer Westoff, let's go now to court number eight. We're again all across the board. You look at these matches, and we talked about it in our Great Shot podcast preview, a podcast of this event you can find on our website, crackrackets.com. It is notable none of the top 10 ranked ITN men, ITA men competing in the uh, singles com uh, com competition here in San Diego. You have five top 10 men competing on the ITF Pro Circuit this week over in Fayetteville. You've got other pros competing this week over in Ithaca as well. And by the way, the opportunities for so many of these collegiate athletes to compete in pro events on college campuses, a major win for college tennis moving forward. But as such, it makes many of these matchups super intriguing. We don't know what the pecking order is entering this season at the top of men's college tennis. And this is one of those prove them events. Show that you are the guy uh, entering the 2022 season. And one of those guys who has an opportunity to do just that, Gabe Diallo of Kentucky. You look for Diallo seated here at this event was 12 and six for Kentucky at the number two singles position last season, that top three of Draxel, Diallo, Hurrian, uh, so much success throughout the course of the year. And, uh, you know, Kentucky's a team we here at Crack Rackets are particularly high on entering the 2021 season. Diallo will be a big part of that. And I believe the six, 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 seven, now junior out of Kentucky on the near side of your court, the frame, is the frame you want of your modern day college uh, tennis player just in general. And, you know, the easy power on the serve, the fluidity uh, for a guy his size. There are a lot of ingredients there that I know Coach Kaufman and the entire Kentucky coaching staff is looking forward to seeing develop here this season. But of course, it's a fascinating matchup here for Diallo as he takes on former top recruit in the nation, was a top junior for many, many years during his time prior to entering college, and a guy we haven't seen compete in over 18 months in Alafi Aini of Cornell. And of course, the reason we haven't seen him compete is because the Ivy League didn't compete in 2021. Unfortunately, not able to play in the fall. Ivy League schools uh, not hosting sports last year they didn't have it in the spring either and you know as such it's worth remembering there were six ivy league teams in the top 25 when the season stopped in 2021 that was a record uh absolutely and you know it, it wasn't just uh teams like cornell it was you know columbia harvard uh, across the board, the depth in the Ivy League was something we were coming to reckon with as college tennis fans. And then they don't get to compete in 2021. All of that 
momentum, uh, you know, thwarted. And for Alafia, he's a guy who absolutely has the talent to be a top 25 player in college tennis. And of course, when you have one of those guys on your roster, you can inherently compete with many, many schools across the country. And so this is a fascinating early opportunity for Lafia to, again, remind everyone of his pedigree, of the success, the tennis he's capable of playing. Tricky first round matchup for Diallo. This is one of our must sees in our Crack Rackets preview podcast. Fascinated to check in on this one throughout our morning session. But again, Diallo, near side of your court, Kentucky taking on Alafia Aini, uh, far side of your court of Cornell. With that in mind, let's go to court number nine, West off. And look, I'll, I'll say it right now. This was my pre-tournament pick to win this event. Number four seed, Stefan Dostinik of USC. Another guy was a former top recruit, was so successful last season at the number three singles position for the Trojans, was just as successful at the start of the 2021 season as he uh, was taking on. Although I think I think we had the courts incorrect uh, because if you don't mind, Super Producer Daniel Westoff, I believe this is a Aini, and I didn't want to say anything at, at the moment, uh, but I believe this is Cornell. And then on the far side, we've got Diallo here. Uh, and I believe on that last quarter, it was actually Musatelli versus Dostinich. So just something to keep in mind, I suppose, for us. That's that's our bad. That's an unforced error on us. Good to note uh, moving forward. Uh, but again, I, I suppose I will, I will introduce this match as though it was Musatelli Dostinich, although again, I believe this is Alafiaini serving on the near side of your court. Those are certainly uh, Cornell colors. But in terms of Dostinik Musatelli, uh, it's an interesting match. Musatelli, the transfer to Kentucky from Old Dominion, a guy who can help shore up one of the things they didn't do well uh, during the course of last season or didn't do exceptionally well. And that's, you know, win matches at the four, five, and six singles position. They played about 500 ball down there now. You know, various injuries and, of course, circumstances played a role in that fact, but they have a lot of talent now. There are about five, six guys competing for those final three spots, and given the experience of Musatelli, who was a successful number one singles player at Old Dominion, uh, again, he's a guy who could fill that role very, very well. And if Kentucky's winning matches at four, five, six, at a 60% clip, 65% clip, we know what their top three is capable of. That becomes a very scary prospect for the rest of the nation. But of course, for Dostinik now, he steps into the number one singles role. He's the guy for the USC Trojans. And you look at who the guys have been for the Trojans, even over the last, you know, decade and a half, Robert Farah, number one doubles player in the world, Grand Slam champion, Stevie Johnson, probably the best men's college tennis player in history. Uh, obviously a top uh, 40 ATP player during his time. You go to Yannick Honefman, uh, who was the guy after that. He's been a top 100 player as well. Certainly Daniel Cooperman was a top player in the in the country. And uh, given he has now just recently turned pro, we know what he is capable of moving forward. And now it's on Dostinik, who was a top recruit, who certainly, again, what was it? Two losses, I believe, for him last season and was just a surefire point for the Trojans in both singles and doubles, got injured uh, in the ITA regional semifinal, uh, wasn't able to complete that match, but has had a ton of success. Otherwise, was a guy, you know, pretty good run for him at the ITA All-Americans in both singles and doubles. And again, looked in excellent form before getting injured in that ITA regional semifinal. So, you know, Dostinik's a guy you circle. Uh, as someone, given there are no other, you know, no top 10 players in the ITA men's singles rankings in this event. Dostinik is a guy who should be in that top 10 if things break right his season. Dostinik, Musatelli, interesting match for us on court number nine. With that in mind, let's go to 10. West off, move on to our next match. And again, I do apologize. We're not locking in on any court specifically here, but we will do so uh, moving forward. We just want to introduce all of these matches to all of you. Uh, we start here again on court number 10. This is an interesting one. And I know I say that about all of these, but if you're a college tennis hipster, the take you're rolling with nowadays is that on, you know, Andreas Martin has the talent to be a top 20 guy here this season. Flashed that sort of potential uh, last season, playing the number one singles position for Georgia Tech, was an NCAA qualifier in both singles and doubles. There's a short list of players you can say that about in. 
look, he'll be expected to step up for the Yellow Jackets here this season. And it's fascinating. Yellow Jackets bring back Kevin King, the uh, former All-American for them was a successful pro player as well he's now back as the assistant coach they're going to be interesting to see how he fits in you know reacclimates himself to the college tennis world but Orten's a guy with a ton of talent and it's gonna be fascinating to see him play certainly he is favorited today the favorite slight favorite over Pepperdine's Pietro Feline but look Pepperdine they've got guys you know, a lot of guys up and down the roster who Simply put, can compete, and we saw it. They swept their ITA regional, both players reaching uh, the final and winning the title. Of course, you've got Daniel DeJong in the mix as well, Andrew Rogers, who we're going to see compete here later on in the day. You've got Pietro Feline here in the draw, too. It's good. It's a good start. It was a good fall for the Pepperdine Waves, and they were the last undefeated team of the 2020 season before the play was stopped during pandemic. Coach Shackley has his guys rocking and rolling. Uh, right now in Malibu. This is an interesting matchup. Certainly, uh, again, Martin, the favorite, but I love the way those Pepperdine guys compete and we're in Southern California. I know Pepperdine, Malibu, not exactly Southern California, but always watch for the California schools in a California event. This is one to keep an eye on here on court number 10. With that in mind, let's go to 11. And of all of the matchups we've discussed here today, this might may be... Uh, my favorite on the board. You've got Kylie Collins, now rising sophomore at the University of Texas. Of course, Texas had the season last year as Texas. Although, I think it, this might, is this, are we sure this isn't 12 West off? Are we sure? Yeah, no, this is definitely, I see the labels now. Um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Early on here going, I apologize for that. But you look here on court number 11, you've got Texas's Kylie Collins. NCAA doubles finalist last year as well with Lulu Suns recently made her first ITF semifinal at a 25K. Kylie Collins can play. And of course, given the fact that, you know, no Anna Tarati on this Texas roster anymore, and we don't know if her former doubles partner Lulu Suns is going to be coming back to school or not in January those are two big holes to replace in the lineup. Obviously, Sun was the one who won the clinching match in the NCAA championship, but you know Kylie Collins delivered a ton of victories for her Texas Longhorns throughout the course of the year. And again, if you're Texas, you still have Stearns, you still have Collins, you still have Shavat Tapan, you still have a ton of talent up and down the roster, plenty of new freshmen in the mix as well. But to remain amongst you know the top two to clearly be in the top tier as they were last season they need Collins to make a jump and look she's taken on a quarter or I believe yeah quarter finalist at the IT All-American in Selma Ewing of USC and Ewing and USC were one of these stories of May last year upset victory to reach the NCAA round of 16 and I mean, you had two Trojans reaching the quarterfinals of the ITA women's singles competition. You had uh, you have Aaron Cayetano, who we're going to see competing later today as well, seated in this event. Brutal draw for Ewing, brutal draw for Collins as well. Both unseated floaters who I would want no part of prior to the quarterfinals. I mean, once you hit the quarterfinals, you're going to play someone good regardless. But this is a matchup, probably the one of the morning session, Collins of Texas, taking on Selma Ewing of USC. Let's go to court 12 now, Westhoff. And again, I will stop talking at some point. We'll lock in on the tennis. We'll lock in on the specific matches. Still early going everywhere. Two all, two ones, one break here, or, you know, a deuce point there. By the way, should have said this earlier, unforced error by me. Format for the singles matches, two out of three sets, no ad scoring. Tiebreakers at six all. It is, uh, you know, a national fall championships as such. The format reflects that fact. But here on court number 12, again, should be an interesting one. Snow Han, another USC Trojan. And there are three Trojans in the draw. You think the Trojans are going to be strong this year? It's certainly on us. Uh, they certainly have the ingredients to put together a special season, but she's got a tough battle on her hands as she takes on Stanford's Connie Ma. Ma, part of a ridiculous recruiting class for the Cardinal and obviously for Stanford last season. Uh, they weren't able, uh, Stanford, you know, didn't win the Pac 12. 
That never happened. Stanford didn't reach the NCAA round of 16. That never happens to this program. And they're looking to have a big bounce back here in 2021. Certainly seeing Ma reach the final of the regional. Yepa Fanova, another one of their freshmen who we'll see compete later today, reach the final of the regional. They've got the ingredients. They might be one of the highest ceiling teams in the nation on the women's side this season. And certainly you always say that about the Cardinal, but you didn't say it about them in 2021. So it's going to be fascinating to see Ma compete. You see Ma here on the near side of your court, taking on the seeded Snohan, who again, haven't seen compete uh, here in tw- uh, in college tennis much. And attack of a backhand down the line start things off first impression very very strong but you see here early on already connie ma uh with the early break of serve lead 2-1 here and you know again always love an inner conference battle ma taking on han here court number 12 that's where things stand right now uh on uh excuse me that's where things stand right now uh for this match uh again Let's go to court number 13 as we try to work our way around the board. And I appreciate all of you in the comments who are tuning in. Welcome to our Crack Rackets broadcast feed. Again, we will be here from first ball to last, providing our red zone coverage, uh, looking at all of these matchups throughout the course of the day so that we don't miss out on any of the action. We can highlight as many of these athletes competing as possible. We will lock in on specific courts, although I see a question from Maria Carrington, uh, and I do just want to clarify quickly unfortunately no cameras on courts 14 or 15 for us so we will not be able to broadcast the matches on court 14 or 15 i do apologize for that fact but again you can follow all of the action uh on tennis ticker for the score lines you can follow all of the courts individually on tennis tracker uh yeah all of those by the way links to those sites found available on the ita tournament page we are college tennis website uh, with that in mind here on court number 13 this is a fascinating one arena Cantos cmares unseated in this event i believe was a core finalist at the ita all american in singles and you know uh someone who played number one singles for the buckeyes last season extraordinarily successful She's going to be counted on to make a jump here this year for Ohio State if they're going to sustain uh, themselves around a 16 performance last year, conference champions last year. She's got a tough matchup. She's taking on the seat, Ackley of South Carolina. And, you know, for Ackley, you look at her performance at the ITA uh, All-American Championships. It was, you know, again, strong performance for South Carolina. Obviously, they got the title uh, from Sarah Hamner, but you look uh, for them as well in singles actually put together a strong performance as well and you know it's it's an interesting team at, at south carolina super young but with actually with hamner got a lot of in- ingredients to again have some success here in 2021 you look for actually yes she was i believe a quarter final or ended up uh, getting through qualifying in the end and then you look for her in the main draw of the ita all americans for actually it was indeed around a 16 performance I apologize for her, but yeah, uh, again, should be a fun battle here. Kanto Siamares, Ohio State, Ackley, South Carolina here on court 13. Let's go to 14 now. Again, uh, excuse me, let's go to 16 now. Uh, one of our final three courts here to introduce. And you know, again, on court 16, it's an interesting one. I can't say I've seen our number two seed, Daria Freeman of Princeton, compete yet, but. You look at her results here this uh, season. She's been spectacular so far, thoroughly deserving of that number two seed. And Princeton's an interesting one with Freeman, with Schvetz, with Vicky Who, the talent they have on their roster. Probably uh, the elite of the elite in the Ivy League this season. And, you know, again, they'll be sniffing around the top 10 all year long. But, you know, she's got a tricky one in Elaine Chavinsky of Virginia. And certainly Virginia is a team we'll all have our eyes on. If Emma Navarro comes back between Navarro, Natasha Subash, who we'll see competing later in the day as well. Uh, you know, they get a, someone like Travinsky to click in the bottom half of their lineup. All of a sudden, UVA becomes a team you want. No, uh, you don't want you know, any part of moving forward. So here on 16, the number two seed Freeman will keep our eye on her as obviously number two seed, extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary high expectations. One for us to keep an eye on. 
Let's go to 17 as we round out here again. Two more courts before we lock in on anything individually. You look at this one. James Davis of Denver taking on Francois Letalic of Old Dominion. This is one of those, you know, again, huge opportunities for a guy like Davis, for a guy like Letalic to solidify and cement their ranking early here in the season. Because, of course, when you're not in a Power 5 conference, the opportunities to play you know, top 20 opponents week in, week out. They're just not as frequent. So for both of these guys who super successful in their ITA regionals, obviously, as they end up qualifying for this field, it's a big opportunity for both of them here in the first round. Metallic taking on Davis, court 17. And then last, but certainly not least, court number 18. We already see Sven Law ripping off an early lead here. The Baylor Bear uh, currently up 5-1 in the first set taking on Columbia's Max Westpaul. Westpaul on the near side of your screen, part of the many Columbia Lions. I've never played college tennis match. And of course you look for Columbia. They brought in top five recruiting classes, I believe the last three seasons. And yet they didn't play, you know, back half of 2020, weren't able to play at all in 2021. You've got two classes of kids who are a freshman, essentially, as college tennis players. And for West Paul to have the opportunity to come compete here, to you know have the success in his regional, huge learning opportunity for him early on. But, I mean, man, Baylor Bears locked and loaded. When you bring back Boitan, Soto, La, you're already going to have yourselves a solid foundation to build upon. But the defending finalists at the NCAA tournament, you know, bringing in so much talent as well. Paralek, Mizuchi, Brum, Gromley. I mean, they bring in the number two junior in the nation as well in their recruiting class here, a late addition to the team. Yeah, they're locked and loaded. They're going to be just fine here as they look to repeat, if not one up, their performance from last season. But again, those are our matches here on the stream. Let's stick around here on 18 where it's 5-1. Sven Law currently in the lead, currently 40 love as well. So a set point, uh, four set point opportunities for him. Have to reacclimate myself to the no ad scorings as well. Four uh, set points here again. Talking two out of three sets, no ad scoring. 40-15 here for Baylor Sven Law. There it is. First set of the tournament belongs to Sven Law. He takes a 6-1 decision from Columbia's Max Westpaul. I forgot to mention this earlier, uh, but who the players playing on courts 14 and 15. Two fascinating matchups. Mel Riesco of Georgia taking on number four seed Pepperdine's Lisa Czar, who has been killing it this fall. You've also got Fiona Crawley, uh, the number uh, or unseated for UNC, but undefeated in her college career. She's taking on Sophia Carrington of LSU again, unable to stream those uh, given their, the lack of just video available on them. But Please keep in mind, you can follow all the scores on Tennis Ticker. You can follow the rest of the matches individually if that's what you'd like to lock in on on Tennis Tracker. Let's go back to court number 11. Again, my match of the morning right now. Kylie Collins, 4-2 early break lead on USC's Selma Ewing. And you see Ewing here near side of your screen. all in this 2-4 service game. Ewing, excellent home stretch to the 2021 season. So many health issues for the Trojans. She was the rock at the top of their lineup. You can see the heaviness of the Collins forehand. And look, that's why moving forward, I do think Collins is in line for a big jump here this season. The weapons were so obvious for her as a freshman. It was just a matter of better decision-making. And obviously one year older, one year more experienced. All of the ingredients for a big season here. 1530 opportunity to open up a big double break lead here in her first set.
So now 1540. Three break point chances here for Collins. Again, take a 5 2 lead. You can see those scoreboard updates in the bottom left of our screen. For those following along. It's good stuff there from Selma Ewing, though. Caught Kylie Collins cheating over a little bit. Slice serve out wide. Probably aces her no matter what. Now, deuce point coming up here. Again, you feel like if Ewing can just escape out of this service game, open up some opportunities for herself. See Will Collins elects to return. She chooses the ad side. First deuce point of us, for us, of the season. And you just see the heaviness of that Collins forehand pushing Ewing back in the court. Great depth from the Collins ground strokes. Draws the error from Ewing. 5-2 lead for the Longhorn. In the meantime, top over to Stadium. We'll come back as soon. As Collins begins serving for the set. But right now, Arthur Ferry, the two seed out of Stanford, serving on the near side of your screen. Or excuse me, on the far side of your screen. Currently up a break 4-3. But a love 30 holds for him in his service game against Jordan Hassan of Oklahoma. Has in a new addition to this Oklahoma roster. Comes over via Israel. Top 1,000 pro in the world. That's exceptional depth. From Arthur Ferry on that backhand. All of a sudden, love 30 quickly becomes 30 all. Rally there. Hansen Hassan comes up with the forehand pass. He'll have two break point chances here. Meanwhile, Collins Ewing service game did start currently 15 all. 
think we have to stick around here now after that passing shot. We'll keep our eye on that. Well, of course, Arthur Ferry, big result for him this summer, won two rounds at qualifying at Wimbledon. Forget who Ferry was able to beat in that instance. It's win over Pranesh Gunaswaran, the number 29 seed, also gets a three cent win over Matt Ebden before going up two sets to love on Talon Greek score in that final round of qualifying, ultimately dropped that match. 7-6, seven, 7-6, six, seven, six, set 3 and 4 as well. Fantastic result. Lob goes long, though, from Hassan. So Ferry escapes 5-3 if we can. Let's go quickly back to Collins and Ewing. That's on court number 11. 30 all right now. 5-2 service game. Looks like we either point ahead or behind on the score. Watching this match on the side. It's been the constant theme. It looks like the scoreboard was a point ahead. I just want to say it was 15 30, now 30 all, but I mean, that Collins forehand's so explosive. You can tell Ewing's been trying to hone in on that backhand wing, but Collins just rock solid so far on that side. has been driving that ball extraordinarily well here early on. That'll play, though. Or Selma Ewing. And so, no, we were a point behind. That was the deuce point here. Ewing able to get the break. 4-3-5 stays alive in set number one. Meanwhile, I'm keeping my eye on the scoreboards elsewhere. Break leads pretty much every court now. Interesting. Pietro Felin. 4 3 break of serve lead on Georgia Tech's Andres Martin. Canto Siemers of Ohio State also up a break now. 4 3 on Ackley of South Carolina. That's the K Kylie Collins forehand, folks. Given the body language, I'm going to say that pass landed in. That's a heck of a shot. On the run forehand from Selma Ewing. And again, establish the depth in the backhand corner. Took advantage of Collins' positioning to mix in the drop shot. Then a little magic there on the run. So now 15 all here on court 11.
It's tough luck there. Or Kylie Collins net court goes against her still. A clear pattern has emerged. Selma Ewing determined to find the backhand corner of Kylie Collins. Chance to again stay alive here in set number one. She trails 3-5. Thirty here. Two game points for Ewing. Meanwhile, Ewing's teammate Snow Han seated here at this event, trailing Stanford's Connie Ma five two. We're gonna go there next. It's court number twelve coming next. We'll see if Ma can serve that out. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Collins looking to her sideline, saying, "How'd she do that?" And I have to say, Team Kylie Collins travels deep. I am think it's fair to assume the parents are there, the team is there. But I'll tell you what, heck of a volley from Selma Ewing, 4-5. We'll keep our eye on that, of course, as soon as it comes back as Collins tries to serve that out once again. But keep your eyes on Stanford, folks. Connie Ma, 5-2 here. Serving for the first set against Han. Ma won her regional. Again, beat teammate Yepafanova in the final. I don't believe she dropped a set in the event. If we can, back to 12. West off. There we go. Beautiful. But there's the power for Snow Han. On top ranked junior, top 100 junior. When she entered college back in 2020, fall of 2020, excuse me, but she just wasn't able to play much last season. I believe she played it all due to injury, if memory serves me correctly. In fact, that was the case. She's now a redshirt freshman here, entering the season. Love 40. She's got the chance to, again, stay alive here. Now back on court. Teen all in her 5 4 service game. Hop back over there as soon as this game is finished. Meanwhile, first set 6 3 to Arena Contos. 6 3 to Arthur Ferry as well. 6 1 to Stefan Dostinik. 6 2 to James Davis of Denver. Turn game from Snow Han. Again, you can tell Connie Ma trying to absorb, redirect that pace. Han taking her time, working Ma around the court. 3 5 now here on court number 12. Let's go back to 11. Collins serving for the set. Up 30 15 here. 
did not reach set point in her first chance to serve for this match. Uh, set, excuse me. I think it was a deuce point. I think I'm wrong there. Stop me if you've heard this before. Depth to the backhand. Get to the net. Put that ball away. That's the recipe. Ewing's found it now. The question is, did she build herself too big a deficit here in set number one? This is what Selma Ewing does. She fights. 30 off. Yep. You keep picking on that side long enough, Collins is going to find you peeking. And that's what was the case. Selma Ewing trying to cheat over on that ad wing. That's been the game plan for Collins. Keep that backhand back. Cross court with depth. Don't have to open up anything too easy. She sneaks one down the line there. Love that decision. She now has two set points here. Take a 6-4 first set. Selma Ewing's forehand sails long. Kylie Collins, 6-4 first set. And I'll say it, our match of the morning here in San Diego. But, of course, there are 17 others for us to turn to. Unfortunately, don't have score updates on all of them. Don't want to hop to a court where I'm not sure what's going on in terms of the action. So what we're going to do instead, go to our last remaining first, uh, excuse me, two remaining first sets on the board. Let's go back to court number 12. Connie Mana, 5-3, love 30 in the service game of Snow Han. Let's see if we don't get a quick point update as well. I believe that last point was won by Han, was watching out of the corner of my screen. Indeed it was. So now 30 all here. I'll be honest with you viewers, I have not watched much of Snow Han prior to today. This is my first time seeing her. And again, injuries last year preventing me from the opportunity to see her play. But I would say she has the firepower advantage over Connie Ma thus far. Uh, certainly doing a good job absorbing, redirecting pace. See that return of serve there. Absolute money. But this is one to keep an eye on. First set to Stanford freshman Connie Ma. 6-3 over USC Snow Han. Tough morning thus far for Trojan fans. But I, I think Ewing's found a recipe down the home stretch of that first set. And this is one we'll keep our eye on as well. Let's go to court 10. West off, if we can. Andreas Martin of Georgia Tech gets the break back. Pietro Fellin serving for Pepperdine. Up 5-4. Martin able to get that break. Forces 5-all. That's where we pick up our coverage here. Court number 10, of course, elsewhere. First set. This is our last first set, at least on the board of scores. We have available to us Sven La up 6 1 4 0 on Max Westfall of Columbia. That match gets close to the finish line. We'll pop over there for a match point. Never want to miss out on any of those, but 
Again, you see the aggressive aggression there. You see Coach Shackley. I'd argue he's still in playing shape. Certainly still dresses like a college tennis player. It's good clean tennis from Andreas Martin. Again, for those of you joining us on the stream, Alex Gruskin of Crack Rackets. So excited to be along for the ride this weekend. Any comments you all have, feel free to drop them in our YouTube channel. Any requests for courts, feel free to drop those in here as well. Of course, you want to reach out on social media. We're at Crack Rackets. I'm at Great Chef Pod. You me directly. Fifteen here for Martin. For those of you who have never seen the Yellow Jacket Martin play, what people like so much about him is the power. I think you've noticed them in these first few shots here. This guy goes big, goes for broke, plays on his terms. And look, if you want to make the jumps to the pros, you have to have those weapons. You have to have an ability to make life a little bit easier for yourself, to find free points. And so Martin certainly in possession of that quality. It's about refining the rest of this game here. See how far he goes. Cheeky, 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 cheeky. Some frustration expressed from Felvin. This is there from Shackley. Tossing that ball over. Always love to see that. By the way, after this, we're going to go to court 18, where Sven Law up 6-1-5 love on Columbia's Max Westfall. Love that hustle. Love that play. Dip it low. My coach used to say, dip and chase. You're dipping that first passing shot low. Get ready to chase because the drop volley's coming. You can see that urgency from Pietro there. Deuce point coming up here. And remember, Pietro Feline up a break for the majority of this first set. Just served for the set when Martin was able to get the break. That's what I'm talking about, folks. Welcome back to Elite College Tennis. Andreas Martin showing a little physicality as he holds 4-6-5 in the first set. Quickly, West off before we miss it. Match point, core 18, 6-1-5 love, 40-15. The only Baylor Bear not competing in Fayetteville is Sven Law. By the way, sneaky good Baylor-Columbia rivalry has emerged over the years. 
and this win goes to the Bears. Sven Law, 6-1, 6 love, dominant performance to kick off his 2021 IPA National Fall Championship. It's definitely a tough loss for the Lion. It's when he's going to be kicking himself about. Again, we're an hour into the match, and that's how long before, you know, obviously not the result West Paul will be looking for. You look for Sven La. Now he will face off against the winner of number two seed, Arthur Ferry, and Oklahoma's Jordan Hassan. Of course, as mentioned, Ferry, 6-3 first set on Stadium Court. Let's go back there now on Stadium Court. 6-3-2-1 break point chance for Arthur Ferry here 1530 I think the scoreboard's a little ahead of us here I believe that's Ferry serving on the near side Maybe I'm missing something. I'm pretty sure that scoring servering metric is wrong. Because I'd recognize that Arthur Ferry forehand backhand. And that just looks like a Stanford hat. That doesn't look like an Oklahoma hat. So we'll see here. If the scoreboard goes to deuce, then the serving metric is wrong. I believe it's deuce. I believe it's Ferry already up a break here. We are just a bit behind on the scoreboard. And again, some of the links not up yet. We're working on it, folks. We promise as soon as those links are up, we will be the first to let you know. Shout out to Dan Johnson, the entire ITA crew out there in San Diego facilitating this event. Never easy to host a singles doubles tournament with 64 players. And of course, this is the culmination of the fall season, the ITA regional process, so many collegiate athletes, the opportunity to compete across the country. It's been an extraordinary fall, particularly given we didn't have one last season. And so to have this event back means the world to us. Yeah, I think Ferry got broken back. So he did indeed earn the break, but Hassan gets that right back. 3-2 here. Ferry leads up a set on serve, though, in set number two. Let's go back to 10. Andreas Martin was up love 30 in this 5-6 service game of Pepperdine's Pietro Fenlin. 
All of a sudden, though, that love 30 lead has evaporated. Meanwhile, just some quick scoreboard updates as we wait for this next point to unfold. Stefan Dostinik was down. A set uh, break for much of that second set. Now four all there. Took the first 6-1. Back-to-back, oh, -back, big overheads from Pietro Felin. Four straight points for him. We're going to a breaker here. On court number 10. Feels like the sort of finish we deserve here. Again, the scores I can offer you. Arena Cantos Siabers up 6 3. Answer, uh, down a break though, 2 1 to Ayana Athlete, Seabay, South Carolina. Tani Ma up 6 3, 1 love, love 30 in the first service game of Snow Han. Colin Collins 15 30 in the opening service game of Selma Ewing in court number two as well. So again, those are the matches we're watching closest here in our morning session. Tough luck there for the Yellow Jacket. Early mini break lead goes to Pietro Felling. And this speaks to the fickle nature of this sport. Didn't it feel like Martin had wrestled away all of the momentum? Given the scoreline, down 5-4. And we see on the court next to him, I believe we have a match finishing. Try and see who's who there. Gets that mini break back. 4 1 2. Tell you what, I'm going to venture and say that was court number nine. The scoreboard's a little bit off. And that's Stefan Dosnik just finished off. And indeed, he did his 6 1 6 4 victory over Francois Musatelli. So the number four seed advancing to the round of 16. <laughs> as we go throughout the day i'll inundate you all with the history of this event of course the national fall championships used to be the national indoor individual championships that change happening around 2017 since then nuno borges sokos i want to say yuya ito your inaugural national fall champs
first racket toss from Mr. Martin there. Frustration starts to mount for him now as he trails 4-1. Yet to win a point on his own serve. Excuse me, trail. Yeah, I believe 4-1. Yeah, just taking the towel with him to go grab the ball. I was going to say, don't pull a fast one on me here, Andres. Eat. And I do apologize. You know, we said we had 14 courts of coverage. Just don't want to hop in on a match where we don't know the score. Can't inform you listeners of what's happening. Of course, I know they're working on it. Promise they'll have them up shortly. Patience is a virtue, always. And in the meantime, we get to enjoy some extraordinary tennis here on the courts we do know about. And right now, that includes Pietro Felling. Another big lead for him. He was up break for the majority of the first set before Martin broke back for 5 all. Now Martin, 6-5, love 30 opportunity, four straight points, aggression from Pietro Fellin. You can tell he's taking that ball off of the racket of Martin. He's being the aggressor. He's the one moving forward, finishing points at the net. That's what Andres Martin wants to be doing. There's a little Kyle Edmund to the Andreas Martin forehand. That's a shout out to all the listeners who know you know. 4 2 lead here for Pietro Fellin. Yeah, it's just beautiful tennis around the board. And, of course, you think to yourself, Pietro Fellin at the net, did he have to be so cute with that backhand volley? It's a really tough volley to hit on the stretch. Backhand wing, ball dipping at your feet. Credit to Martin there, 3-4. We're back on serve here, folks, in this tiebreak. And you can see very different coaching approaches in this match. Coach Shackerley saying something essentially every point to his Pepperdine player. Not the case for all 10. But I guess, what do you tell him there? <laughs> Hit the forehand approach better? I think he just did that. Mini break lead, still the Pepperdine's Pietro Fellin. 5-4 here. In our first set, only first set left on our scoreboard. You look elsewhere. Arthur Ferry up 6-3, 4-3 on serve in that second set against home of freshman Jordan Hassan. We have a frozen scoreboard on Kylie Collins, Selma Ewing, or it's the longest 1530 point in history. Yeah. 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 Now, I honestly feel robbed this tiebreaker ends with someone at seven points. This feels like a 10-8, 11-9 sort of affair where the guy wins the first set, then wins the second set 6-1, 6-2.
critical point coming up here. Said it facetiously. Hit the forehand approach a little bit better. That's a tough forehand approach miss. Sails long and what a block backhand return from Andreas Martin to have the feel, precision to get the depth on that backhand block slice. Table has turned once again. Six five Martin somehow finds himself with set point. Exceptional, exceptional, exceptional stuff. And that is why the college tennis hipsters have circled Andreas Martin for a breakout 2022 season. Comes from behind in the first set. Comes from behind for, for one in the first set breaker. Takes it 7-6, 7-5 here on court number 10. With that in mind, Let's go to court number 12. Connie Ma is cruising, folks. The Stanford freshman is the real deal. 6-3-4 love now. She leads USC's Snow Han. Han, of course, seated, I believe, at this event. I don't want to be incorrect there. Yep, so Snow Han, your number seven seed. does i will say i mentioned early on i thought the pace was a little bit easier for snow han i think the pace is a little bit more obvious for snow han absorbing redirecting pace seems to come with ease to connie ma the springiness to her game again the effortlessness and her contact points Frustration mounting for Han. She sends that forehand return flying. 4015 here. For Connie Ma. Meanwhile, again, trying to keep our eyes on as many of these courts as we can. You know, Finn Reynolds, James Trotter are out on court number six. Oh no, that return was in for Snowhan. Excuse me. Depth perception off. That went a little bit off. So, again, opportunity here for Mata. Almost sealed the door shut in this round of 32 match. Boy, does Connie Ma make it look easy. 6-3-5 love here on court number 12. In the meantime, we are getting some score updates from elsewhere. Arthur Ferry breaks serve. Now 6-3-5-3. He'll serve for it on center court. Let's go there now, Westoff. See if the number two seed from Stanford can't continue a trend here. Great morning for the Cardinal. Getting that center court. Ferry. Up 6-3-5-3 now on Jordan Hassan. Happy to confirm I was correct. 
about the color scheme that is a Stanford hat. The scoreboard was slightly lagging behind. That happens from time to time. Huge shout out to our friends at Tennis Tracker, Tennis Ticker, for helping us college fans follow all of the action. I'd call that ball out on the sideline. It's college. You got to do that. But Arthur Ferry, far classier than I. Love the aggression there, for, though, from Hassan, who breaks a string. But also earns the point now, love 15. This. We're going to go check in on a match we haven't seen in a little bit of time. We're going to go check out Contos and Acme on court 13. We'll head there next, but let's see if Arthur Ferry can't close it out first. That's the aggression. The sophomore showed all throughout his promising freshman season in 2021, of course, you look for the Stanford team, lost in the round of 32, but played one of the closest matches of that opening weekend in their loss to Virginia. They had leads on a bunch of courts, in particular Tristan Boyer. Big lead on Chris Rodesh, who wasn't quite able to close out, but Cardinal brings back almost everyone this season. Little bit of everything there from Arthur Ferry. Let's go through the bullet point list. We got the drop shot, we got the lob, we got the slice backhand approach, we got the overhead moving forward. Third round of qualifying at Wimbledon this year, folks. Arthur Ferry is the real deal. Look for the Cardinal to bounce back here in 2022. Look for Ferry here, 3015. Actually, big run out in San Diego. We'll see if we can't get a slow clap sound effect here throughout the course of the weekend from super producer Daniel Westoff. But for now, think it in your head. Match points coming up. Three of them for Arthur Ferry. And he gets the job done. Arthur Ferry ultimately advancing 6-3, 6-3 over Jordan Hassan of Oklahoma. That's why he's the best in the business, folks. Beats me to it. It's tricky. Four coat or four arena. Contos Ciamares, who's lefty forehand, I would argue, is recognizable. But just about any hardcore college tennis fan, of course, again, huge sophomore season for her to help lead those Buckeyes to the round of 16, where they played Texas extraordinarily close. And again, it was just them and Pepperdine getting points off the Longhorns. Contos, a win over Peyton Stearns in the round of 16. Again, tricky opponent for her in Aina Ackley. Deuce point coming up here as Ackley looks to take a 5-2 lead in a second.
but she does. Scraps, claws, finds the angles. I love the mid-court swing backhand volley from Ayan Ackley, not letting that ball drop, not letting Irina Contos find time to get herself back to the center of the court, but that's why all the prognosticators think Contos is on pace for one of those breakthrough, enter the top 10 sort of season. She holds still. Ayana Ackley, up a break, 4-3, looking to force a third set here on court number 13. Let's check in on court 11. Right now, score is updated. Kylie Collins down, trails 1-4. Now holds on a deuce point, excuse me, 2-4. But Selma Ewing of USC seemed to have found that recipe at the end of the first set. Had success, attacking the backhand with depth. Moving forward to the net, just not allowing Kylie Collins to hit that explosive forehand. That game plan translates here. Actually, I apologize. If we can, West, let's go to 12. Connie Ma now, 6 3 5 one, 30 love up. Let's see if we can't catch the set point of that match. Again, that's court 12 right now. I appreciate that. You're best in the business. I'm going to quote Cracked Rackets contributor John Parsons. Does Connie Ma come from the school of Del Bonus uh, serving? A little bit. You saw a high ball toss there. Certainly both her and Snohan wanted to hit that upper echelon. But you know what else came easy to Connie Ma? Just about everything on the court today. Effortless would be the word I would describe her six to use uh, to describe her 6-3-6-1 victory over Snohan. First seed eliminated on the day here at the ITA Fall National Championships, National Fall Championships, excuse me, but Connie Ma advancing. Uh, let's go back now, if we can, to court number 11. Selma Ewing, 4-2, again, 30 love up now. Make that 40 love. She looks to extend her lead to 5-2. Just a single break of serve right now, but again, it did. You could just feel that Ewing had found some momentum there at the end of the first set. Such a good fighter is Selma Ewing, so not a surprise at all to see her work her way back. Meanwhile, another upset alert right now unfolding on court eight. I'll keep my eye on that. Alafia Ayani, uh, Ayini, excuse me, of Cornell. 6-3, five-all lead on Gabriel Diallo of Kentucky. Meanwhile, Martin already got his break in the second set against Pietro Felon of Pepperdine. Ooh, Tran and Subash now on court. Bunch of updates filing in, folks. Should have some more information for all of you over the next few minutes. But Selma Ewing now, one game away from forcing a third set here in our match of the morning on court 11. In the meantime, let's go to eight. Haven't checked in on there in a while. Diallo, Kentucky, taking on Aini of Cornell. And that's Diallo, near side of your court, 6-7. Definitely could use a Big Mac or two to add to that frame. A lot of talent for the Wildcat Jr. Serving your 5-all second set. leave 15:30 here oh no is that a break that's a break so all right scoreboard's a bit behind but all of a sudden now alafiaini gonna serve for the match against gabriel diallo of kentucky we're gonna keep our eye on this match we will be back here as soon as the game resumes in the meantime I wish we can't split screen, can we, Westoff? I'll have you text me if you can or not. I don't think we can yet. But let's go to 11. We're again, Selma Ewing, 5-2 lead in the second set against Kylie Collins. We're going to keep our eyes on 9 and 11 in particular. Cannot split screen, unfortunately. I do apologize. It's on me.
errors starting to pile up for Kylie Collins. Fault there now. I'm gonna say it's 1540 here. Triple set point for Selma Ewing. It's one foot off. You see that forehand shining through once again for Kylie Collins. Always helps to have weapons like Kylie, Kylie Collins can make a big deficit a race fairly quickly. Deuce point coming up. That is an impressive set of tennis from Selma Ewing. Bounces back. 6-2. She takes it. Forces a deciding set here on 11. Let's go back to 8. Malafia. Aini of Cornell closing in on an upset victory here over Kentucky's Gabriel Diallo. that from Diallo saying I'm not done yet Irvin Volley from Alafia against the big man. Love that decision. That's winning tennis. That's playing on your terms. Letting the chips fall where they may. Match points coming up here. And what a win this would be. To kick off the return of Cornell Tennis. Here this season. See the serve and volley. Look for it. I think we might see a serve and volley here. <laughs> and you can see the emotion for Alafia Aini. Huge 6 3, 7 5 victory over seeded Gabriel Diallo of Kentucky. It's a hell of a performance. For Cornell to earn the victory with that in mind. Let's go back to 10 if we can. Spend as little time on my face as possible and enjoy the action happening between Andreas Martin, Pietro Felin. Felin could fall behind here. Quick double break. And did we not say that first set tiebreaker was critical? We did for this reason. Felt like both guys put so much effort to both building those leads, earning that comeback if you're Martin. <laughs> Needed that one. <laughs> 
big hold for Pietro Fellin to just get on the board here in set number two, establish himself a little bit. Still, Andreas Martin setting a break, 7-6, 2-1 lead. That in mind, let's go back to our match of the morning here. Court number 11, Collins versus Selma Ewing. Third set just getting underway. While it is getting underway, two quick score updates for you. We said we didn't have camera feeds on 14 and 15, but that they were two exciting matches to watch. Well, guess what, folks? Number four seed, Lisa Zara of Pepperdine. She finds herself down a set against Jordan freshman Mel Riasco. Those of you who listened to our preview podcast for this All-American will have heard me said, I don't know what to expect from the Georgia women's team this year. The era of Jokic has officially ended. Given the form of Czar of late, that's a heck of a first set result from Riasco. Also, talk about eras ending. No more Alexa Graham. No more Sarah Davitella. No more McKenna Jones for UNC. Of course, it helps when you can turn to undefeated players at the bottom of your lineup like Fiona Crawley. Riley Tran, both on court competing right now. Crawley up 3-1 in the third. On Sophia Carrington of LSU. Riley Tran just getting underway against a fellow ACC foe. UVA's Natasha Subash. We'll keep our eye, eyes on those matchups. Keep our eyes on the Ackley Contos matchup going on on court number 13 as well. That's what we're heading after this one. But again, early third set here. Selma Ewing, Kylie Collins. Let's rock and roll. You love that point construction much better from Kylie Collins. But again, when it's working, it's working. And for Selma Ewing right now, it is absolutely working. Gets the lob to drop over the head of Collins. She holds 4-1 love here in the third set. In the meantime, can we go check in on 13? I think that scoreboard's a bit behind right now for Contos and Ackley. If we can't get any indication. Come on! Damn, let's go! Based off of the body language. Maria Contos took the first set 6 3. Just trailing for, by a break. Scrapped her way out of her service game for 3 4. Given we saw her serving on this side last time, I would assume there are changeover ahead, so we're probably two games behind on that scoreboard. So that's a hold for Ackley, and given the nature of the changeover, I think we can assume that's a set for her as well. Going to be doing a little bit of inferencing here, but I think that's a 6-4 set for Ianna Ackley. She forces a third here on court number 13, so our two matches of the morning. Collins Ewing, and let's go back there now on court 11. Ackley, Contos, still rocking and rolling. 
Meanwhile, for those curious, Fiona Crawley now up 4-1 in the third on Sophia Carrington. Also have James Davis of Denver. Closing in on a straight set victory. He leads 6-2, 6-5 against Francois Latalic of Old Dominion. Borderline, though, yips right now from Kylie Collins. And again, as high as I am on the upside, power potential, this is still the inexperience, the streakiness of Collins reflecting itself. Or I suppose displaying itself. One point double fault. Next point plus one winner. Errors begin to pile up. And the first break of the third goes to Selma Ewing. She's won eight of the last 10 games. I believe 10 of the last 13 as well. Two love now here on court 11. That first forehand from Ewan was something else. The depth, the angle, much better control there from Kylie Collins. All of a sudden now, a bit of an opening for her. On her way back into this one, just get that first break of surf back. Keeping steady here early in the third.
see that extra dose of energy from Kylie Collins there as she secures the break. Back on serve here on court number 11, one, two. In the meantime, again, close, uh, courts we're monitoring most closely right now, courts 11 and courts 13. Third sets between Collins, Ewing, Contos, Ackley. Let's check in on 17, though. We haven't gone there in a while. Francois Latalic, Old Dominion, serving to stay alive against Denver, Denver's James Davis. Davis, 6-2, 6-5 lead. Latalic, though, game point here. Send us to a second set breaker. Metallic does not love the call. Deuce point, match point here. Second serve coming. They say the ball doesn't lie. I couldn't tell from that angle. Chair umpire seemed to confirm. Oh, excuse me. Unforced there by me. Apologies, folks. Double fault there from Latalic. So it is 2-1. Here for Davis in the breaker. Mini break lead goes to him. Hold on. What just happened there? Did he go down? Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. I think he fell against the back fence. Oh, that is crushing. Crushing there for Davis. Saw something went flying. Wanted to know what that is. Oh, just hope he's okay. Something's going on there at the back fence. We'll keep our eye on that in the meantime. Yeah, okay, let's go back to 11. Colin serving. Two. Already traded a couple of breaks here in the third against USC Selma Ewing. been the play for Ewing whenever she has had that opportunity has gone big at that Collins backhand corner I'm sure you're all sick of hearing me say that but hey if it ain't broke don't fix it now 40 30 here two more game point chances still for Collins
And now we go to Deuce. Plenty of momentum swings throughout the course of this match. Just like for Collins here. Just given the lack of success she's had on serve over the past 45 minutes. To be up 40-15, get broken here, second consecutive break. Pretty pivotal moment here in this match. Deuce point coming up. Motion from Ewing Collins let out a roar after getting that break back in the first. Ewing letting her know, oh, I'm here too. So now 3-1. Selma Ewing up here in the third set. Meanwhile, again, medical timeout right now on court 17. James Davis taking a fall in that third set breaker. Check in over there in a little bit. By the way, Fiona Crawley closed out her three set victory, 6 1 in the third over Sophia Carrington. Of course, for all of your updates throughout the course of the day, Tennis Tracker for the live video, Tennis Ticker for your scoring updates. Still hoping to get all those scoring links up as soon as we can. We'll keep you updated on those. Head roll from Selma Ewing. Didn't love the call there. Tough to tell here on our stream. Yeah! Oh. It's an aggressive cut from Collins. And that is the Achilles heel for her. That win or lose back against the wall. She goes down swinging, and that can be a blessing on the day she's clicking. Just hit through any opponent, but again, on the days where things are miscalibrated a little bit, what's plan B? What's plan C for Collins moving forward? Wink's done a really good job of taking plan A away today. 3 1 30 15 now for the USC Trojans. Looked like that one sailed a little long on her, and indeed it did. Thirty all coming up after this. We'll go check out court number thirteen, see where things stand. Unfortunately, the scoreboard a bit behind there, but I'm trying to monitor all this action for you. That forehand is so dominant when landing. Just blitzes through Selma Ewing on that point. Again, it's a catch-22. The top gear for Kylie Collins is as impressive as any player you're going to find in the nation. The problem is when the errors pile up, or when the opponent can find the backhand corner with depth as Ewing has, how does she adjust from there? She stayed aggressive in this match. It's working. Two breakpoint chances. 
Again, remember, she was a 40-15 in that 1-2 service game. Poor shot choice from Selma Ewing there. Just, again, was more of a bailout than anything else. Collins gets the break right back. The momentum shift continues. Shifts, excuse me, continue here on court 11. In the meantime, let's go to 10. Again, it feels like another one of those breaking points in the match for Pietro Felling trying to stay alive here against Andreas Martin. But it looks like the break of serve goes to the yellow jacket. Well, if it was 5-2, they'd switch sides here. Something's a little off. May already be 5-2. We're just joining them now. In which case, let's stick around and see if Martin can serve it out. Some of the other matches to keep your eye on, by the way, Alex Kotzen, Columbia, now on court, and Alex uh, Bukan, excuse me. Tasha Subash up a break for three on North Carolina's Riley Tran. Love 30 here, though. Oh, and Pietro Felling got the hold. Excuse me. So, match sticks alive, and it's a reverse dynamic here. In set number one, it was Pietro Felling. Big first set lead. It was up 7 6 4 3. Oh, it was up, excuse me, 5 4 served for the first set before Andres Martin made his move. Ends up taking it in a breaker in set number one. And now, though, Pietro Felling loves 30 here. He trails 3 4 by a break of serve in set two. Construction there from Pietro Felin. And again, what's so interesting about this Pepperdine team, Daniel DeJong is going to play one. And as we put, by the way, Felin gets the break of serve 4 4 all, so he's right back in it here on court 10. But again, DeJong is going to play one. He might be the best player in all of California. August Holmgren, Stefan Dostinek would like a conversation there. So would Arthur Ferry, by, and by the way, and Axel Geller. But Again, that's how good DeJong's been this fall. Andrew Rogers, we're going to see compete later on today. I don't want to say he's your shoe in for number two singles, but given the experience he has, given, you know, again, his results from this fall, you think he probably lines up at that two singles position. The question for the Waves, and in particular, if they want to compete beyond the conference where they enter as the favorites this season, 
It's about that middle of the lineup. It's about that three single spot, that four single spot, shoring up a point in those two positions. Then, of course, finding doubles pairings down the line as well. Pietro Felling is going to be the answer to one of those questions, and they've got a couple of options. Timmy Zietvogel, another player who's likely to factor into that lineup. And again, there are others I can turn to as well, a couple of freshmen on the board. But Pietro Felling should be one of those guys too. He certainly showed good fight, good composure in his match today. Would have made sense for him to go away after dropping that first set and going down an early break here in the second. But he has. He's scrapped. He's clawed. He's found his way to back on serve here for all in set number two. Felling's captured a little bit of momentum here. It's Folly Andres Martin makes 92 out of 100 times, 93. That was one of the exceptions. Game point here coming up. Sloppy return game from Andreas Martin. And just like that, Pietro Felling retakes the lead. 5-4 uh, here now on court number 10. In the meantime, let's go back to 11. Stop me if you've heard this before. Salma Ewing breaks again. 4-2 now. She leads in the third set over Kylie Collins. She's, you know, there's they're on break here. There, there's been, I'm sorry, Ewing's up a hold here. In the third set, she held in that opening service game. That's the only one we've seen thus far. Not sure if that's a testament to these players' return skills or a testament to the nerves. What? Probably most likely somewhere in between. By the way, wouldn't shock me at all to see Kylie Collins get that one of these breaks back once again. see the racket has been tossed never a good sign of course you can see the banner behind me crack rackets we're advocates of an appropriate racket toss there i have to say given the frustration for collins the lack of rhythm she's been able to find today you can understand that toss i think when you work for a company called crack rackets you are the authority on an appropriate crack racket or not right one would hope wasn't even a crack from Collins. But that was a crack in the armor of Selma Ewing.
that's the forehand she was landing with ease in the first three minutes, 30 minutes of this match. And again, we're at the, you know, two hour nine mark here in this battle. It's a no ad, two out of three set match, and we've eclipsed the two hour mark. Speaks to the physicality of some of these points, but again, given the stage of where we're at in the match, that's a forehand Kylie Collins has to give herself just a bit more margin on. 40-30 here. Feels like this could be the one for Selma Ewing. Just get this second hold on the board in this set. Hand out of the corner from Kylie Collins. Now we're talking, folks. And again, this is round of 32 stuff. Wait till we see what we get on Friday, on Saturday. God willing, those Sunday finals. Deuce point coming up. One of those inflection points in this 9 a.m. match. And again, far side of your screens. USC's Collins in the uh, USC's Ewing in the black and the white here on the near side, Kylie Collins. By the way, big fan of the all black fits for USC. Backhand sails a bit wide. Selma Ewing. Five, wait, was that wide? Scoreboard seems to indicate 4-3 Collins. 3-4, but the... The aggression, excitement from Ewing seemed to indicate 5-2. I'll need some clarity moving forward, or maybe Kylie Collins held. And now Selma Ewing's held, and we're on serve here? Unclear to me. We'll get an update later on, figure out what's going on. In the meantime, we look elsewhere right now. Andres Martin did hold 4-5 all. Can we check in on court 13? I don't have a score update for all of you. I apologize about that fact, but just want to check in, see where we're at from a body language perspective. Whenever a coach turns the scoreboard, you seem to think that might indicate her player's in the lead, but certainly... Who's the seed here? Diana Ackley. Or excuse me, I don't think either of them seeded. This is just a brutal matchup for both of these players here early on. By the way, win these first wave of matches officially come off the board. We're going to take about a 15 minute break. From a production standpoint, got to line up the new scoreboards, make sure all the cameras are set. Some things on screen I don't think you want to see me do, so again, we're going to stick around here through the first waves, take 10 to 15 minute break. Pop back in as soon as we are set to go for those new matches or 11 15s scoreboard was updated by the way 5-2 it is selma ewing over kylie collins as we don't know the scoreboard here if we can west off let's go back to 13 now 11 excuse me 13 my bad There from Kylie Collins. 30 15 for her. Thank <laughs> you. 
can see again, God, McCallum feels this match slipping away from her. Desperation here. Starting to set in. Match points for USC Selma Ewan. What a turnaround it would be for the ITA All-American quarterfinalist out of USC. And you love that aggression here in the return position. Not done yet. Not done quite yet. Deuce point here coming up. Wow. But it's worth Natasha Subash. Deuce point set point right now on USC's Riley Tran. Tran gets the break four five all. That's a nice development for the Tar Heels. All right, we play on. Ace down the tee from Kylie Collins. That's a national champ, folks. Clutch, clutch stuff from the Texas sophomore. Let's play on. 5-3 here. Ewing now to serve forward. And again, that was our third service hold of the third set. We've played eight games. We've had three holds. Do I feel another break is is in line for us here? I don't know. We'll see. Sails a little wide on Ewing there. And again, this is, it just feels like where Kylie Collins is most dangerous. Back against the wall. Nothing to lose. Playing free tennis. With that said, let's back on 11 if we can. Stop. Choose for that. See, Super Producer Dan West off. Always busy on the ones and twos. Match points here for Selma you and what a comeback it would be. See, I love that from Collins. And I dare to say, where has that been this match? Turning a weakness into a strength. She's going to tee, up, tee in on your backhand wing. Fine. Be a little bit more aggressive on that wing. You've seen what happens when you've played tentative tennis. Collins there unloading on that backhand. 
third match point fought off here. Now still 40-30. Two more to go for Ewing. But never count Collins out until the match is over. Too tentative. Too tentative there from Selma Ewing. She had the forehand she was looking to move in on. She set her feet. She set up the body. But then she pulled back. And you can't do that against Kylie Collins. If you give Collins enough opportunity, she'll find that forehand. She'll strike. Now, you know, Dave, they call me No Break Alex. That's my middle name. Unfortunately, it's the ones and twos. It's not the Alex. It's the tech. But of course, no. I mean, again, we are here. First ball to last. I cracked rackets. Catch matches like these, my friend. Couple of aggressive backhands we play on here on court 11. And a couple of things you may have noticed on the screen. A, it's getting a little blurry out there. I do apologize for that. That's again a technology thing. That's part of the reason we got to just reset everything, make sure we're good moving forward. Part number two, the aggression out of the backhand corner from Kylie Collins. That is why she remains a player to watch. Just make another jump here in her sophomore season in Austin because there's that quality to her. She's going down swinging. And again, just the depth she was able to put out of those backhands in the corner, the depth she was able to produce on the backhand winner down the line. That's not what we've seen over the past two hours and just the urgency she is now playing with here with her back pushed against the wall. Five match points fought off overall now. Five match points fought off. Way to go, Kylie Collins. I mean, again, that's what it's all about, folks. That is why we are so excited to be on the call this weekend. And again, Alex Gruskin, Daniel Westoff here on the ones and twos at Cracked Rackets. This is it, folks. The coup de grace, the piece de resistance of the fall season here at what is it, 24, uh, 12 regions, excuse me, across the country, 24 finalists. I believe we've got the semi finalists from the ITA All Americans as well. Wild cards thrown into the mix also. What a swing of momentum here, folks. And again, you can see windy conditions. 
Seems to be blowing from left to right on our screen. Oh, that's an overrule. First one we've seen of the event. I'm not going to make a merit judgment one way or the other. Kylie Collins is not happy about the call. Up 30-15 still. And again, we see the blur on the camera as well. Gotta love the elements, folks. That's wind versus machine. Wind currently winning. Still enough for us to enjoy this action, certainly. One call. It feels like momentum has suddenly just been halted for Kylie Collins. 30 15, uh, 30 love, excuse me, becomes 30 all. Meanwhile, Martin Felling, second set breaker. I'm keeping my eye on that. We get to a match point, we'll pop over to it. Big upset on the day. George's Mel Riasco closes out a 7 6 6 4 victory over Lisa Czar. It's a one for the Bulldogs here at this Fall National. It's a heck of a result. Appreciate Dave Mullins mentioning this. It's a good call. ITA Cup winners. Also involved here. By the way, you know Dave Mullen's not at the scene because you would have seen the beautifully dressed high school skinny man on the sidelines of the bleachers. We don't see him here, reported to us from ITA HQ. Get him to pop on the Zoom at some point as well. Again, we're going to work on this for day two, day three. Listeners of our Cracked Rackets podcast will know there's few things I enjoy more than the match point dramatic slow clap. We'll see if we can work a slow clap sound effect in at some point. But this is a quadruple threat. Game point, break point, set point. Oh, deuce point, match point. Quintuple threat here on court five. Uh, 11. It was one match point too many, and Selma Ewing completes the three set comeback. That's as impressive of a victory as we're going to see here today, folks. 4 6, 6 2, 6 4. Absolute slug it out battle between her and Texas's Kylie Collins. Ewing now advancing, where I believe she will now face the winner. Let's see at the top of the draw. Yes, for Ewing, she will now face. So it doesn't get any easier. She'll face the winner of ITA All American and number three seed South Carolina, Sarah Hamner and Elsa Tomais. Let's move now to the other matches we have on court. Can we go to court number? I want to say it's third. What number is it? Court number 10 right now, second set breaker. Pietro Felling, Andres Martin. This is one of our final matches of the morning session. Maybe our very final. Oh, we've got two left from the morning session still on court. Andres Martin versus Pietro Fellin. Irina Cantos Siemers taking on Ayana Ackley of South Carolina. So again, courts 10, 13, the ones we are monitoring most closely. Looks like Riley Tran has flipped the script, was down a break. Subash had set point in the first. She's now up 5-1. 
in the first set. Breaker, Stanford's Yepa Finova, now taking on USC's Aaron Caetano. We saw Stanford's Connie Ma knock off uh, uh, Snow Han of USC earlier in the day. So that's another Trojan Cardinal battle for us to keep our eye on. But folks, you may have seen it on your screen. We're going the distance here on court number 10. Felon, Martin, into the third set. Can we pop over to court number 13 quickly, Westoff? Just see where they're at right now. Make sure Kanto Simers Ackley still on court. Again, that's court number 13. Indeed, they are here. You see these two slugging away. I can promise you. They are in the midst of the third set right now. Keep an eye on that scoreboard. Try and get an update for you. In the meanwhile, we do have a scoreboard I can confidently say is accurate so can we go to court 18 that's one we haven't visited yet it's a sec uh it's part of the second wave of matches we've seen on the day court 18 unc's riley tran taking on virginia's natasha subash again that's court 18 tran and subash There's a couple of fascinating matchups across the board right now what a win for Selma Ewing. And again, as the day goes on, we're going to try and get some players, coaches on the grounds to pop up on the Zoom with us. And just if we can, I know we're still trying to figure out all the calls. I just want to, again, we are about to take a 10 to 15 minute break. Just got to figure out some tech things on our side to perfect our coverage moving forward. It's the morning session. Players waking up. You're all waking up. We're waking up. This is what it's all about here, folks. ITA National Fall Championships. But set point here, 3-6. What a turnaround it would be for Riley Tran, and you all know the rules. There's got to be at least one two-handed forehand in the North Carolina lineup at all times. The good news is when Cam Mora graduates, Riley Tran's ready to take over, take the belt from her. She has flipped this match around from set point down, now leads 6-3 here in the first set breaker, and she takes the first set. Does Riley Tran up set alert on the horizon again? Tran 7-6 first set over top 25 player in the country in Virginia's Natasha Subash. Now, uh, well, again, the results we have seen thus far on the day, the matches we have been watching closely here, a couple of upsets that are most notable. Alafia Ayani, huge win for Cornell and all of these Ivy League schools after not competing in 2021. Great to get them back on court great victory for Aini over the seated Gabriel Diallo of Kentucky. You also had big upset from Stanford freshman Connie Mon. The Stanford freshmen are out on the board right now. If you want to follow matches individually while we take this break, Yepa Fanova currently on uh, the court right now as she, I believe, takes on Cayetano of USC. That's another Stanford Trojan matchup, but that was an upset earlier on the day. Uh, you had another upset on the women's side. Mel Riasco, freshman for Georgia, straight set win over Pepperdine's Lisa Czar. Perhaps your most impressive victory of the day, Sven Law, 6-1-6 love. There was about 55 minutes over Columbia's West Paul. Your other winners, Fiona Crawley, uh, Stefan Dostinick. You had a win from James Davis of Denver, Arthur Ferry, and then, of course, the match we were monitoring all morning, Selma Ewing. The imp I would say the most impressive win of the day. Three sets for her in a comeback performance over Kylie Collins. That's where things stand. 
as we turn towards the afternoon. And again, matches live from the Barnes Tennis Center in San Diego. We'll have coverage from first ball to last here at Crack Racket. So don't go away. We'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes. Again, to follow scores, tennis ticker, to follow matches individually, tennis tracker, to find the links for all of these things. Check out the ITA Tennis website. We are college tennis. But for now, signing off. Just again, 10, 15 minute break while we figure some things out. I'm Alex Gruskin. You are watching our Crack Rackets coverage of the 2021 ITA National Fall Championships. With that said, let's transition now and talk about the men. And obviously, you mentioned this already. You look at the men's draw. With that said, let's transition now and talk about the men. And obviously, you mentioned this already. You look at the men's draw. The first rounds aren't quite as appealing, I would say. Not not quite the degree of spice as we have on the women's side. But again, none of the top 10 men in the field here. No Draxel, no Kingsley, no Boy Tom. They're all playing pro events this week. And you can... Further, you can go further. Duarte Bali's not playing. He's playing pro events. No Sam Riffis, who's just not playing, period, here this week. You got a bunch of other guys who would have been in consideration. And yet, there's still some juice, right? And I let you go first with the women. I'm going to steal the thunder here for the men. I think there's two you point to. And I think, honestly, these are the two. If you, if you want to throw Reynolds Trotter in there as an honorable mention and Diallo versus Elafia Aini as an honorable mention as well, I'll listen to those. But for me, it's Tracy versus Aguilar, and it's Holmgren versus the Doc, Jeffrey von der Schulenberg. Those are my two. It's like those are the ones I will be watching most closely tomorrow during this event, which, by the way, I completely – I knew it. Oh, actually, let me look for the women to see if I'm wrong. Nope, everything starts at 9 a.m. So, of course, we're going to have to move our broadcast back an hour. Westoff will be super excited about that. Leave all of this in, Westoff. Uh, this is my, by the way, him telling – me telling him when he goes back to do the edits, he'll be like oh, – you, you. Um, but anyways, all of that said, your most interesting first round matchups are those the two you're watching when you have your eye on. You saw my tweet, uh, uh, JVDS uh, versus Holmgren, absolutely on the list. Tracy Aguilar, absolutely on the list. Um, so those are the two. Uh, the two other ones I'm, I wouldn't say are like the spicy first rounds, but ones I'm in, in, intrigued about um, is Westfall versus Sven Law. I think that's one that's going to tell us about how good this Columbia team can be. And then Dostinich Musatelli of Kentucky. The reason being, um, that's another one where I think, how good is this Kentucky team? I think this match will tell us. Um, and I'm curious to see how Dostinich is. He had to retire in the ITA regionals with, I believe, an ankle injury. Um, it was good to see that he's, uh, he's, he's playing here. So it means he's at least somewhat healthy. But um, we'll see how well he can rebound from that ankle injury. I hope he hears this on the podcast because I would say this to his face. I'd say this to Coach Macy's face. We were playing around with the streams, just trying to make sure our broadcast worked. And as we were playing around, who was on the practice court we were watching? Stefan Dostinich and the USC Trojans. They looked good. He looked healthy. The the ankle looked fine. And again, this is an unofficial reading of the tea leaves, but I'm pretty sure that was, I mean, you can recognize Stefan Dostinich. And I've said this before. It's irrelevant to you listeners because you don't know him. I have a roommate from college. This guy named Blake Ahadi. I suppose you can look him up. And at this point you can find anyone. He's literally the skinnier unathletic version of this tonic. And I, and I told him that before and he, and I sent him a photo and he goes, you know what? I'll take it. He's like, not bad. (laughs) He's like, fine. I'll take that comparison. Um, not bad. Yeah. I I think that's a good call uh, on West Paul law, by the way, I got the chance to see West Paul down in Knoxville. And I think any repetition to see a Columbia player, whether it's West Paul, whether it's cots and just in general, after missing the lions for the past year and a half, they just keep bringing in top five recruiting class after top five recruiting class lost Banerjee to Stanford. We haven't talked about that yet on the show. That's a tough loss. That Huge. is. Yeah. And by the way, if you threw the grapevine, it's not an indictment of Columbia. That's just Banerjee's dream, dream school. And the moment he got that Stanford offered, he was always going to take it. And so, again, don't let that diminish what this Columbia team has brought in from a recruiting standpoint. And they've got essentially two classes of freshmen, West Paul amongst that group. Kotzen's the youngest third year in Columbia history. He's barely, you know, scratched the surface and he's been playing pro events all the time. I think they're both interesting Alafi Aini was a guy who was one of the top recruits in the country. And when he decided to go to Cornell, it was such a fascinating decision. And now he plays a guy in Gabriel Diallo, who, you know, as Draxel was the headline, 
but it was the progression of Diallo and hurry on in two and three that made Kentucky, Kentucky last season. And so that's a must watch for me. And then Byler body, just because those are two programs I'm keeping an eye on, you know, the quietest three back to back to back NCAA finals appearances in history, the dy- the almost dynasty that never was, we don't talk about was the Roddick Oklahoma teams. And I've decided to switch. I think Nuno now gets the love he deserves. The most underrated player of the 2010s is Axel, Alver, uh, Axel Alvarez of mm. Oklahoma and just what he and Guillermo, I don't want to butcher the last name, but, and, you know, Alex Galea and Spencer Papa and Andrew Harris, what that yep. nucleus was able to do over three years, they willed that team to three straight NCAA finals. And now, you know, Oklahoma is an afterthought in the big 12 and they're SEC bound. Let's be clear. It, things do not get easier for them moving forward and just, you know, we were talking about this, like, you know, Mason Byler's the guy now for that team. And, you know, again, he's taken on a Taha body who made the final of the regional and it's looking to be a bounce back year for Wake Forest. And you never want to sleep on Tony Bresky team who always have another recruit in the pipeline and still have plenty of talent assembled on campus. It would just be nice for either program to get a quarterfinal from Byler, from body, build some momentum heading into the dual match season. And I, that's why I think just from a, from a program standpoint, Baha, uh, body Byler is interesting. Yep. It's interesting. It feels like a lot of these matchups are much more about the program than it are, yeah. is for the individual players on the men's side, um, which is timely uh, as we do all of our, you know, calls. How about saying vote so? I, mean, I always get in trouble when I bring up Duke, so I'm not going to say too much here, but like, boy, did Duke need that win from Andrew Zhang. Boy, does that feel good for a Duke program that has not had much to celebrate over the past few seasons. They're celebrating the win. And by the way, Andrew Zhang from my hometown, Go Sports Club West Bloomfield, Andrew Zhang, a guy who, yeah, you know, I've known him since he was a pipsqueak um, and gets the victory. That's awesome to see. That's a fun first round matchup between he and Votzel because Zhang makes every match he plays physical. But, you know, again, boy, did they need that. Yeah, that was huge. And that came as a surprise. So really good to see see duke back in the in yeah. the conversation and now you see why i get in trouble whenever i bring them up because <laughs> that's a program i have very strong feelings about but nevertheless let's get into it four questions again best first round matchups we've hit let's talk about the seeds on upset alert and given there are no top 10 uh players in the draw you could argue every seeds on upset alert again do we know much about clement chittick uh, of w- w- Washington before the start of this fall season, not particularly. He's been exceptional. And, you know, Arthur Ferry was a guy we'd all circled to be the impact freshman of 2022. We just didn't get to see much of an impact for anything from Stanford, given they just didn't get to play that frequently throughout the course of the year. You know, we get to see Illigan from Hawaii get to step up after a return performance for him at the national indoors. Can Holmgren, Tracy keep up their success of late? Who are the seeds you have on upset alert? My definition or your definition? So I'll, I'll continue with mine because it feels like the reverse of the women's side for where I feel almost all the seeds are on upset alert. I don't really have many of these guys on upset alert other than the kind of hot first round matches we've already discussed. Obviously, Tracy Aguilar feels like a toss up. So that has to be, you know, a upset alert. Holmgren, Schulenberg, that's going to be a great match. So got to put that on upset alert. Other than that, you kind of mentioned Diallo, maybe. He's had such a good fall, though. He seems to be playing really well. I, I would feel really confident in, in most of these seeds advancing to at least the second round, with the exception um, of I had uh, Dawson, which is an asterisk, but based on some insider reporting I just got on the pod, it sounds <laughs> like uh, he's playing pretty easy. He's, he's, he's looking good. So I don't think there's that many upset alerts here. I agree with you. I mean, Aguilar Tracy isn't an upset if Aguilar wins. That's just a good match. I think, I think if the doc beats Holmgren, that is an upset. That's like, I I would qualify that one, but I don't have him on upset alert. Is Aini over Diallo an upset? Like, is it? We just haven't seen Elafia play in such a long time because obviously there was no Cornell last season. So like that makes an upset, right? Okay. That's fair. Zango for votes. would that be an upset? That'd be a huge upset. Okay, then those are the seeds I have on upset alert. <laughs> There's your answer <laughs> right. uh, for you. But on the flip side, dark horses who could have success at this event. Again, yeah. 
Arthur Ferry might be a dark horse as the number two seed while also being overseeded. He might be the dark horse. We saw the success he had on the pro circuit. I've mentioned the guys, obviously, Vander Schulenberg, and uh, I think is primed for a big year. Certainly, Virginia needs him to have a big year given they're down Carl Soderlin. Someone's got to step up into that number one singles position. I mean, yeah. Any Baylor Bear is inherently a dark horse. Sven La, sure, dark horse in this event. Andres Martin of Georgia Tech, I would argue, is a dark horse as well. Am I missing any names? Any guys I'm forgetting about? Yeah, so I, I tried to go with the darker dark horses here. Um, <laughs> uh, Andres Martin was one I had had um, had flagged. Um, He's, if you're a tennis hipster as it relates to college tennis, Andres Martin is who you're rooting for. He's the college tennis hipster take. <laughs> I think that's a good take. Yeah. Um, you know, he's had a good fall. He beat Paralak. He's beaten Henning. Um, he's beaten Hildebrand. Um, you know, he's he's playing some good tennis. Um, and then the other one is actually Hildebrand as well. Um, he was he beat Shelton out of the gate. You know, I think it was Shelton's first match of the fall college season. Uh, he lost to Hildebrand. Hildebrand lost to Rodriguez seven six in the third in one of the early fall events. Um, obviously, had good success in the regional to get into the tournament. Um, so I have him as, as a dark horse as well. I had a theory and I shared it with Chris earlier this week. I think it was my birthday gift to him that the conversation between the Shelton's this past week, went something like, look, Ben, you know, I love you. If you go and play the ITL, uh, national fall event, you're going to win it. If you win the national fall event, I have to play you at one singles. I really don't want to play you at one single. So do you mind sitting this one out? And Ben was like, yeah, that's fine. I can sit one out. No worries. I'll just go play a pro event the week after instead. Over under 15% chance some version of that conversation happened. I think it's higher. <laughs> <laughs> because some some conversation had to happen, um, you know, for why you're, why you're pulling out. So, um, and honestly, it, it makes this event more exciting without him. Um, because then we'd be talking about how, okay, well, Shelton is the favorite and he's and on the kind chase. Of See, else. I disagree. I love the chase of the history and you sweep the event. Now you've got some special things in line during the course of the year. And obviously, yeah, I come from the Virginia school of thought, you know, I want to see <laughs> Frank, the Frank sweeps, the sweep Dominic everything. John. Yeah. The yeah. Jameer Jenkins. Yeah. I'm talking to a fellow who here, so I know, you know what I'm talking about, but Yeah. I don't know. I that's fair. It's so funny. We've gone 180 here. We start out. How do we incentivize getting these players to play this event? And now it's <laughs> I actually kind of unhappy. Shelton's not playing the event, Jay. Well, if it was just Shelton, okay, right? Sure. I, I want. I, you know, I would want. Uh, you know, Shelton, Vale, Draxel, Rodriguez, right? The Riffis, whole, whole, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so if it was just Shelton, we'd be looking at basically the same tournament we played in Tulsa, mm -hmm. um, and we saw how that played out. So. I think it's, it's, you know, it's fine that he's not here. Um, Some other notable but, absences, by the way, no Tennessee players, no Walton, no Monday, yeah. no HUD even, who's had a really nice fall overall. Uh, Mitsui, obviously a little bit short in the regional, but I mean, they're going to, no one denies their top five team. And yet again, no representation here, really nothing too outstanding at the All-American either. Is it because of the Knoxville Challenger? Maybe. Is that what? Does that start Sunday? Yeah. It's then, this next coming week. So if they get qualifying wild cards, main draw wild cards, you know. Then yes, that um, is likely why. I also found out, you know, there's no AC in the indoors at Tennessee. No. I didn't know that for the longest time. And I was like, are you guys insane? And they're like, no, please can't stand the heat. Get out the kitchen. I was like, or it's 2021. Like you've got to don't, you know. Chris Woodruff made enough finals to afford an AC unit. Like, come on, he can, he can pony up for that. But they're like, no, there's, they're like, no, it's part of our toughness. If you can't handle it, this is why we are who we are. I just thought it was fascinating. That is fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've only experienced the, the luxury of uh, AC indoor units. So yeah, I, can't, exactly. I, don't know I, I can confirm like. it's hot. <laughs> it is absolutely hot in there. There's no doubt about that, but that's a good call. That's very likely why they are not there uh, again. Dark horses, Kotzen, Columbia, collision yep. course, top of the ATA rankings. You know my thoughts on him. Andrew Rogers has been sneaky good for Pepperdine this season. It just feels like, you know, again, McLean, Chittick, we don't know everything about Chittick yet. Should there be an early upset there? Perhaps Rogers is the guy to pull it off. I don't know. 
James Trotter either looks like the best player in the world or the worst player in the world. It really depends on a given tournament. So I'll throw him in the mix as well. I think we've hit all the dark horses, right? Yeah, we've mentioned every non-seed. Yeah. And even the, even the seeds are categorized as Jordan Hassan. Should we talk about Jordan Hassan a little bit? I was, as well? <laughs> I was gonna say at least Oklahoma has two players. You mentioned Baylor, um, or Byler. Um, you know, they got two. So I can say this: I do not have a, any sort of take about CSU's Alvaro Regalado. I don't have a single take about him. I'm looking forward to seeing him compete this weekend. So nice to have some diversity in the tournament. Absolutely. Shout out to the non-power five schools. With that said, predictions given to me, Jay, who's coming home with the title, who's making the final. So uh, we differ on Chittick. Um, okay. I've been super impressed with his summer results in particular. Um, I was not aware of them at the time, but in going back and reflecting on them, <laughs> very impressive summer. Uh, it's why he's seated number one here. So I have a repeat of the Northwest regional final of Chittick versus Ferry. So pretty chalk with the one, two seeds and I have Chittick taking home the title. That's creative. That's good. I had three versus four initially. I had Holmgren versus Stonic and I was like, eh, it'd be better than that, Alex. I'm going to stick with yeah. Steph. You guys know, I think, again, if USC is going to be a top 10 team, they need Dostonic to be a top 10 player. They probably need him to be better than that as well. They need him to take over the Kukerman role. They need him to take over, I don't want to say the Stevie role because the, no one's going to ever replace Stevie. But even in the years yeah. after that, they had Yannick, right? Yannick Hoffman's jumped as a solidified number one player. That's what helped carry them. The passing shot on the run forehand tiebreaker he hit against Alex Damajan on match point that swung the semifinal match. It did. And so you need that guy. I think Dostonic has all of the tools to be that guy. I think the draw opens up well for him. Also, if the ankle is healthy, he will have the opportunity to put himself in the final who he's going to match up with is tough. I think the top half of the draw is the more loaded section. Yep. Holmgren's been so excellent. We're in San Diego. It's on his home turf. Boy, would it be cool for that San Diego program to get a title at the Barnes Tennis Center in front of some home people. I'm rooting for the narrative. Do I want to go through? You go one, two, I go three, four. I'm doubling down. Give me Kotzen. A Kotzen Dostinik final. I'm, the, I'm just going to own the take. I do. I The guy's a scrapper. He claws. He fights his way through. And I know he was playing a pro event literally three days ago. Shout out to Jay Tweets Tennis Tweets. Um, but not even three days ago. Yeah, I just, there's always something funky that happens. He's going to lose his first round matchup now. Give me Kotzen. I'm going to give him the Gruskin stink. I'm going to take him to make the final. I think he beats Holmgren in the semis in a tight three setter. And then I just think Steph wins the title. I think this is the Dostinic reminder of, yeah, if the top 10 guys aren't going to be here, I'm going to remind you all that I'm the best of the rest. And I think this helps him from a ranking standpoint moving forward as well. I'll take Dostinic. Yeah, over home, uh, over, excuse me, Kotzen. And by the way, Chris Helioris, I called him. I was like, give me your take. And he goes, I'll take Dostinic. And I was like, no, I'm taking him. Try again. And he goes, no, I'm taking him too. And I was like, all right, this is not, that means he's definitely not winning. Um, but that's where we're at with the singles. And again, it should be an exciting four days of action in the men's singles competition. With that said, let's transition now and talk about the men. And obviously you mentioned this already. You look at the men's draw. The first rounds aren't quite as appealing, I would say. Not no. not quite the degree of spice as we have on the women's side. But again, none of the top 10 men in the field here. No Draxel, no Kingsley, no Boy Tom. They're all playing pro events this week. And you can further, you can go further. Duarte Bali's not playing. He's playing pro events. No Sam Riffis, who's just not playing, period, here this week. You got a bunch of other guys who would have been in consideration. And yet, there's still some juice, right? And I let you go first with the women. I'm going to steal the thunder here for the men. I think there's two you point to. And I think, honestly, these are the two. If you, if you want to throw Reynolds Trotter in there as an honorable mention and Diallo versus Elafia Aini as an honorable mention as well, I'll listen to those. But for me, it's Tracy versus Aguilar and it's Holmgren versus the Doc, Jeffrey von der Schulenberg. Those are my two. It's like, those are the ones I will be watching most closely tomorrow during this event, which by the way, I completely, I knew it. Oh, actually, let me look for the women to see if I'm wrong. Nope. Everything starts at 9 a.m. So of course, we're going to have to move our broadcast back an hour. Westoff will be super excited about that. Leave all of this in Westoff. Uh, this is my, by the way, him telling me, telling him when he goes back to do the edits, he'll be like, oh, you 
you <laughs> um but anyways all of that said your most interesting first round matchups are those the two you're watching when you have your eye on you saw my tweet uh, uh jvds uh versus holmgren absolutely on the list tracy aguilar absolutely on the list um so those are the two uh, the two other ones I'm, I wouldn't say are like the spicy first rounds, but ones I'm in, in, intrigued about, um, is Westfall versus Fen Law. I think that's one that's going to tell us about how good this Columbia team can be. And then Dostinich Musatelli of Kentucky. The reason being, um, that's another one where I think how good is this Kentucky team? I think this match will tell us. Um, and I'm curious to see how Dostinich is. He had to retire in the ITA regionals with, I believe, an ankle injury. Um, it was good to see that he's uh, he's he's playing here, so it means he's at least somewhat healthy. But um, we'll see how well he can rebound from that ankle injury. I hope he hears this on the podcast because I would say this to his face. I'd say this to Coach Macy's face. We were playing around with the streams, just trying to make sure our broadcast worked. And as we were playing around, who was on the practice court we were watching? Stefan Dostinich and the USC Trojans. They looked good. He looked healthy. Okay. The, the ankle looked fine. And again, this is an unofficial reading of the tea leaves, but. I'm pretty sure that was, I mean, you can recognize Stefan Dostinich, and I've said this before, it's irrelevant to you listeners because you don't know him. I have a roommate from college, this guy named Blake Ahadi. I suppose you can look him up, and at this point, you can find anyone. He's literally the skinnier, unathletic version of Dostinich, and I, and I told him that before, and, he, and I sent him a photo, and he goes, you know what, I'll take it. He's like, not bad. <laughs> He's like, fine, I'll take that comparison. Yeah, um, not bad. Yeah, I, I think that's a good call. Uh, on West Paul Law, by the way, I got the chance to see West Paul down in Knoxville. And I think any repetition to see a Columbia player, whether it's West Paul, whether it's Cots, and just in general, after missing the Lions for the past year and a half, they just keep bringing in top five recruiting class after top five recruiting class lost Banerjee to Stanford. We haven't talked about that yet on the show. That's a tough loss. That Huge. is. Yeah. And by the way, if you threw the grapevine, it's not an indictment of Columbia. That's just Banerjee's dream, dream school. And the moment he got that Stanford offered, he was always going to take it. And so, again, don't let that diminish what this Columbia team has brought in from a recruiting standpoint. And they've got essentially two classes of freshmen, West Paul amongst that group. Kotzen's the youngest third year in Columbia history. He's barely, you know, scratched the surface and he's been playing pro events all the time. I think they're both interesting Alafi Aini was a guy who was one of the top recruits in the country. And when yeah. he decided to go to Cornell, it was such a fascinating decision. And now he plays a guy in Gabriel Diallo, who, you know, as Draxel was the headline, but it was the progression of Diallo and Hurrion in two and three that made Kentucky, Kentucky last season. And so that's a must watch for me. And then Byler body, just because those are two programs I'm keeping an eye on, you know, the quietest three back-to-back-to-back NCAA finals appearances in history, the dy- the almost dynasty that never was, we don't talk about, was the Roddick Oklahoma teams. And I've decided to switch. I think Nuno now gets the love he deserves. The most underrated player of the 2010s is Axel, uh, Alver- uh, Axel Alvarez of mm. Oklahoma and just what he and Guillermo, I don't want to butcher the last name, but, and, you know, Alex Galea and Spencer Papa and Andrew Harris, what that yep. nucleus was able to do over three years, they willed that team to three straight NCAA finals. And now, you know, Oklahoma is an afterthought in the big 12 and they're SEC bound. Let's be clear. It, things do not get easier for them moving forward. And just, you know, we were talking about this, like, you know, Mason Byler's the guy now for that team. And, you know, again, he's taken on a Taha body who made the final of the regional and it's looking to be a bounce back year for wake forest. And you never want to sleep on Tony Bresky team who always have another recruit in the pipeline and still have plenty of talent assembled on campus. It would just be nice for either program to get a quarterfinal from Byler from body build some momentum heading into the dual match season. And I, that's why I think just from a, from a program standpoint, Baha, uh, body Byler is interesting. Yep. It's interesting. It feels like a lot of these matchups are much more about the program than it are, yeah. is for the individual players on the men's side, um, which is timely uh, as we do all of our, you know, calls. How about saying votes? So I, mean, I always get in trouble when I bring up Duke, so I'm not going to say too much here, but like, boy, did Duke need that win from Andrew Zhang. Boy, does that feel good for a Duke program that has not had much to celebrate over the past few seasons. They're celebrating the win. And by the way, Andrew Zhang from my hometown, Go Sports Club West Bloomfield, Andrew Zhang, a guy who, yeah, you know, I've known him since he was a pipsqueak um, and gets the victory. That's awesome to see. That's a fun first round matchup between he and Votzel because Zhang makes every match he plays physical. But 
you know, again, boy, did they need that. Yeah, that was huge. And that came as a surprise. So really good to see see Duke back in the, in yeah. the conversation. And now you see why I get in trouble whenever I bring them up, because <laughs> that's a program I have very strong feelings about. But nevertheless, let's get into it. Four questions again. Best first round matchups we've hit. Let's talk about the seeds on upset alert. And given there are no top 10 uh, players in the draw, you could argue every seeds on upset alert again. Do we know much about Clement Chittick uh, of w- w- Washington before the start of this fall season? Not particularly. He's been exceptional. And, you know, Arthur Ferry was a guy we'd all circled to be the impact freshman of 2022. We just didn't get to see much of an impact for anything from Stanford, given they just didn't get to play that frequently throughout the course of the year. You know, we get to see Illigan from Hawaii get to step up after a return performance for him at the national indoors can Holmgren Tracy keep up their success of late who are the seeds you have on upset alert my definition or your definition so I'll I'll continue with mine because it feels like the reverse of the women's side for where I feel almost all the seeds are on upset alert I don't really have many of these guys on upset alert other than the kind of hot first round matches we've already discussed Obviously, Tracy Aguilar feels like a toss-up, so that has to be, you know, an upset alert. Holmgren, Schulenberg, that's going to be a great match, so got to put that on upset alert. Other than that, you kind of mentioned Diallo, maybe. He's had such a good fall, though. He seems to be playing really well. I I would feel really confident in in most of these Cs advancing to at least the second round, with the exception um, of I had uh, Dostinich as an asterisk, but based on some insider reporting, I Welcome back to our Crack Rackets coverage of the 2021 ITA National Fall Championships. Alex Gruskin thrilled to be able to call 32 of the best men's and women's collegiate tennis players from across the country competing for the right to be named a national champion. If you are just joining our coverage, A, where have you been all day? You've missed some fantastic matches thus far, but be, of course, welcome in. What we're doing here on this stream is providing what we call red zone coverage, hopping from court to court, match to match, trying to capture all of the drama happening on the grounds. Now, we just had a super producer meeting. Daniel Westoff has figured out the ones and twos, so we should be good here to expand our coverage even further, cover even more courts than we did in our earlier session. And thankfully, that's the case, as there are some fantastic matches going on right now across the grounds. What I want to do initially is just run you through everyone that's playing right now, who's playing where, what the score lines are, what the storylines you listeners and viewers should all be tuning into right now. Of course, before I do that, I do want to quickly mention two things. A, you can follow each court individually with our friends over at Tennis Tracker. Perhaps you're a fan of an individual player, you're a family member, or, you know, again, there's just one match in particular that has caught your eye. You can do that over on Tennis Tracker. You can follow all of the scores constantly with our friends over at Tennis Ticker. No relation. Very similar name. I know Tennis Ticker. Uh, Of course, shout out to them for providing the scores, the updates for all of us fans. And of course, you can find links to both of those things over on the ITA website. We are college tennis. With that said, Westoff, let's not see my face any more than we have to. Let's get over to the courts. We'll start on court number six. Mate Votzel, transfer from Oklahoma State, now in Ohio State Buckeye. He kept the OSU, just a slightly different color shade right now. Big lead for him, 4-1, 40-15 over Duke's Andrew Zhang. Was a big moment for Zhang, for the Duke program, when Zhang captured his ITA regional title just, what was it, a weekend ago, two weekends ago. And if you haven't seen the video recap that Duke put out on social media, Highly recommend you do so. One of my favorite pieces of college tennis content we've seen on the year thus far. Of course, Votzel's looking to fill fill a big role for the Buckeyes here this season. We don't know if McNally's coming back or not. Word on the street right now is it's leaning no as such. You slide a guy like Mate Votzel, who's been a top 100 singles player, qualified for the NCAA doubles championship last season into a lineup that already returns Cannon Kingsley and James Trotter and J.J. Tracy, who's seated here today. Uh, Yeah. Buckeyes have plenty of talent. You throw in Oklahoma transfer Jake Van Emberg as well. Look, 
Buckeyes are one of the teams to watch here this season. They didn't reach the National Indoor Final Eight field last year. You know the Buckeyes and Ty Tuck are going to come out firing here this season. Of course, they swept the doubles at the All-American. Votzel, Robbie Cash earning the title over teammates James Trotter, Justin Boulay. A lot of momentum on the Buckeyes side right now. And I'll just come out and say it. I'm a fan of the black and red unis right there. That's a good look for Ohio State here. Obviously, a good look here for Votel right now. The lead over Andrew Zhang, 5-1. Always feels like worth mentioning this. Andrew Zhang from my hometown. I've known him since he was a tiny Todd. It's always great uh, to see Zhang have this sort of success. And again, big win for his Duke Blue Devils uh, when he captured the region. That was a much-needed momentum boost for the Duke program. So that's your action here on court six, one five Zhang serving. Let's stick around actually for a hot second to see if Zhang can get a hold on the board here, extend this first set a little bit further. That's beautiful. Patient, disciplined, track tennis, excuse me, not tennis tracker. For the live scores, track, te uh, track tennis for the live video, excuse me, not tennis tracker, track tennis. Shout out to our friends. You see the label, label on there. Again, I thank you to our friends track, at track tennis. Got to chat with my main man Igor over at TT earlier today they're huge proponents of college tennis and of course we fans love seeing these events so shout out to them making this possible now love 30 here for Zhang the set getting away from him quickly and hey Taylor Swift put it best Sometimes you just got to shake it off, get through the set, reset, refocus at the changeover, come out anew in set number two. Love 30 here, though, four votes. So you can tell that 30-minute break, if I'm quoting T-Swift right away, I've got energy, folks. We've got plenty of tennis left for you here today. there from Andrew saying we saw Pietro Felling miss a volley like that similarly in the first set of his match against Andreas Martin those two still on court by the way we've hit the three hour mark of that match that is your last remaining from the 9 a.m.s we saw him miss a sliding backhand volley like that such a difficult shot to execute credit to Zhang on that one This is Andrew Zhang, and you saw the hand there, by the way, indicating a ball in, not wide. But he works the angles. Lefty. Forehand short angle cross to open up the down the line. Again, it's not going to blow you away with his power. But a death by a thousand paper cut, inch by inch. Open up cracks. Slider down the tee had some nice pop on it, didn't it? Love 30 becomes 40 30.
Zhang gets the hold. Four, four, uh, four, two, five, excuse me, here on court number six. Now, with that in mind, let's continue our jump around here, see who we have on the board right now uh, across our action here at the ITA National Fall Championships. Let's go next now to court number eight. Andre Iligan of Hawaii. It's really one of the revelations of the ITA All-Americans. Iligan, semi-finalist, uh, yeah, semi-finalist at the event, serving on the far side of your, or excuse me, turning on the far side of your screen. You have not gotten to see the player out of Hawaii qualified at the ITA All-American, then beat Marcus McDaniel. TCU's Juan Carlos Aguilar, Ohio State's Cannon Kingsley, Columbia's Alex Kotzen before bowing out to August Holmgren of San Diego. That's legit, folks. That's a real run. That ain't no fluke. So, of course, all of us eagerly waiting to see how... He'll follow that performance up here at this event. Tricky one today, Alvaro Regalado. Currently serving down four five, fifteen thirty. Pretty nice, isn't it? Confidence, such a critical component in all levels of tennis, but in particular, you're playing no ad scoring. The 30 all points, the deuce points, that much more important. You just don't have as much of a margin for error. And on the run, backhand slap down the line pass like that. Gorgeous now. Two break points here, two set points as well. A nice response from Regalado. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Again, make Illigan beat you. Make him do something special. Yes, he's capable of it. Love the way he put pressure there. The plus one ball. Deuce point coming out. The ITA All American semifinalist Andre Illigan 6 4 over Elvarlo Regalado. With that, let's go to court number nine now. It's going to be just a quick pop by Alex Kotzen. Your side of your screen just held for 2 1. He had a big lead, break lead for much of the first set, ended up dropping it to Alexa Bukan. Of Arkansas, Kotzen, again, part of the Ivy League contingent. We haven't seen play in a year and a half, folks. So them, Columbia, all those Ivy League teams, we get the opportunity to see compete today. Always enjoyed that opportunity. Of course, again, he's taking on Buchan of Arkansas. Buchan took the first set 7-5. Kotzen leads 2-1 on serve in the second. Of course, Arkansas player Alexander Recco has had a successful fall on the ITF Pro Tour. Not in this event, but that Arkansas team's got some pieces, folks. Again, you play in the SEC, you're going to be battle-tested. 
This is an interesting one that I promise we will be popping back to later on on this stream. Let's go to 10 now. This is a match. If you've been with us at all today, you've seen parts of on court number 10, Andres Martin, Petro Fellin, our number three, or excuse me, we're in the, I guess we've done three hours, so this is the fourth hour, I suppose, of the match. Andres Martin on court 10 again. Currently up 4 2 on Pietro Fellin. And again, Alex Gruskin here of Cracked Rackets. You want to follow us for more college tennis coverage? You can do so on Twitter at Cracked Rackets. You can do, follow me directly at Great Shot Pod. Of course, if you go to the Great Shot Podcast feed on Apple Podcasts right now, you'll be able to hear our preview of this event. Cracked Rackets contributor John Parson. Joined me. Talk about the seeds on upset alert to dark horses. Cotson was one of my picks. The guy I thought could have some success in this event. Had the opportunity there to miss the volley. It's very Tommy Polish to me, just a lot of bees around there. Excuse me, very Oliver Crawfordy. For me, the way they hit the forehand, the fluidity around the court, good strength for their size as well, good depth, do a little bit of everything. Not going to overwhelm you with any one aspect, but again, if I'm surprised to see that first round result. right away again for Bukhan. He's making this match physical. Throwing junk at Kotzen. Forehand slice. Just depth. Giving him nothing to work with. Have a score update, by the way. Good news for the San Diego natives. Town student Abigail Desientic uh, Des let's, let's get it. Desietnikov. There it is. 5-6-3 victory over Alicia Hirana Linana of Baylor. So Desiatnikov advancing to the round of 16. Another University of San Diego student, August Holmgren, going to be competing later today as well. Ball called wide, confirmed from the chair umpire. Spokane holds for two all. Let's go to court number 10 now. <clears throat> Excuse me, if we can, Westoff. This is a matchup we're familiar with, folks. And again, I was trying to plug it earlier. Not sure if we're flipping to 10. There we go. Looks like we have our decision. Believe it was Andreas Martin. Scoreboard's a little bit behind, but he ultimately earns the victory. Three sets over Pepperdine's Pietro Fellin was a heck of a matchup. You can see the new players out on court, so that one's completed. Looks like court 
11 unlabeled. Some of these courts are a little unsure of right now. If we go to 11. I think this is 13. I think Contos Ackley ended up finishing. We'll have to look on Twitter, see who the winners of those two matchups were. Again, Nash's court, I know for sure. I know on th if we're on th flipping around here. I believe I'm going to go with this is Rebecca Mertena. Taking on Tassapur Naklo of Iowa State. I'm doing a bit of inferring here, but that looks like a Tennessee orange to me. So I believe for those of you trying to follow along at home, that's our matchup on court 11. Let's go to 12, try and figure out if we can see who we've got there. That looks like a Cam Mora forehand to me. Two hands, both wings. It looks like I see some Carolina blue of Coach Calvis there on the sideline. So I'm going to say court 12. It's Petra Hule, uh, Hule, excuse me, of FSU taking on Cam Nora, Mora of North Carolina. Yeah, that's for sure, Mora. can lock that in. Near side of your court, Hool of Florida State currently up 6 1 1 love in this match. I don't think I gave a score update. Mertena of Tennessee, 2 all right now with Naklo of Iowa State for those curious. But again, so here on 12, we have Mora and Hool. I know I'm not supposed to pat myself on the back. Shout out to me. There are only so many two-handed forehands, but yeah, I think we know who these players are now. I think we're going to be able to solve this. So again, if you're following at home, I know some of these courts aren't labeled right now. Court 11 is Naclo of Iowa State, Mertena, Tennessee. Court 12, Hool of Florida State, Mora of North Carolina, Cam Moore going big at the body there. Just looking to get some sort of spark. Again, down 6-1-1 one, one love here. Break of serve. Let's get back on serve now. She does. One all here. Sends a little message. I'm not going away just yet. Of course, Mora going to be one of those North Carolina Tar Heels looking to fill the hole left by the departure of McKenna Jones, Sarah Davitella, Alexa Graham meant so much to that program. And of course, we saw a win earlier on the day from still undefeated in college. Played number six for them last year. Fiona Crawley, Riley Tran right now, 763 all. She leads Virginia's Natasha Subash. I don't think the Tar Heels are going away quite yet, folks. How's that for a two-handed forehand? It's getting 12, Mora, Hule, currently one all. Hule, excuse me, as Mora gets the break back. Let's go to court 13. I believe I can correctly identify the crew on 13 stuff. And I believe that crew right now is your number one seed here. In this event, Clement Chid, uh, Clement Chid, uh, Chidick, excuse me, of Washington, near side of your screen, those Washington colors, kind of recognizable.
Chittick, number one seed via his semifinal performance at the ITA All-American. Got wins over Jonas Sieverts of Arizona, Ryan Getz of Virginia, three sets over Stefan Dostinich of USC, three sets over Gabriel Diallo, Kentucky as well. He's taking on one of the best names in college tennis, in Tad McLean. Does it get better than that, folks? McLean, of course, part of an Auburn team that saw one of their doubles duos reach the NCAA Finals in 2021. Coach Bobby Reynolds. It's momentum building for the Tigers, but of course, Again, in that SEC conference, you've got Florida defending national champs, Tennessee, conference tournament champs, and NCAA semifinalists. They arguably are better this season. Kentucky's ready to make a jump. South Carolina's ready to make a jump. Georgia's always in the mix. The Mississippi's aren't going anywhere. Going anywhere. Auburn's not going anywhere. And I didn't even mention Texas AM. And by the way, Texas and Oklahoma, they're coming too. Fun times ahead for us to see tennis fans. I'm quickly buying in on the game of Clement Chittick. Very smooth, easy power both wings, condensed back swings. By the way, to those of you in our YouTube comments, we know scoring can lag behind at times. Doing our best to get those to you as quickly as possible. Shout out to our friends at Tennis Ticker for making all of this possible. Shout out to our friends at Track Tennis, of course, for the streams you see in front of you. And we got a comment from Kunal Gupta. Thank you for tuning in, Kunal. He asked, what was the score in Columbia? Match for Conson versus Buchan in Arkansas. Last we checked, it was on serve to all. And again, we're going to try and jump around to all of these matches. <clears throat> Excuse me, throughout the day, going to stick here through this service game as we go court to court for the unlabeled, in case you missed it. Court 11, the matchup between Tennessee and Iowa State. Court 12, Hewell, Mora, Florida State, North Carolina here on 13. Chittick taking on McLean. Misses the approach. Break goes to the Husky. 2-1 here on court 13. Let's go to 14 now. Play. Little game, guessing game. By the way, I think Noel and who Iowa Princeton are going on court 10 to follow that matchup between Martin and Felding. But let's go if we can. No 14, you're correct. That's on me. No 14, no 15. I forgot. Sorry, Super Producer Daniel Westoff. Let's go to 16 if we can then. Court 16 right now. See a change over here. So we'll have to pop back in a little bit. Let's go to 17 if we can. It's always beautiful. Any catch up duo post changeover. This is a fun one, folks. August Holmgren. Nearly qualified, got a win over Jordan Thompson, top 100 player, nearly qualified for the ATP event in San Diego. Ended up getting a lucky loser. 
into the main draw where he lost to Grigor Dimitrov, finalist at the ITA All-American. He's taking on one of the rising sophomores, the next generation of college tennis talent. And that's the doc himself, Jeffrey von der Schulenberg. Of course, in these corners of the woods goes by Doc Vaughn. Six one first set for Holmgren. And playing on his home courts, looking to capitalize on that momentum he built this fall. Had a bunch of success at the futures level as well this summer. Just see the pressure he puts on you, the weight of that first forehand under Schulenberg. As well rounded of a game as you were gonna find. And that was a play, you know. The doc was ready for his first season of college tennis. Plenty of success at the top of the line for ACC champions, Virginia. But now there's no Carl Soderlin at the top of that lineup. The last connective threat from those NCAA championship teams. It's officially the Pedroso era at Virginia. Jeffrey's going to be one of the guys they turn to at the top of that lineup. That class of he, Rodesh, and Yaki Montez. So talented. Expect some fight from the dock here in set number two. 15-30 now. And Holmgren on the far side of your court. Those San Diego Powder Blues. This is court 17, as you all can see. And again, we apologize. No courts 14 or 15 for us. Just no cameras on those courts. Trying by process of elimination, figure out who's playing there. Still have two to go in our roundup, and then we'll start jumping from, you know, again, to the most interesting pressing of the action. Here comes the doc. You see the movement. Good off both wings. Sneaks it up the line. Three break point chances now to get us back on serve. I think we've seen Holmgren hit the backhand yet. One hand for him on that wing. That game predicated the serve, the forehand. Again, he's got as much plus one power as anyone in the nation here this season. 30-40. Of course, worth mentioning going on right now in Charlottesville. Charlottesville challenger. I don't like him, but I hear a lot of people are fans of Mike Cation on the call there, USTA Pro Circuit. Charlottesville in the air right now, folks. The Doc, Andre Schulenberg gets the break back, one all. That's the punch he needs. And you see Coach Pedroso on the sideline pumping him up. That might be Coach Rasmussen, excuse me. And his teammate in Yaki Montez, three set win over Peter Polanski before he got knocked out by Pranesh Gunaswaran in the round of 30, uh, 16, 32, I think 16 in Charlottesville. A ton of former and current collegiate players had the opportunity to go compete over there. I know JJ Wolf still alive. Good week for former ITA. National Fall Champ Nuno Borges in Tenerife this week at the Challenger. Made the quarterfinals of that event. Not sure how he did today. Maybe plays tomorrow. 
But again, one all here on 17. Let's go to 18 next. Check back in on this one a little bit later. Don't you worry. But on court 18 right now. This is a fun one. This is one we've kept our eye on all day. One that we got to check out on a bit earlier before we went to break. Riley Tran. Natasha Subash. Now, unfortunately, the scoreboard's a bit behind right now. Subash served for the first set. Was actually at 5-4 deuce. Before Tran was able to car charge a comeback. Ends up taking that first set 7-6. Looks like we're a bit of an injury timeout right now for Subash. See someone rolling on the leg. Yep, see her heavily taped on that right leg. Meanwhile, Tran on the right side of your screen bouncing, trying to stay loose. So again, that's what's on 18. Let's also go to Stadium now quickly. That's the final court we've yet to hit. See who's competing out there. Right now on Stadium Court, that looks like Stanford Red. If this is Yepafanova taking on Cayetano, we may have to lock in here for a little bit, folks. Of course, Yepafanova. One of the top recruits in the country. First set went the way of the try. By process of elimination, this is it. This is the match on stadium court. For those curious, following at home, again, it's Yepafanova, Cayetano, <clears throat> excuse me, here on stadium. Right now, it's Cayetano, who I believe was a semifinalist at the ITA All American. 7 5 lead for her. Now, two all here. In set number two. Of course, Yepafanova, blue chip recruit. It's ranked as high as number 10 in the world in the ITF junior rankings. Excuse me, 40-30 here. Nova reached the 2019 U.S. Open Junior Finals. Got wins over San Diego finalist in 2021, Reese Brantmeyer, and Defruvertova for getting knocked out in the final by now top 50 WTA Pro Maria Camilla Sorio Serrano. Did not see much of Yepa Finova, though, in 2021. It's a great result for her to get to the final of her ITA regional. She lost a fellow Stanford phenom, Connie, Connie Ma. It's a nice hold, though, for Cayetano here. And again, from a scoreboard perspective, I believe it's 3-2, Yepa Finova. Have to keep our eye on that. Moving forward. Meanwhile, we look around the grounds. Let's see what's heating up. Where should we turn our attention to? Let's go. Let's go back to Mora Hewell. If we can. I believe that's court number 12, West off.
scoreboard lagging a little bit behind here. Who will dominant 6-1 first set. I was able to get that break back right away. Unlikely that they're still in that one all service game, but perhaps they are. Unlikely though. How about that point from Cam Mora? And again, Mora's a fascinating player this season as, you know, again, she did not have the ending to 2021 she was looking for. Was banged up entering the NCAA tournament, just wasn't able to play her best tennis. For a bounce back result here. This would be a nice come from behind victory given that lopsided first set score. Of course, for Huel, trying to continue to build off that momentum FSU built last season. You always love an interconference squabble. If we can, West off, and I know we're mid-game here. Can we go to court nine? Buchan, Kotzen, Buchan right now, three match points, right? Up 7-5, 5-3, 15-40 in Kotzen service game. Given the pace that ball was hit over. Yeah, 15-40 here. Again, Kotzen of Columbia serving on the far side. Was a tough loss for his teammate, Max Westfall. 6-1-6, love. All right, that wasn't 15-40, because if it was, we'd be shaking hands. So now it seems to be deuce. Oh, interesting. We were just on that deuce side. Keep our eyes here in case we do have a match point. Loves that forehand slice, doesn't he? So it looks like for once, I think the scoreboard's a little bit ahead of the stream. So we're going to ignore it for now. Imagine this is the deuce point. Or wait, we're getting a big update here from the scoreboard. Keeps changing. So perhaps this is a five all service game, in which case, what a dynamic shift. That's a hold for Kotzen. Keep our eye on this one. Moving forward. Again, unclear exactly what the score line is here. Let's go to 18. If we can, West off Tran versus Subash. Just see if. Natasha's coming out of that injury timeout. See where her form is at. Again, that's court 18.
That looks like a match that's completed. That looks like a victory for Riley Trent. So we'll lock that one in for the UNC Tar Heel. Let's see a chair. Umpire generally. That means the match has completed. Interesting to note. In the meantime, Andre Illigan closes out a 6-4, 6-1 victory for Hawaii over Columbus State's Alvaro Relegado. With that in mind, let's go to let's go to six. Andrew Zhang, Mate Votzel. Zhang dropping the first set. Six two. Two Votzel. Votzel now a couple of breakpoint chances here. I think this is nine. There we go. Beautiful. Looks like the break went to Votzel. So he now leads by a set and a break. 6 2 4 3. Oh, nope. Just kidding. The old, I'll go get it. Don't worry about it trick. We do apologize for the screen again. It's Windy Day in San Diego. Man versus machine. Man seems to have a slight lead. Very nice point there from Zhang. Open up the court for himself with his forehand. Sneaks that approach behind Monte Votzel. Deuce point coming up here now. Drew Zhang scrapes out a hold here on court six. Three all now. Or four three, excuse me. He leads in the second set on Monte Vote. So meanwhile, it was a turnaround for Alex Kotzen. Let's go back to nine. Trills was down, I believe, five three. Now leads six five here in his second set against Alex Abukan. Of Arkansas. Figlio, another one of the best names in college tennis, assistant coach for Columbia. They're on the sideline, coaching up his guy, Kotzen. And again, I want to hear from you tuning in right now. My comparison for Alex Kotzen, his recent Florida graduate, current guy ascending up the ITF rankings, Oliver Crawford. I think the games look similar, the physicality is similar, but if you disagree, let me know why in the YouTube comments. Let me know why if you're following on Twitter, at GreatShotPod. I want to hear from you. I want to know what you listeners, you fans are thinking right now as we watch this ITA National Fall Championship unfold. I don't know what I'm thinking. That's a nice serve. And now we head to the breaker here. Bukin of Arkansas, far side of your screen, took that first set 7-5 after Kotzen led for, by a break for much of the set. Kotzen overcame a deficit here in the second, at least ex according to our scoreboard now. Forces, uh, but Bukin forces the second set breaker. It's Kotzen serving near side of your screen to kick things off. 
or serve a little bit wide. Sails on him a little bit as well. Good choice, bad execution. That was the ball to come in on. That was the spot to hit. Just a little too aggressive. And you see Coach Howie Endelman, I believe, on the sideline there as well. You guys don't know this, but in their off time, when they're not coaching Columbia, Howie and Rich star in an off-Broadway rendition of The Odd Couple. call there no doubt that ball long second serve coming it's good ball there from Alexa Reco Who love now early mini break lead consolidated. Come on. That's the interesting thing about this one. And in the points we've been tuned into, it's quite clear. The match has been on Kotzen's racket. Lucan's going to throw junk at you. That kick serve, that first serve, left a lot to be desired. Felt very attackable. And yet, you know, the slices he throws at you at the outer third, the forehand angles he can create, he makes you uncomfortable. Clearly, he's done that to Kotzen here today. Too tentative. Look at the court position. Kotzen playing at the track tennis logo on your screen. It's good for the brand. It's not where you can be during the point. You gotta be closer to that baseline. Looking at forehand after forehand to tee off on there just created too much space. Of course, clearly windy conditions playing a factor, but one three here. Some other things to keep an eye on right now happening around the grounds. Juan Carlos Aguilar, transfer from Texas A&M to TCU, takes a 7-5 first set over number 8 seed J.J. Tracy of Ohio State. Meanwhile, August Holmgren, 6-1-4-3 break of serve lead over Jeffrey von der Schulenberg of Virginia. Gotta keep an eye on those two. Head there after this one right now. Arkansas. Four two lead now in the second set breaker as he looks out to close a uh, looks to close out a straight set victory over Columbia's Alex Kotzen. 
Speaking of Alex's, Alex Gruskin here of Cracked Rackets. So excited to be with you all throughout the course of the day. Happy to be here with you throughout the course of the weekend as well. Our coverage continues tomorrow, noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. on the West Coast. As we take you through each and every day of this event, of course, going to try and recap every day's play on our mini break podcast feed. Find that on our website, crackrackets.com. You can find all of that content, immediate updates on our Twitter. At Crack Rackets, you want to message me or follow me directly? I'm at Great Shot Pod. Four two here for Alexa Buka of Arkansas. Again, watch for this kick serve though; it's been sitting up there. hit two jumping shots in the course of one rally you're feeling it jumping backhand leads to the jumping forehand leads to the 5-2 lead here for Buchan of Arkansas wouldn't be an upset technically Kotzen not seeded nor is the player out of Arkansas but again Kotzen could result at the ITA All-American this would feel a little upsetting overall now Two here for the razor back. Gets one of them back here, five three. Here comes now three match points upcoming. Ooh. Coach for Alabama doesn't like that ball hit. something something from the chair umpire there just a little appeal by the way right now 6153 3015 for august holmgren 1530 technically as it's the von der schulenberg service game going there next going there now bracket dropped Scream amped Alexa Bukin. 7 5 7 6 victory. Not the warmest of handshakes between he and Alex Kotzen. That is how you know, folks. College tennis is back. Quickly, West off. Let's go to court 17. Match points now for August Holmgren. 1540 in the Von der Schulenberg service game. So he's got three of them. A good start for the All-American finalist, number three seed. (laughs) 
misses the backhand volley just long. I do apologize for the look over my right shoulder. It's that time of day where the sunshine hits our blinds. I forgot to close them. My bad. We'll do so shortly. Watch this magic trick, folks. There it is. August Holmgren, your number three seed, the hometown native from the University of San Diego. 6 1, 6 3. He advances to the round of 16. In the meantime, let's go check back in on court number six. Can super producer Daniel Westoff. Mate Votzel serving. Took the first set 6 2 on serve 4 5 here. And ample break point chances in his three all service game. Votzel complaining about something in the background. Oh, Nucky. Giving him a little something, something as well. Meanwhile, on a different court, Juan Carlos Aguilar. 7 5 3 1 lead. Over JJ Tracy. Sam, Sarah Hamner about to take the court as well, your ITA All American Women's Singles Champion. Got a bunch of matchups filtering out here in our evening, our afternoon session. Just to the west time there when I called it evening, excuse me, 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. here on the East Coast. That's what it's all about, folks. Beautiful tennis from both players. An unfortunate let cord for Monte Votzel on the approach shot gives Andrew Zhang that much more time. Now, what a get from Votzel just to get his hands on that first pass. But the little bump lob from Andrew Zhang earning him the point. 30 all now. All of a sudden, a little bit of pressure. For Votzel, he tries to stay alive in set number two. And again, if it's a track meet, the longer this match goes, the more you like Dukes Andrew Zhang. Inflection point of the match, folks. 30 all. Don't look now, folks.
I lied. This is the inflection point of the match. Yeah, that's how you fight off break points. If your Mate Votsal fights off a set point as well, five all, you see Coach Kronagi running back to talk to his new Buckeye. Going to love that toughness out of him. Of course, Votsal was one of those prized players on the transfer portal this offseason. Andrew Zhang is heating up, folks. Finding more and more depth. More and more pace with that forehand wing. And again, if you're Votzel, so you want to get out of this match right now. Do not want to go third set with a guy like Zhang. 6-5 Zhang holds here on court number six. Where are we hopping to next? Can we go back to stadium court, see where we're at in Yepafanova, Cayetano, see if they're still out on court. Just give it a brief gander. Again, that's stadium court. In all likelihood, that means Aaron Cayetano ended up taking the match in straight sets. That's a nice win for the USC Trojan. Can we go back to court 12? Mora and Hool, see if Cam Mora is still alive. Also, just to offer an update for those of you, I know scores are frozen on some of these feeds. We do apologize for that. I know our friends at Tennis Ticker working as hard as possible to ensure everything is as beautiful as it can be moving forward. And of course, shout out to our friends at Track Tennis for their support as well. I think, again, that Mora is still on court indicates we're roughly, I'd say either 4-3-ish, 5-2-ish, depending if there's a big lead. Certainly this one heating up. Big serves from Huel. A couple of errors from Mora now. I'm gonna assume it's 30 love something. I think it's 30 love here.
So that's a hold for Hool. Again, body language doctor would suggest she's still in the lead here. She took a 6-1 first set from North Carolina's Cam Mora. In the meantime, let's go back to six if we can. You beat me to it. Votes holds four six all, so a breaker to decide this second set. Is that folly long? You can tell this is an empty the tank sort of tiebreaker for votes. Well, just the body language. Not that Zhang looks fresh right now, laboring there on the baseline. Early mini break, two love lead for Andrew Zhang here. ITA regional champ to extend his run of victories. Double mini break for Zhang, three love. Zhang doesn't love the call. Tough to tell. Far side of the camera. those points right back and those were two dare I say tired errors just kind of forced 
Big plus one shots. That's not what's allowed Zhang to have success here in the second set. It's been the long laboring points. Of course, those get harder to replicate as the match goes on. Tricky, 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 tricky. Again, turning defense into offense. That's where Andrew Zhang's got the edge on Mate Votzel. How much more is he willing to suffer physically? How much more is he able to suffer physically? That's the question. That will determine this second set. 4-2 Zhang with the mini break lead at the turn. Meanwhile, again, some of the players on court elsewhere. ITL American champ Sarah Hamner taking on Elza Tamase. JJ Tracy got the break back, so now 4-all in his match against Aguilar. Mora, who lay 5-all. In their second set, so we do have a scoreboard update there. Feels like we just got scoreboard updates across the board. So we'll hop around after this set. In the meantime, again, 2-4 here. Votzel serving. Another big ace down the T4-3-4. there from Zhang and I think that's the first rally over 10 shots we've seen Mate votes a win in quite a bit of time and again that's a forced error we're all here now That's a tough miss. So five all now here in the breaker. Again, it's been a set such thin margins.
set point, match point, all of the sudden has a ride for Monte Volta would feel like a steal if he can get out of this match in straights. Not done yet, folks. Let's change ends one more time. Six all. As that ball sent wide from Monte Votzel. Votzel not even going towards that bench side, trying to book it back to the other side of the net. Meanwhile, you look at some of the notable developments around the grounds. Two big ones. A, Alexa Noel of Iowa, sixth seed, I believe, here this week, semifinalist at the All Americans. She's up 6 2 3, love, on talented Princeton Tiger Vicky, who the Cam Mora comeback is on. 1 6, 7 6, 3 2 break of serve. She now leads Florida State's Petra Hool. Of course, we will pop over to that match as soon as we are done with this one. That one's on 12 for any of you who are following individually on the side. In the meantime, 6 all here in the second set breaker. Zhang of Duke serving on the near side of your screen. That 7-6. Seven, Set point now for Zhang. First for him here. Oh, I suppose he had a deuce point. So not his first. The first for him here in the breaker. Yeah, that's how you erase a set point. Big into the body. Easy choice there with margin. Andrew Zhang tracks down plus one shot, forces that extra effort from Votzel, and Votzel forces it wide. So now first set point on serve for either player in this bit breaker goes to Andrew Zhang. Let's see if the Duke Blue Devil can bring out the goods. Forces the forehand wide. Andrew Zhang forces a third set here on court six, seven, six, nine, seven. He takes the second set over Ohio State's Monte Votes. So with that in mind, let's go to 12. It's a match we've been keeping our eye on. We now have an updated score line. You say tar, I say heel, tar, heel, tar, heel on the comeback trail here. Cam Mora is down a set and a break early on. So the scoreboard's a bit off here. Not sure who won the deuce point, but has worked her way back now to a third set here against FSU's Petra Hewell. And I mentioned this earlier. 
to any of you tuning in, A, thank you for doing so. Alex Gruskin of Crack Rackets. So excited to be on the call here. B, any court requests you guys have, matches you want to watch, if we can make it happen, we will make it happen. Any comments you guys have, questions for us, feel free to comment on our YouTube feed here. Tweet at me at Great Shot Pod. This is a confident looking Cam Mora, though, and it only takes one. One three set turnaround. By the way, it looks like she did hold 4 4 2. JJ Tracy flipped his match. He's now forced a third against Juan Carlos Aguilar. It's been that sort of fall, that sort of college career. For the rising sophomore Buckeye. To Ram Sammy's point, it's an excellent question for those of you on the feed. Both men and women, who finishes with better records this season? Duke or North Carolina? So we go to the changeover here, 3-4. Mora in command in the meantime. Let's see, where can we pop over to? Let's pop over court 16. I believe we have 16 in our repertoire. Haven't checked in on these two yet. Andrew Rogers of Pepperdine. Currently trailing Franco Cabal. Of Utah Cabalbo serving. Oh no, Rogers, excuse me. That's obviously Andrew Rogers serving 40 30 on the near side of your screen for the Pepperdine Waves. Recognize that hair anywhere. Rogers holds for two all. Rogers going to be a critical piece for the Pepperdine Waves, particularly if they'd like to compete to host. In NCAA regional, excuse me. And I know that's the goal for Coach Schachterly. Not just win the conference, not just be a top non-Power 5 school, but be able to compete with the best in the Power 5 as well. And obviously, we've seen Pepperdine win a national championship. We've seen Pepperdine make an NCAA semifinal since then as well. experience Rodgers has gained for the Tennessee Volunteers his first four years. He might be asked to step into that number two singles position right away. Of course, he's got that confidence, physicality, to compete with anyone on his best days, but would love if you're Coach Shackley to see him make a quarterfinals sort of run, even a round of 16, just get a good first round win here, come back from three sets against Capalvo of Utah. Stick around here through the end of this game. Then we're going to go back to 12. 
watch the ending of that third set between Mora and Hul. I will say, in terms of coaching assists, if we had a leaderboard, Coach Schachterly very much in the lead. That's a guy, and I know it's a nervous tick for him as well, and I say that lovingly. Shaq's my guy. But talk about a man who will immediately go track down that ball at the net for his player. Gotta love that. Player's coach. That's a player's coach. It's a culture guy. It's too good there. By the way, we have doubles on court. ITA All-American finalist, Sasna Skaya. Star of Seva of Old Dominion taking the court now. We have a court 13 request from Josh Burt, Chittick, and McLean. Head over there as soon as we see a score before we get to Mora and Hool. But that's why you love Andrew Rogers if you're Coach Shackley. Again, the veteran just keeps fighting, sticks to his plays, goes for that forehand, looks to move forward. He earns the break, makes things that much more interesting. Here on court 16, 3-2 in the second set. Let's quick pop by 13. Is Chittick still on court? When we last saw him, he had broken for 2-1 on serve. Someone won this match. Clearly looks like the warm-ups are being put on. Clearly looks like the sweats are on. I'm going to guess it was Chittick. Just given, again, the all-black nature of the player's clothes, and generally when you lose, you're first off the court. You try and get off pretty quickly. Chittick looks like he's taking his comfortable time, and it would make sense that the number one seed advances comfortably. But that's some inferencing, uh, that's some inference work, some guessing from me. If you guys know otherwise, at Great Shot Pot or throw it in the YouTube comments. Or Super Producer Westoff can show me. In the meantime, let's go back to 12. You can see it on the left side of your screen. Mora Huel. Third set, home stretch right now. It's Cam Mora. Looks like we missed her service game. So it's either four, th uh, five, three Mora or four all. Miss hit off the frame there from Mora. A frustration there. Again, that scoreboard, a game cycle behind. We saw Huel hold for 3 4. Let's 
see if she can hold here. I believe four, four, five. Indeed, it was Clement Chittick, by the way, the top seed for Washington, 6462 over Tad McLean. Andrew Zhang has raced out to a two love lead over Monte Votzel in the third set. And now, oh, we don't have 15. Oh, I appreciate that. For the record, Mike Hewitt, we apologize that we haven't been able to show any of the Mason Byler Taha body match body right now. Three all deuce point for him, the Wake Forest. Uh, now, what, third year? player against Oklahoma's Mason Byler. Unfortunately, no cameras on 14 or 15. Believe me, we'd love to show it for you, but that's three all deuce on court 14. In the meanwhile, here again, Zhang right now, quick two love lead. He's up on Mate vote. So I want to play a game of let's try to find JJ Tracy, but I just don't want to miss out on too much of the action. And it does feel like this is a critical Service game coming up here for Mora as we finish our singles portion of the day. Still have plenty of fun doubles action lined up as well. Of course, we still got a couple of singles battles to go. I think we still got a few on our hands. We'll try and do a rundown six through. After this match, we'll do a rundown top to bottom. Look at who's on stadium court. You know, we've got doubles going out on court 17 right now as well. But in the meantime, it's one of two things. Cam Moore is either serving for the match or serving to stay alive in the match. It is 5-4 someone right now in the third set. Believe it's 5-4 UNC's Mora. Far side of your screen, of course, forever recognizable. Given the two-handed forehand, two-handed backhand. Mora lost the first set 6-1. She could not find her rhythm. Who was moving her all around the court before? It was actually down 6-1, one love, a break of serve for getting that break back slowly, but surely finding her rhythm here. Yeah, that's Cam Nora, uh, Mora in a nutshell. Ridiculous on the rise, two-handed forehand, short angle winner. Maybe only four other people will try it. But maybe only three other in the nation could execute it, 15 all. Neither of these players giving an inch. This is what it's all about, folks. Boy, did we miss having a fall season in full last year. And, of course, understand that choice. A lot less known about COVID. But, boy, is it great to get these athletes back out on court competing against one another in this stage. No, thank you, Mike Hewitt, for tuning in. And that's why we were so excited to get this opportunity. Even if it's not perfect, just be able to connect with college tennis fans across the country. Celebrate this sport we love so. It's a tough error there. 
for Hool, middle of the court forehand. Yes, good depth from Mora, but that's one she's got to make here. Match point. on feel the tension through the stream and i promise this feature tomorrow we are going to have the slow clap sound effect it's a staple of college tennis events i need you all to imagine it in your head here pivotal point in mora Hewell. Yeah, let's keep playing. That's half the fun, right? We didn't show up not to play matches. Matt, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name correctly, but Andre Illigan, winner in his first round match, straight sets. That's correct. And Charlotte asks for court nine. We have been monitoring this match closely, but we give the people what we want here. Can we hop over to court number nine? Super producer Daniel Westoff. Let's see who's on court there. Ooh, a little doubles action. I love a court nine plug. Shout out to you, Charlotte. And I can understand why you'd want us to hop over here to court number nine as we have the ITA All-American finalist out of Old Dominion, Sasanaskaya. Start up Seva. Taking on the Lua of Lewis Petrowitz of MSU. I'm down to lock in on some doubles for a little bit. First doubles action of the day. And of course, from a broad picture, the match is on today's schedule. Round of 32 in singles, round of 32 in doubles. For each and every player, you're playing once. Oh, did I miss college doubles? We're back, folks. We are officially back, and it's the telltale sign of a team that has continuity, of a team that has moved well together, or played for a while together, and that's the movement you saw here from the Old Dominion duo. Just, again, both players shifting constantly, and one compensating for the other's aggression at the net. That's textbook doubles. That's why this team had as much success at the, as they did at the All-American. Following at home, Andrew Zhang, Mate votes will now two all in the third. So another dramatic twist in that court six battle. Of course, again, 
I want to remind all of you periodically, if you'd like to find a follow an individual match, excuse me, you can do that all with our friends at Track Tennis. Shout out to my main man, Igor. He knows what he did. Uh, but of course, he and the Track Tennis team helping to put on this event, allowing us to do this broadcast. Shout out to our friends at Tennis Ticker as well. To follow all the scores throughout the day, go to the Tennis Ticker app. Of course, you can find links to both Track Tennis and Tennis Ticker on the WeAreCollegeTennis.com website of the ITA. Headhunting. I mean, not headhunting. Let's be clear. That's just your classic poach. I just, I love the aggression. I'm all in on this Old Dominion team. I think this is not just a, oh, you know, the draw broke out perfectly. I don't know why I did that voice and, um, you know, things broke exactly right for them. I think this is a team you're going to see hovering rankings allowed top 10, top 20 for the majority of the season. You can just tell with the aggression. Yep, missed that one wide. Early break to the ITA All-American finalists. They look energized. They look ready to rock and roll. In the meantime, let's go back to 12. Mora, Boulay, home stretch. It's been about three hours on court for them. It must be at this point to absolutely battling. We didn't miss the... I was going to say, if we missed the ending, I was about to be crushed chair umpire was blended in with the pull, the light pull. This angle for the Cam Mora forehand is about as ideal as it gets. You get to see all of the funkiness, the, you know, again, the racket speed she's able to produce, the, ex you know, the extreme grip she utilizes. I don't think I'd wish that two-handed forehand on my worst enemy. It just feels like a lot of work. But Cam Mora makes it work for her. So, again, super impressive. What a freaking plus one combo. Kick serve, out wide, inside in, two-handed forehand, down the line, that margin. Come on now. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous from Camora. 
By the way, and this is not meant to diminish the performance of Petra Huel, who has just continued to put pressure on Mora, forced her into the outer thirds, forced us, her to come up with the ridiculous shots like that. There it is. In the end, it's Petra Huel. 6 1, 6 7. We're going to say that's a 7 5 decision for the Florida State Seminole. What drama here on court 12. That's as fun as it gets, folks. Now we have a, a we have a score update. So for the first time, let's go to eight west off. If we can, I have never seen ITA All-American South Carolina freshman Sarah Hamner play. I would like to do so, if that's all right, as she takes on Elsa Tomas of Tennessee. Hamner serving near side of your screen. Took the first set 6-1. Currently trails 2-4, love 30 here in set number two. Don't worry, Charlotte. I'm still thinking about you. We'll get back to the doubles. Oh my God. I want to give all of our fans the opportunity to see the ITA All-American champ. Comes through qualifying. Doesn't drop a set on her way to the title. Of course, we were in South Carolina for the ITA All-American women's event, but you put up a performance like that, we take notice of it here as college tennis fans. So fascinating to see Hamner compete against Tamias and again, a Tennessee program, I think on the rise on the women's side. I'm expecting a big year from the Lady Volunteers. Going the distance here on eight, maybe so as Tomas. I'm going to have to figure out how to pronounce it correctly. I will at some point. Five to lead for her here on court number eight. We're going to keep our eye on this one. We're also, by the way, keeping our eye on court 16. Or Andrew Rogers takes the second set, 6-3, over Utah's Franco Cabalbo. Now, again, we're going to stay here on 8 West off because I want to see the ending of this set. We already see half the changeover complete. Looking elsewhere right now, good news for Tennessee across the board. Rebecca Mertena, 5-4, serving for the match in the third set against Iowa State's Thassapon Naklo. Meanwhile, it's 4-3. On serve in the third between Andrew Zhang, Mate Botzel, Zhang serving right now with that deficit. Tracy Aguilar, Ohio State, TCU in a third set right now. That's an NCAA round of 16 team wise matchup. Of course, Aguilar at the time was playing for the AM Aggies. Still 5 2 here. Tennessee serving near side of your screen. Smash to a third. Backhand sails long on Hamner right away, though. I like that firepower on that wing. I'll tell you that right now. Thank <laughs> you. 
I think a long time Crack Rackets fans will know I'm not afraid to fire off the hot take, the instant reaction. I want to take my time before offering you all an assessment on Hamner. I like the explosion off the ground strokes right away. Some of that pressure being felt by Tomas on serve. So three break point chances for Hamner. Get that narrow that deficit to 3 5. She does just that. A couple of massive returns. Of sitting ducks there for serves, if we're being quite frank. Just can't do that against the ITA All American champ. So 3-5 now, still trails in the second set. And again, to any of you watching court requests, feel free to fire them in the YouTube chat. Super producer Daniel Westhoff will send them over to me. We'll get those over to those courts as soon as we can. Any comments, questions, things you'd like us to discuss, feel free. Mason Byler. No H in that spelling, by the way, Mike, just so you know. Does Byler earn the victory in the end? I believe he did. Is there an H in Mason Byler? Now I gotta look it up. Right back, love 30 here in the Hamner service game. Again, just want to see if we're splitting sets before we hop on over elsewhere. Well, that's nice. Fifteen thirty. Gave her a second chance. Did to Mace. Good wheels from Hamner to track that drop volley down. Did get a court request. Let's see Straker Meads. Mosa doubles. That match is supposed to go on at 5 p.m. Don't believe that match is on court yet. If it is, we will be sure to pop over Kayla. Stick with us. We'll keep our eye out for it. Sarah Hamner working her way back, though. now though for him is just again ask the question of Tamise can you serve this out pressure match number three seed I 
play number four seed Lee Cesar knocked out earlier today. Georgia freshman beating her in straight sets. Now, quadruple threat. I had to count it out on my fingers here as we have a deuce point, a game point, a break point, and a set point. ITA All-American champ, Sarah Hamner, races a love 30 deficit. She was down 5-2, now she's down 5-4. But still, it's going to be Elza Tamase of Tennessee serving to send this match to a third set. Wanted to see quickly a little bit of an update. Matches off the scoreboard. Let's see. Did Mate Vozo ultimately earn the win over Andrew Zhang of Duke? Looking across the board here. Let's see. By the way, some of the other winners. Number one seed, Abby Forbes. 0-0 victory for her today to begin her campaign. Top seed for the men, Clement Chittick. 6-4-6-2 victory for his campaign. Alexa Noel, 2-2 two two victory over Vicky Hu. Mason Byler, 6-4 victory in the third over Taha Badi. And then Mate Votzel, 6-3 in the third. He ends up taking it over Andrew Zhang of Duke. That is a heck of a match there. See a bunch of players going on court now for warm-ups. Can we go to court 11? Super producer Daniel Westoff. Had a request there. That's the Mertena Naklo match. And that's a match I can understand why, because Mertena, who was serving for the match up 5 4 on, Ohio, uh, on Iowa State's Naklo, excuse me, now down 5 6. Up 30 15 in the third, but down 5 6. Again, this is on court 11 here. I think we can agree. Although. Mertena's got to be in the orange here, right? That's got to be Tennessee orange. Iowa State, it's more of a red and a yellow. So, but they also mix in the black, so I'm going to assume that is Naklo on the far side. Oh, we've reached that stage of the match. Forty fifteen here. Former Tenna. Good call, by the way. MP underscore UT. It's a heck of a first name your mom gave you. Always bold to include an underscore. But Mertenna holds. Hits that ball back over with some spice. Is that a code violation? If it goes on to the other court, was that just an accident? I, that wasn't a male intent. You know, again, there was no... There's no intention in hitting that ball to the other court. It just wasn't cleanly struck on her hit back over. But six all money ball, third set breaker. As my friend Jonathan Kelly used to call it. We've got a buster on our hands. Let's see if we can pull this out. Confidence on the side of Mertena. 
early mini break lead goes to the volunteer one love meanwhile super producer daniel westoff i will ask you to keep your eye on court number eight and be ready for a sudden changeover if she gets to set point elza to serving up five four i want to pop over to there so we don't miss out on it currently up 30 15 but again time to flex our red zone muscles here we appreciate all of you for joining us all right let's do it west off let's go to eight 40 15 here set point for a fellow tennessee volunteer it's the tennessee swing i like that three more set points else to to force a third set against ita all-american champion sarah hamner of south carolina Ball travels wide. We're going three on court eight. Sarah Hamner, your number three seed, pushed to a third by Elza Tomes. If we can, Westoff, let's go right back to 11. Two love, I believe. Firmer Tenna. Low. Third year at Iowa State technically makes her a sophomore. Went 18 11 in singles action as a freshman, 12 and 7 in singles action last year, of course. It was history for the Iowa State program at the ITA Central Region this year. Snack Low became the first Cyclone in program history to win the ITA event regional. That's the sort of success we should celebrate most here. An underhand serve to you have my heart. But shout out to this Iowa State program. Again, first regional champion. They swept singles and doubles at the event. Ten. I'm flattered to that. I say you have no idea. But for love here. For Mertena. Of course, for those of you who don't know about her. Mertena. Rising senior. At Tennessee. has one more year of eligibility after this one though given the COVID extension a shot there from Naklo puts herself on the board 1-4 you look for Rebecca Mertena qualified for the ITA All-American Championships made singles draw in South Carolina On fire right now. First changeover win for Bertena. 5 1. She leads as we make the turn. Again, we're reaching the doubles hour here on our broadcast stream. Gonna have to make a quick segue when we do that. So we're gonna be off air for about, let's say, 10, 15 minutes max. So we switch out some things on our end stick through the end of these singles matches still on court. So, of course, Hamner, Tomes, 
Kari Miller of Michigan on court 14. Looks like she's going to extend her match to the third. Unfortunately, no camera for us there. Still some things we're keeping an eye on. Doubles starting as well elsewhere. Don't worry. We're here first ball to last throughout the day. We'll be back. Two five now. Or Naklo serving near side of your screen. Given the reaction, I think that ball was long. So I think we've got match points here. Slow clap in the head. 6-2. Oh, Rebecca Martena. There it is. Got a little dramatic down the home stretch for Kentucky, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, fourth year, excuse me. Got a little troubling down the home stretch for me as well, but for Tennessee, fourth year, Rebecca Martena. Nevertheless, she earns the three set victory to advance to the ITA National Fall Championship round of 16. With that in mind, let's see, where are we close? Let's, let's go back to eight if we can. Right now, again, Hamner, Tomei's third set ongoing. Hamner, the freshman, holds for one love here to kick off the third. The ITL American champ came through qualifying, didn't drop a set. I don't believe other than, I want to say, or maybe it was one set. Let's see, drops one set on her way to the title. No, for Sarah Hamner. Yeah, one set. It was in that final match to Alexa Noel of Iowa. Noel forced to retire in that final, ultimately. But yeah, again, you look at the, the competition we've had across the board. Fun matchups everywhere. You see here, port number nine right now. It's underway. Not exactly sure who we've got going on here. We're back on eight. Hamner, Tomace, love one. If we can actually, because we're early on here, can we just hop across the board while stuff? Can we get three, you know, give me 12 seconds on all of the courts. Let's go from center all the way down. Just see, again, show off all of that action we've got competing here. Let's see if we can identify who's playing where. Ball there from Sarah Hamner, but let's let's quickly pop over to center if we can. Look here on center court now. Normally, if they were sleeveless and headband, that'd be the Mississippi duo. But I believe this is some Michigan doubles here. Let's see. I'll be able to tell from the forehand and backhand. Yeah. This is Aaron Schneider and Fenty, folks. So on our center court, already up a break to love, University of Michigan duo Andrew Fenty, you know, Aaron Schneider, winners of their ITA regional up to love on the Charlotte duo, Rodriguez and Gatti. Forty love here now. Uh, excuse me, forty thirty here now. Thirty all. Let's try that last time for the Charlotte duo. So they look to get on the board. Pe 
after dying to Andrew Rogers, close down to 6 1 in the third set victory. So I believe we've only got a few singles matches left on the board, folks. Charlotte holds 4-1-2 here on Stadium Court. Let's go to six. See again. Can't identify who's replaced Zhang in Votsal on court number six. We've got doubles action happening just about everywhere now on the grounds. Thank God these players play in uniform. No match on court six currently. Let's go to seven. Nothing on seven either. Good. We're just starting to get the doubles push, that means. Let's go to eight. We know on eight, this is the matchup we're watching most closely. Elza Tomas will stick around here. 40-30. She's got two game points here to make it one all in her third set against ITA All-American champ freshman out of South Carolina, Sarah Hamner. And she holds 4-1 all. Again, we're just rapid firing around. Want to show you all what's going on. Let's go to nine. It's the ITA All-American doubles finalists. Sasnaskaya. Sara Dubseva of Old Dominion taking on Lewis Piotrowicz uh, of MSU. Yeah. Still, that's what doubles is supposed to look like, folks. I'm going to keep my eye on nine. We may have to pop back here more frequently than we already are. Let's go to 10. We have any action on 10? We do indeed. Let's see if we can place this duo. On court number 10 right now. Hmm. Not Quite sure who's on 10. I do apologize for that. I don't think that's Zap. Doesn't quite look like a TCU uniform. Give it one more point. See if I can't figure anything out. Looked my closest, folks. Sadly, court 10 currently unidentified. Any assistance you all can provide in the comments would be greatly appreciated if we can. Let's go to 11. We have any action on 11? Nothing on 11. How about 12? Twelve clears all as well. Looks beautiful, no doubt about that. Let's go thirteen. This is so court thirteen. This is the UNC duo. Come on, you'd recognize those colors anywhere. Logan Zapp serving on the near side of your screen. He's partnered with Kenya. They're taking on the TCU duo, Vivis Marcos and Max did. Obviously, a lot of history. Between Coach Phillips, Coach Rodides, Coach Bowen, TCU, and UNC. Of course, UNC has prided itself on its doubles performance. Essentially throughout the trips, Phillips era. For that as well, guys like Nick Monroe, Tripp. Obviously of late, with Blumberg, who's already earned three titles at the professional level in doubles. A guy who may sneak on our broadcast later on this week. But fun fact, I heard a stat. 70% of doubles points are ended in the first two shots. That return of serve so critical 
just want to give yourself a chance to compete more than anything else. Allow your opponent to make that plus one error. Playing for keeps. Welcome back to the doubles court, folks. Going big. See the energy right now. Tar Heels on their toes. These players, new contributors for the Heels this year. Of course, Zap was on the roster last year. Limited action for him. He's one of the top recruits in his recruiting class. The Heels will be needing a big jump from him, particularly if they don't get Rinki Hijikanta back later this spring. Deuce point coming up, it looks like. By the way, quick per correction and shout out to you, Max Potter. SID for Tennessee on the text. Elza Tomase. Elza Tomase. Not going to get that wrong the rest of the way, folks. On court eight, Tomase. One, two, she's serving in the third set. Also learned that her and Martena from the same hometown. In Latvia, known pipeline for tennis talent. If we can, let's go back to court number eight right now. Again, last singles match we see on the board here. Or actually, I suppose... Eh, let's stick around here. Again, see what's going on before we get back to our expedition down to courts 14, 15, 16... Uh, excuse me, 16, 17, 18. No 14, no 15 stream available. serving two all here in the third. All right, let's continue. Let's go to 16 if we can. Any action on 16? Nothing 16, 17, and 18 I think are going to be empty as well. 17. Looks like, no, 17 not empty. We do have players on court. See if I can correctly identify this duo. I believe this is the matchup. Zane and Briggs of Florida serving on the near side of your screen. Indeed, 6-love, 3-2. They lead the Cal duo of El Sola and Richardson. Let's see here if they can't consolidate the break one more time. Get a little doubles action in. See to their right, no action on 18 right now. So after this, we're going to lock in on that third set. 
Hammer. Mase. And they continue to rock and roll here on court 17 six love four two lead for the gators let's lock in hamner tomase hamner with the break of serve now leads 3-1 40 15 that's court eight west off our singles battle de jour here again game points for her to consolidate that break take a 4-1 lead Pace is so easy for Samner, Sarah Hamner, and I like that. A little feistiness, a little anger that she even finds herself in this position. 4-1 lead for her in the third set, but again, Tomase has fought all match long. Let's see if she's got another push in her. In the meantime, let's go to center. Forty thirty now for the Michigan duo Fenty. Aaron Schneider, 4-1 here in the first set. Of course, Andrew Fenty, past two years, has partnered with Matthias Seymour. Now, fifth-year graduate transfer at Florida. They were the top 10 doubles duo. Semi-finals, I believe, the 2020 Ann Arbor Challenger together. But it's a new lefty for Andrew Fenty in second year. Nino Aaron Schneider. Aaron Schneider, limited action in his first season as he tried to find his bearings in Ann Arbor. But look, with the departure of Seymour, they're going to need someone to step up, fill that number one doubles position. And certainly, if you can keep the duel of Fenty and Styler apart, you feel like you have one of, if not the most talented doubles guy now on two courts. Your Michigan head coach, Aaron, uh, Adam Steinberg. to Tomase and Hamner catch the ending of that match the rest of the way as soon as we are done with this changeover. That's nice. That's pretty, folks. Beautiful doubles point put away from Andrew Fenty. Great hands at the net from Aaron Schneider. We're back on court eight, where it's 30-15, Tomase of Tennessee, near side of your screen. there from Hamner though you can feel the finish line you see her pressing here 40-15 couple of game points for Tomase keep that deficit at just one break of serve
by the way, not on one of our show courts, but court 14 right now, Tiffany Fiquet of Mississippi, three love lead in the third on Michigan's Kari Miller, double break lead for her. Meanwhile, Tomase, which I can't believe I got wrong as a pronunciation. I should have seen that phonetically. Holds 4-2-4 here. Again, following the completion of this match, take about a 10 to 15 minute break. We still have some streams available here on our Crack Rackets YouTube broadcast of the 2021 ITA National Fall Championships. And you're going to want to stick around with us as we still have doubles matches in play. I believe the last scheduled match is for 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 5.30 Pacific. It'll be a doubles battle. What else are you doing on a Thursday night? Stick with us here as we get to explore 32 of the best men's and women's college tennis players in the nation. bit right there from Tomase. here 40 love one of four for Sarah Hamner is that in oh I'll tell you what of all the firepower I've seen that T serve that's the scariest part of the Sarah Hamner game I've witnessed thus far extends her lead to 5-2 pressure is on Elza Tomase of Tennessee we'll get back to that match as soon as that changeover is over meanwhile back to court number nine ITA All-American finalist, Sasnaskaya Stradubseva of Old Dominion, far side of your screen, taking on Lewis Pietrowicz of MSU. Of course, I do want to also take this moment to remind all of you, and perhaps some of you see it on the screen, but if you are in the San Diego area and you've played college tennis, ITA College Tennis Alumni Get Together. This Sunday, 9 a.m., Barnes Tennis Center. Is that a little bit early for an alum on a Sunday? No doubt about that. I make it a policy to not leave my bed before 10 a.m. on those days. That said, my only exception to that rule is for high-quality tennis. And look, the opportunity to compete with and not even compete with, connect with is the word I was looking for. Countless of your fellow college tennis alum sets the opportunity we're all looking for to build our hidden communities, find people who love the sport the way we do, and you have the opportunity to do just that. 9 a.m. Sunday, Barn Center for any former college tennis players in the San Diego. They're going to hit some balls. They're going to have some breakfast before the finals as well. And look, I promise you, it's a time-honored tradition, right? You're playing a tennis match Sunday morning. Coach is providing bagels. I imagine there'll be a nice spread available for all of you. Again, hit some balls, have some breakfast before the finals. Sunday, 9 a.m., Barnes Tennis Center, ITA College Tennis Alumni Event. With that said, all due respect to this fantastic Old Dominion doubles duo. Yes, thank you, Super Producer Westoff. We're back on Hamner versus Tomase. I'm 
Mase serving now 15 love, but trails 2 5. Quick question from Sarah Hamner, just making sure. Ball was long and wide. Call confirmed from the chair. Meanwhile, Alsala Richardson, 4 2 has become 4 all in their second set of doubles. Cal against Florida. First two set for Aaron Schneider and Fenty, 6 2. Doubles going on on other courts right Why now. As well. Plenty of exciting action. Try and figure out who's where during our break so we can come back with a game plan for all of you. Here right now, Tomase. A couple of game point chances. Extend this match. Meanwhile, Sarah Hamner looking to get off the court. Escape with a victory here today. Hamner in the end. Big emotion from the freshman. 6 1, 4 6, 6 2. She advances over Elza Tomase. I believe that's the majority, at least completing all of our singles matches. Now, Tracy Aguilar may still be out there. Miller Fakay definitely out there. Tiffany Fakay, 4 1 lead in the third set for Mississippi over. Michigan's Kari Miller in the meantime. Again, scoreboard lagging a bit behind here. On court number nine, but we know that All-American duo Cessnaskaya start with Seva leading, I believe, Lewis and Petrovich here on court nine. Alsola Richardson have flipped th things on Briggs and Zane of Florida. It's a 5-4 lead for them on court 17. Vivos Marcos, Maxted overcoming an early break deficit. Back on serve 5 4 there. I believe that's court 13. And then again, tons of fun matchups across the board. I appreciate that, Allison. I thought it was an enjoyable match as well. Certainly a tough one, depending on the side you're on. I would say, again, I appreciate that you enjoy listening to our coverage here as well. And that's what we want to do is just provide a little excitement, a little juice, a little flair for all of you college tennis fans following along at home. Now, again, we're going to figure out some court assignments, make sure we've got a game plan for this home stretch of day number one. But rest assured, too much exciting action for us to go away. So we hope you stick with us. But for now, for super producer Daniel Westoff, the team at Track Tennis, the team at Tennis Ticker, the entire ITA tennis team as well, I am your host, Alex Gruskin. You are watching our Crack Rackets coverage of the 2021 ITA National Fall Championships. Let's start with the women's singles competition. You look up and down the board here again, a couple, I would say there are fewer absences in this field, certainly, than there are on the men's side. Yes, there's no Emma Navarro, your defending NCAA champion, but I do love 
We get the return of so many of the Stanford stars. We get to see the Yepafanova debut. We get to see Connie Ma on the yep. court as well. And, you know, again, Cam Mora, UNC, she's playing this event. We get a Kylie Collins appearance. We f- It does feel like this women's field. Yes, we're missing Navarro, and we still don't know if Navarro is going back or not. But I, I like the composition of this field. Let's start there. Your thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, the quantitatively, right there, it's a, it's a higher ranked field, um, less, you know, absences. And it just feels that way too. And I would also say that from the first round matches match stand up uh, standpoint, we can get to this on the men, but there are a lot of juicy matches on the women's side in the first round. Um, more so I would say than, than the men. And I think it, you go up and down the straw. There's a lot of opportunity. Um, so can to you remind in, me quickly, who else is missing other than Navarro? Okay, this is off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> but uh, Kessler is still missing. You're right. Stearns yep. is still missing. Um, those two stand out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's it, right? Like, that, those are the big three. Navarro, Stearns, and Kessler. That's the one that I was forgetting. Other than yep. that, it does feel like, I mean, we have Forbes. No Alicia Bolton, I guess. That's a little – she, I think, yep. is one of the 32 best singles player in the field. But I guess UCLA got their one, and so you could understand that. Yep. She's missing. I mean, I, I – that's really like we have a, a solid, you know, a star studded field here. And again, we get to see the Stanford players and you're right with that in mind, let's get into these first round matchups because you're right of the four draws. This is clearly the juiciest. I only have two must see on the men's side. I'm going to let you go first because I don't want to play spoiler here. I don't want to ruin your <laughs> list. Give me your first round matchups. You must watch. So I'm going to go cheat and go USC versus Stanford. Right. Yeah, just have, period. Yeah. yeah, period. I sent that tweet up earlier today. I mean, Aaron Cayetano, who has been on fire both through the summer and the fall versus freshman um, Yepa Finova at Stanford. Uh, you know, we had we hadn't seen Stanford play until this until this regional, both her and freshman Connie Ma. Um, and they made make the finals. Right. Mm-hmm. And Connie Ma beats Yepa Finova in the final. Really good tournament from ma obviously i mean she lost on average like three and a half games over like seven matches she was totally dominant and yep if Inova had struggled in some of the like early fall non-college events um particularly in, in, a, in a in a money event they played in san francisco so to see her come through was really promising and we also haven't seen much of snow han at usc so this is three players that we really haven't seen much of cayetano has really come on strong those are, are two matches that we could see a few times this year, actually. Um, so those are absolutely one to circle. Mm-hmm. Just worth reminding everyone, Cayetano, semifinalist at the ITA All-Americans, Selma Ewing of USC, quarterfinalist at the ITA All-Americans. The one I think he left off the, the list for USC, and obviously she's not playing a Stanford foe, but she's taking on t- Kylie Collins of Texas. Ewing Collins is yep. my first round m- matchup. I will be watching most closely. I can promise you at least 30 minutes on our red zone stream. But, you know, to your point, it is fascinating because now that Stanford's lost a Pac-12 title, it just feels like things are open. And USC making the round of 16 last year was one of the feel-good stories of the NCAA tournament. And UCLA, had there been a 2020 uh, NCAA tournament, would have made the finals. They would have played UNC for the national championship because those two teams were on a collision course. And I feel this is such a random aside. But do we give Graham, Davitella, McKenna Jones, should we just award them the 2020 NCAA title? Because I was at that national indoors. And I'm just telling you, they weren't losing to anyone. Like North Carolina was winning the NCAA title in 2020. They were so much better in the field, hands down that year than everyone else. Like Pepperdine and Texas made up the gap so much in 2021, even though UNC didn't lose anyone. And it's just like, anyways, that's, a, that's an aside. I'd award it to them. But didn't you feel that way in the early days of the 2021 season as well? No, because I was at the National Indoors. And like the worst thing that could have happened for UNC is to beat Texas in that fashion. It would have actually just been better to lose that match because at least if you lose it, you no longer feel invincible to be, uh, you know, down 3-1, to have the comeback that they had and to have – uh, obviously at number four singles, Elizabeth Scotty do what she did against Charlotte Shavata upon come back from a set and break deficits, uh, deficit. Uh, but 2020, like at that national indoors, I can't emphasize enough. It was so, and you could tell NC state was very good and they were like that next tier team, but it was UNC UCLA huge drop 
everyone else. And it is interesting to note, again, you get Cam Mora back here. And Mora is always someone who's had success in these individual fall events. She's got an interesting matchup. One of the few rostered players on Florida State, Petra Huell. Uh, she's going to play first round. That's always an interesting interconference matchup. I'm excited for Alexa Noel against Vicky Hu of Absolutely. Princeton. I think that should be an exciting one. And obviously for Ayana Ackley of South Carolina to draw Irana Contos, uh, Arena Contos, CMAers. That sucks for both players. That's just an unfortunate draw. It's great for us fans. Like that is certainly one to keep an eye on. But again, if those are the first round matches you're watching most closely, who are the seeds you have on upset alert? We've got eight of them. You look at the section. I consider an upset, obviously, prior to the quarterfinal round. Who you think of these top eight seeds, the least likely to make the quarterfinals? Mm, okay. So I had a different definition of upset alert, but uh Give me your it's, definition. I, I'm curious. We're still feeling I, each other out here. This is good. This is part of the I, learning process. I, I was going first round. Who okay. was on upset a lot for that first round? And honestly, thinking too any, small, big potatoes here. Come on. But here, but here's the reason why. I think it's anyone but Hamner and Forbes. I think every other seed in this in this draw is, you know, has a tough first round match that they could lose. I think you're being generous that you threw Hamner in that group. Because again, if you go by my definition, yes, she should beat Elsa to my, uh, to my, to my, I apologize mm-hmm. if I'm butchering that, but by my definition, she plays the winner of Collins and Ewing. That is yep. no cakewalk. That is a yep. brutal round of 16 matchup in yep. terms of first round upset alerts. Where are you? So there are two things you're going to hear in our college contender series. Jay and I debate fiercely. One of them will be Stanford down the road. And I agree with you. Khan Ima, Yepa Fanova have their opponents on upset alert. And, you know, I am very high on Stanford this season, as we discussed when we were coming up with our preseason top tens. I think ceiling wise, they are maybe the one team that can match Pepperdine down the home stretch of the season. I know that other and Texas, I should say. And I know that's a bull take and third team that we're going to remain nameless because I think that's our big (laughs) surprise of you. You like that? You like that? You leave one little sneak peek in there, one little tease, but um, yeah, I I just, you know, Georgia is, is the other team you and I disagree about. I still need to get, you know, I I need to do more research into Georgia. I am not as high on them this season. You think Lisa Zarr is an upset alert because obviously Zarr lost what once, last season and she's been so good here uh in the fall as well was you know played an exceptional regional to earn i believe the title there four seed feels strong for someone who might not even play top four in her lineup at the same time (laughs) right like you could say that about cam mora last year or however many years ago was it mora who made the final and not graham at last year's ita national that actually might have been it anyway because she got that top 10 ranking and i it must have been off of some false success. Anyways, not to pull, throw us aside, is Zara an upset alert? Like, is she? So I'm I'm excited that you're broadcasting this event because I'm excited for you. I'm excited for me to watch Mel Riasco of Georgia play. Okay. Um, she is just flying back from making the semifinals of a 25K in somewhere in South America. Um, and she hasn't really lost a ton of matches and she has had some pro success. And to me, in the same way that like Connie Ma, Yepa Fino- well, Connie Ma and Yepa Finova were biased because we know them from the, their U.S. junior days. Um, so we know kind of their their success. But Riasco, to me, is a huge question mark. Um, and so, yeah, I, I have Zara on, on upset alert because I don't know what the ceiling is of Riasco, um, but I'm excited to find out. And I think there are a lot of matches in here, almost more on the men's side, that to me are going to tell us a lot about the strength of the team. Uh, and this Riasco debut, if you will, on kind of the national stage in college tennis, I think is going to be one of those um, benchmarks for how good this Georgia team can be. What do you know about two seed Daria Freeman of Princeton? She was not, you know, one of the players who made, I believe, quarterfinals or better at the ITA All Americans. Obviously, she gets in here the hard way through the regional. What, what do you know about her? And again, it's a Princeton team. I was talking with the GOAT, Colette Lewis. She said, Alex, yeah, I shared our list with her. She said, Alex, do not sleep on Princeton. Yeah, uh, you had mentioned that when we were chatting, and I, I have to agree. Um, as I went back and I was looking, particularly when Freeman beat uh, Victoria Hugh in the final of the regional, I was like, let me, let me uh, uh, unpack this a little bit more. And if we can move on to Dark Horse candidates. Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. 
a dark horse. Candidate. Nothing better I, than a natural set. You, <laughs> can I just say you get this? <laughs> I've, I've listened to too many. Um, <laughs> And I learn from the best, you know. Yeah. Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah. What can I say? Chris it, is pretty good. It, it's hard. It's hard to have her as a dark horse because she's seated number two here. Um, but she's seated number two on the back of her being ten and two this fall. Um, I mean, so she has not played essentially a match, a competitive match since that spring season of 2020. Uh, she went and finished like Roland Garros uh, juniors in 2020, and then nothing until this fall so she's 10 and 2 um she has wins over subash mora jada daniel of nc state and obviously her teammate victoria hugh in the regionals um her two losses are to laney sleeth of oklahoma and to aaron cayetano of usc so she has skyrocketed up in terms of utr in terms of looking at who she's beaten and that's where she's kind of gotten this number two seed um so that's another one that is, is a dark horse for me and one that I'm very curious to see play because we haven't seen any of her uh, essentially in college tennis. We only got kind of the, the two or three months um, in the spring of 2020, which was her first year. And it's a fascinating section for her because she's got UVA Stravinsky in the first yep. round and we're still trying to figure out what Stravinsky looks like here in college tennis. You've got you know, in the section above her, Crawley, Ma, Han, that would be a brutal quarterfinal matchup, regardless, you know, not to disrespect Sophia Carrington, by the way, of LSU, but, you know, you assume Fiona Crawley gets through that first round. I, I really do agree with you. And we, I don't know if we were on mic, off mic. I think we were on here at this point. See, all the conversations blend together. <laughs> uh, but for Fiona Crawley, I think this is where she reminds everyone, no, 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 no. I was undefeated last year. You guys know I didn't lose, right? I, I don't lose college tennis matches. Um, I do think this is a big opportunity for her. And, you know, again, with that in mind, you do talk about some of the other, uh, you know, dark horse candidates, I suppose, to do success uh, in this tournament. I feel like Freeman is a dark horse, like quietly as the number two C. We just haven't talked much about her and the success she's had. But I think Riasco is a good pick as well. Yep. I, I don't think Crawley or Kanto Mares, even though they're unseated count, uh, because I just feel like that's kind of cheating. I don't think Kylie Collins counts either. No, nope. I do wonder because I Cam Nord did not have a good NCAA tournament last year. Let's be clear. And obviously she was a little bit banged up during that NCAA tournament run. And, you know, was dealing with a couple of injuries and we never talk about injuries during the course of matches because everyone's injured by the time you hit May, but she definitely was banged up. And you could tell as that tournament went on, it does feel like, again, for North Carolina to be elite this season, to compete with Texas, to compete with Pepperdine, she has to be the Cam Mora of last fall. She has to be the Cam, Nor Nor uh, Cam Mora of 2020. And I think it's ditto, by the way, for Elizabeth Scotty, who we see by the, uh, in the doubles draw as well playing in this event. And, you know, it is nice after so few Tar Heels in uh, the All-Americans to have Mora, to have uh, uh, Crawley, to have Riley Tran, who, by yep. the way, also undefeated last season. Like yep. you get two undefeated players moving up to replace those Graham and Davitella spots. No one can replace them, but you get what I'm saying. I think all the UNC players are dark horses. I would put them on the list. I would put Freeman on the list as well. Yep. The only number two seated dark horse in history. <laughs> And then obviously, you know, I'm on the Epifanova, Connie Ma bandwagon. Yep. If one of the Stanford players makes a semifinal, it should shock no one. Agreed. I've got one more dark horse, horse for you. Um, Abby Forbes, the quietest one seed in history. I'm so, Abby Forbes is also on the list of just loving and kind human beings. And I just like to mention this every time we talk about Abby Forbes, she's 1A on that list. She's never not smiled and be like, hey, Alex, how are you? And I don't deserve that sort of kindness. Uh, and she's just exceptionally kind. And we haven't talked about her as the top seed, which, you know, again, who could be due for a season where it's just kind of like, no, 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 I figured this out. Now it's time for me to dominate all of you. Abby Forbes checks off a lot of boxes in that category. Yeah, she absolutely does. And, you know, it's just because she's had a, full, a quiet fall season, right? Bowed out early in, um, in all Americans to Patch Kaleva. Um, you know, we just haven't seen a, a ton from her. So it's great to see her. She got, I I think she got the wild card in in here um so it'll be good to see kind of what what her form is at um and note to all the players listening you just gotta smile at Gruskin and you'll get a nice uh <laughs> nice uh section on the pod Without um, especially in the in the COVID era like 
goes without saying. We had a, I did an interview with a coach. Sorry to cut you off. I don't want to give a spoiler who that coach was, but that coach quoted a tweet of mine to me. And I was like, coach, coach, you know how to get into my suit spot. You know how to butter me up. Well done. Anyways, go on. My last dark horse um, is Cozy Reva. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, of, uh, of St. Mary's. So Good call. Um, have not seen much of her on the collegiate circuit um, really over the last few years. I mean, COVID really cut their season short. Obviously, St. Mary's isn't a team that we, we saw at NCAAs, um, but she's had some really strong ITF results in the fall. Uh, so she made the second round uh, at a 25K recently where she qualified. She beat Charlotte Shabbat the Pond. Um, and then she qualified and made the, the one her first round of the 60K in Berkeley, beating in top 100 player um, Sai Sai Zhang. So that was a really awesome win. Um, and then she lost to Emma Navarro there. So not much on the, the college scene, um, but really strong pro results. So I'm very curious to see how that translates to uh, to this tournament. And it's just good to see her competing against, um, you know, national national. Uh, competition. She's lost to Kani Ma twice in the last uh, last month. So I'll be really curious to see how she stacks up. Yeah. And again, when you look at this event, the history of it, uh, so often this does, you win this event, you just have momentum on your side entering the season. You think about some of the stories on the men's side, you know, Somdev wins this in 2007. Well, we know what he goes on to do in 2008. This was part of his streak as well. And then, you know, Stevie wins it in 09. 2010, 2011, newsflash, he doesn't lose. And, you know, the Frank titles, the even Chris Sokos wins this in 2018 and then elevates himself, is the guy in 2019 in college tennis. The way he willed that Wake Forest team, he, Botzer, Goyo, uh, to the final of the ITA National Indoors in 2019. I will never forget uh, that sort of moment. But I always love the St. Mary's drop. And by the way, on the women's side, we already made the case for Jokic uh, in the past for Davitella as well. Francesca Di Lorenzo won this event back-to-back. But by the way, St. Mary's, they know their way around the ITA Fall National. Damon Caceres, 2019 finalist, loses in 3 2 Yuya Ito uh, in that national championship. So I like that call. I, it's a good call. And it was an excuse for me to bring that fact up. So again, with not, all that not. in mind, predictions who's making the final, who you got winning the title? I have. Daria Freeman of Princeton beating Kylie Collins in the final. Ah, oh, that's that's perfectly spicy. Make the case quickly. Um, super. Imp- uh, this seems to be a player who is is training back full time. She's starting to get a lot of wins. Haven't seen much of her. I think she's going to continue to improve over the fall. Kylie Collins, I'm I'm high on. Although she does feel like a player where when you're high on her, maybe the results aren't there, and when you're not expecting it, the results are there. She's coming off a 25k, her first ever semifinal where she beat former doubles partner Lulu Sun. She also beat, um, who else did she beat in that run? Someone else really good. Um, yeah. Plenty of good players. Though. Plenty of and good I players. Agree. Semifinals a of a 25K is legit. Yep. Uh, Alicia Bolton. Yeah. There it is. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's my take. And look, I'm, I'm looking for some chaos. Three of the four All-American semifinals were qualifiers. I'm expecting some, some funky things to happen. Um, and that's my, that's my hot take. It was stupid, and this is Dark Horse number nine, and at this point I've named half the draw. Natasha Subash, who plays Riley Tran in the first round. How she's unseated, she's been so excellent in her first two seasons or season and a half of college tennis. That's another Dark Horse pick. I'm doubling down on the Crawley take. Give me Crawley to emerge out of the bottom half. I think she takes on Abby Forbes, who reminds all of us just how good she is. And a Crawley-Forbes matchup in the final would be perfectly appealing for us on the broadcast as well. I'm going to go Forbes with the title. And by the way, that's not because of the smile and the hello. I just <laughs> I do think Abby Forbes is that good. You see the serve, the physicality she can play with. I also just, the bitter taste in her mouth from that Cerebus Tormo. Uh, Cerebus Tormo. See, that's how pre, uh, Perez Somariba, there it is. That's, I'm back in college mode in the Perez Somariba match last yeah. year at NCAAs. And the loss to Pepperdine. Yeah, sour taste in the mouth. Yeah. I think that's why she's playing this event. And I do think she emerges with the title. Again, I'll take her over Crawley in the final. I do think it's going to be an exciting uh, and uh, ITA fall national championships, though. National fall championships. See, I did it right there in women's singles. Let's start with the women's singles competition. You look up and down the board here. Again, 
a couple, I would say there are fewer absences in this field, certainly, than there are on the men's side. Yes, there's no Emma Navarro, your defending NCAA champion, but I do love we get the return of so many of the Stanford stars. We get to see the Yepithanova debut. We get to see Connie Ma on the yep. court as well. And, you know, again, Cam Mora, UNC, she's playing this event. We get a Kylie Collins appearance. We f- It does feel like this women's field. Yes, we're missing Navarro, and we still don't know if Navarro is going back or not. But I, I like the composition of this field. Let's start there. Your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean the quantitatively, right? There, it's a it's a higher ranked field, um, less you know absences, and it just feels that way too. And I would also say that from a first round match match stand up uh, standpoint, we can get to this on the men, but there are a lot of juicy matches on the women's side in the first round, um, more so I would say than than the men. And I think it, you go up and down the straw. There's a lot of opportunity. Um, so can to you dive remind in, me quickly who else is missing other than Navarra? Okay, this is off the top of my head, um, <laughs> but uh, Kessler is still missing. You're right. Stearns yep. is still missing. Um, those two stand out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's Washington- it, right? Like that. Those are the big three: Navarro, Stearns, and Kessler. That's the one that I was forgetting. Other than yep. that, it does feel like I mean, we have Forbes. No, Alicia Bolton. I guess that's a little. She, I think, yep. is one of the 32 best singles player in the field. But I guess UCLA got their one, and so you could understand that. Yep. She's missing. I mean, I. I that's really like we have a, a solid, you know, a star studded field here. And again, we get to see the Stanford players and you're right with that in mind, let's get into these first round matchups because you're right of the four draws. This is clearly the juiciest. I only have two must see on the men's side. I'm going to let you go first because I don't want to play spoiler here. I don't want to ruin your <laughs> list. Give me your first round matchups. You must watch. So I'm going to go cheat and go USC versus Stanford. Right. Yeah, just period. Yeah, yeah, period. I sent that tweet up earlier today. I mean, Aaron Cayetano, who has been on fire both through the summer and the fall versus freshman um, Yepa Finova at Stanford. Uh, You know, we had we hadn't seen Stanford play until this until this regional, both her and freshman Connie Ma. um, And they made make the finals. Right. Mm -hmm. And Connie Ma beats Yepa Finova in the final. Really good tournament from ma obviously i mean she lost on average like three and a half games over like seven matches she was totally dominant and yep if Inova had struggled in some of the like early fall non-college events um particularly in, in, a, in a in a money event they played in san francisco so to see her come through was really promising and we also haven't seen much of snow han at usc so this is three players that we really haven't seen much of Cayetano has really come on strong those are, are two matches that we could see a few times this year, actually. Um, so those are absolutely one to circle. Mm-hmm. Just worth reminding everyone, Cayetano, semi-finalist at the ITA All-Americans, Selma Ewing of USC, quarter-finalist at the ITA All-Americans. The one I think you left off the, the list for USC, and obviously she's not playing a Stanford foe, but she's taking on t- Kylie Collins of Texas. Ewing Collins is yep. my first round mo- matchup. I will be watching most closely. I can promise you at least 30 minutes on our red zone stream. But, you know, to your point, it is fascinating because now that Stanford's lost a PAC 12 title, it just feels like things are open and USC making the round of 16 last year was one of the feel good stories of the NCAA tournament and UCLA had there been a 2020 uh, NCAA tournament would have made the finals they would have played UNC for the national championship because those two teams were on a collision course and I feel this is such a random aside. But do we give Graham, Davitella, McKenna Jones, should we just award them the 2020 NCAA title? Because I was at that national indoors. And I'm just telling you, they weren't losing to anyone. Like North Carolina was winning the NCAA title in 2020. They were so much better in the field, hands down that year than everyone else. Like Pepperdine and Texas made up the gap so much in 2021, even though UNC didn't lose anyone. And it's just like, anyways, that's, a, that's an aside. I'd award it to them. But didn't you feel that way in the early days of the 2021 season as well? No, because I was at the National Indoors. And like the worst thing that could have happened for UNC is to beat Texas in that fashion. It would have actually just been better to lose that match because at least if you lose it, you no longer feel invincible to be, uh, you know, down 3-1 to have the comeback that they had and to have – uh, obviously at number four singles, Elizabeth Scotty do what she did against Charlotte Shavatapan, come back from a set and break deficits, uh, deficit. 
Uh, but 2020, like at that national indoors, I can't emphasize enough. It was so, and you could tell NC state was very good. And they were like that next tier team, but it was UNC UCLA huge drop everyone else. And it is interesting to note again, you get Cam Mora back here and Mora is always someone who's had success in these individual fall events. She's got an interesting matchup. One of the few rostered players on Florida state, Petra Huell, uh, she's going to play first round. That's always an interesting interconference matchup. I'm excited for Alexa Newell against Vicky who of Absolutely. Princeton. I think that should be an exciting one. And obviously for Ayana Ackley of South Carolina to draw Irana Contos, uh, arena Contos, CMAers, that sucks for both players. That's just an unfortunate draw. It's great for us fans. Like that is certainly one to keep an eye on. But again, if those are the first round matches you're watching most closely, who are the seeds you have on upset alert? We've got eight of them. You look at the section. I consider an upset, obviously, prior to the quarterfinal round. Who you think of these top eight seeds, the least likely to make quarterfinals? Mm, okay. So I had a different definition of upset alert, but uh Give me your it's, definition. I, I'm curious. We're still feeling I, each other out here. This is good. This is part of the I, learning process. I, I was going first round. Who okay. was on upset a lot for that first round? And honestly, thinking too any, small, big potatoes here. Come on. But here, but here's the reason why. I think it's anyone but Hamner and Forbes. I think every other seed in this in this draw is, you know, has a tough first round match that they could lose. I think you're being generous that you threw Hamner in that group. Because again, if you go by my definition, yes, she should beat Elsa Tamise. Uh, Tamise, I apologize mm -hmm. if I'm butchering that. But by my definition, she plays the winner of Collins and Ewing. That is yeah. no cakewalk. That is a no. brutal round of 16 matchup. In yeah. terms of first round upset alerts, where are you? So there are two things you're going to hear in our college contender series. Jay and I debate fiercely. One of them will be Stanford down the road. And I agree with you. Khan Ima, Yepafanova have their opponents on upset alert. And, you know, I am very high on Stanford this season, as we discussed when we were coming up with our preseason top tens. I think ceiling wise, they are maybe the one team that can match Pepperdine down the home stretch of the season. I know that uh, and Texas, I should say. And I know that's a bull take and a third team that we're going to remain nameless because I think that's our big <laughs> surprise of you. You like that? You like that? You leave one little sneak peek in there, one little tease, but um, yeah, I, I just, you know, Georgia is, it is the other team you and I d disagree about. I still need to get, you know, I, I need to do more research into Georgia. I am not as high on them this season. You think Lisa Zar is an upset alert because obviously Zar lost what once, last season and she's been so good here uh in the fall as well was you know played an exceptional regional to earn i believe the title there four seed feels strong for someone who might not even play top four in her lineup yeah. at the same time <laughs> right like you could say that about cam mora last year or however many years ago was it mora who made the final and not graham at last year's ita national that actually might have been it anyway because she got that top 10 ranking and i it must have been off of some false success. Anyways, not to pull, throw us aside, is Zara an upset alert? Like, is she? So I'm I'm excited that you're broadcasting this event because I'm excited for you. I'm excited for me to watch Mel Riasco of Georgia play. Okay. Um, she is just flying back from making the semifinals of a 25K in somewhere in South America. Um, and she hasn't really lost a ton of matches and she has had some pro success. And to me, in the same way that like Connie Ma, Yepifin, well, Connie Ma and Yepifinova were biased because we know them from the, their U.S. junior days. Um, so we know kind of their their success. But Riasco, to me, is a huge question mark. Um, and so, yeah, I, I have Zara on, on upset alert because I don't know what the ceiling is of Riasco, um, but I'm excited to find out. And I think there are a lot of matches in here, almost more on the men's side, that to me are going to tell us a lot about the strength of the team. Uh, and this Riasco debut, if you will, on kind of the national stage in college tennis, I think is going to be one of those um, benchmarks for how good this Georgia team can be. What do you know about two seed Daria Freeman of Princeton? She was not, you know, one of the players who made, I believe, quarterfinals or better at the ITA All-Americans. Obviously, she gets in here the hard way through the regional what, what do you know about her? And again, it's a Princeton team. I was talking with the GOAT, Colette Lewis. She said, Alex, yeah, I shared our list with her. She said, Alex, do not sleep on Princeton. Yeah, uh, you had mentioned that when we were 
chatting and I, I have to agree um, as I went back and I was looking, particularly when Freeman beat uh, Victoria Hugh in the final of the regional, I was like, let me, let me un uh, uh, unpack this a little bit more. And if we can move on to dark horse candidates, yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. A dark horse. Candidate. Nothing better I, than a natural site. You, <laughs> can I just say you get this? <laughs> I've, I've listened to too many. Um, <laughs> And I learned from the best, you know. Yeah. Chris. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah. What can I say? Chris it, is pretty good. It, it's hard. It's hard to have her as a dark horse because she's seated number two here. Um, but she's seated number two on the back of her being ten and two this fall. Um, I mean, so she has not played essentially a match, a competitive match since that spring season of 2020. Uh, she went and finished like Roland Garros uh, juniors in 2020, and then nothing until this fall so she's 10 and 2 um she has wins over subash mora jada daniel of nc state and obviously her teammate victoria hugh in the regionals um her two losses are to laney sleeth of oklahoma and to aaron cayetano of usc so she has skyrocketed up in terms of utr in terms of looking at who she's beaten and that's where she's kind of gotten this number two seed um so that's another one that is, is a dark horse for me and one that I'm very curious to see play because we haven't seen any of her uh, essentially in college tennis. We only got kind of the, the two or three months um, in the spring of 2020, which was her first year. And it's a fascinating section for her because she's got UVA Stravinsky in the first yep. round and we're still trying to figure out what Stravinsky looks like here in college tennis. You've got you know, in the section above her, Crawley, Ma, Han, that would be a brutal quarterfinal matchup, regardless, you know, not to disrespect Sophia Carrington, by the way, of LSU, but, you know, you assume Fiona Crawley gets through that first round. I, I really do agree with you. And we, I don't know if we were on Mike, off Mike. I think we were on here at this point. See, all the conversations blend together. <laughs> uh, but for Fiona Crawley, I think this is where she reminds everyone, no, 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 no. I was undefeated last year. You guys know I didn't lose, right? I, I don't lose college tennis matches. Um, I do think this is a big opportunity for her. And, you know, again, with that in mind, you do talk about some of the other, uh, you know, dark horse candidates, I suppose, to do success uh, in this tournament. I feel like Freeman is a dark horse, like quietly as the number two C. We just haven't talked much about her and the success she's had. But I think Riasco is a good pick as well. Yep. I, I don't think Crawley or Kanto Siamers, even though they're unseated count, uh, because I just feel like that's kind of cheating. I don't think Kylie Collins counts either. No, nope. I do wonder because I Cam Nord did not have a good NCAA tournament last year. Let's be clear. And obviously she was a little bit banged up during that NCAA tournament run. And, you know, was dealing with a couple of injuries and we never talk about injuries during the course of matches because everyone's injured by the time you hit May, but she definitely was banged up. And you could tell as that tournament went on, it does feel like, again, for North Carolina to be elite this season, to compete with Texas, to compete with Pepperdine, she has to be the Cam Mora of last fall. She has to be the Cam, Nor Nor uh, Cam Mora of 2020. And I think it's ditto, by the way, for Elizabeth Scotty, who we see by the, uh, in the doubles draw as well playing in this event. And, you know, it is nice after so few Tar Heels in uh, the All-Americans to have Mora, to have uh, uh, Crawley, to have Riley Tran, who, by yep. the way, also undefeated last season. Like, yep. you get two undefeated players moving up to replace those Graham and Davitella spots. No one can replace them, but you get what I'm saying. I think all the UNC players are dark horses. I would put them on the list. I would put Freeman on the list as well, yep. the only number two-seated dark horse in history. <laughs> And then obviously, you know, I'm on the Epifanova, Connie Ma bandwagon. Yep. If one of the Stanford players makes a semifinal, it should shock no one. Agreed. I've got one more dark horse, horse for you. Um, Abby Forbes, the quietest one seed in history. I'm so, Abby Forbes is also on the list of just loving and kind human beings. And I just like to mention this every time we talk about Abby Forbes, she's 1A on that list. She's never not smiled and be like, hey, Alex, how are you? And I don't deserve that sort of kindness. Uh, and she's just exceptionally kind. And we haven't talked about her as the top seed, which, you know, again, who could be due for a season where it's just kind of like, no, 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 I figured this out now. It's time for me to dominate all of you. Abby Forbes checks off a lot of boxes in that category. Yeah, she absolutely does. And, you know, it's just because she's had a, full, a quiet fall season, right? Bowed out early in, um, in all Americans to Patch Kaleva. Um, You know, we just haven't seen a, a ton from her. So it's great to see her. She got, I think, 
think she got the wild card in, mm-hmm. in here. Um, so it'll be good to see kind of what, what her form is at. Um, and note to all the players listening, you just got to smile at Gruskin and you'll get a nice, uh, <laughs> nice, uh, section on the pod, um, qu- especially in the, in the COVID era, like goes without saying we had, a, I did an interview with a coach, sorry to cut you off. I don't want to give a spoiler who that coach was, but that coach quoted a tweet of mine to me as a like, coach coach you know how to get into my suit spot. You know how to butter me up. Well done. Anyways, go on. My last dark horse um, is Cozy Reva. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, of uh, of St. Mary's. So call. Um, have not seen much of her on the collegiate circuit um, really over the last few years. I mean, COVID really cut their season short. Obviously, St. Mary's isn't a team that we, we saw at NCAAs. Um, but she's had some really strong ITF results in the fall. Uh, so she made the second round uh, at a 25K recently where she qualified. She beat Charlotte Shabbat the Pond. Um, and then she qualified and made the, the won her first round at the 60K in Berkeley, beating in top 100 player um, Sai Sai Zhang. So that was a really awesome win. Um, and then she lost to Emma Navarro there. So not much on the, the college scene, um, but really strong pro results. So I'm very curious to see how that translates to uh, to this tournament. And it's just good to see her competing against, um, you know, national n- national uh, competition. She's lost to Connie Ma twice in the last uh, last month. So I'll be really curious to see how she stacks up. Yeah. And again, when you look at this event, the history of it, uh, so often this does, you win this event, you just have momentum on your side entering the season. You think about some of the stories on the men's side, you know, Sam Dev wins this in 2007. Well, we know what he goes on to do in 2008. This was part of his streak as well. And then, you know, Stevie wins it in 09. 2010, 2011, newsflash, he doesn't lose. And, you know, the Frank titles, the even Chris Sokos wins this in 2018 and then elevates himself, is the guy in 2019 in college tennis. The way he willed that Wake Forest team, he, Botzer, Goyo, uh, to the final of the ITA National Indoors in 2019. I will never forget uh, that sort of moment. But I always love the St. Mary's drop. And by the way, on the women's side, we already made the case for Jokic uh, in the past for Davitella as well. Francesca Di Lorenzo won this event back-to-back. But by the way, St. Mary's, they know their way around the ITA. Welcome back to our Crack Rackets Red Zone coverage of the 2021 ITA National Fall Championships. You might be wondering why it took us a little bit longer to get back from that break. Well, that's because, as you can see, we are joined by one of the many members of our Crack Rackets group here. You know him, of course, as the forefather of the College Tennis Ranks formula. Predictions never far from the listed UTR. One of the many dames to root for the Liberty Flames. Lover of mothers, lover of almond joys, the snitch, the professor. He quotes Henry Ford II. And yes, that's right, folks. The birthday boy, Chris Halioris. Chris, welcome to the broadcast. Happy belated, my friend. The hair looks magnificent. You're doing your best, Drac impression i like it how are you doing today <laughs> i'm doing great how are you alex good to be uh good to be on for a little bit here i'm uh hang, hanging out uh hanging out watch it up i'm here in the in lynchburg for the weekend to catch us uh, some hidden duels but be excellent to catch some fall nationals action no, it's great to have you. The thing I miss most as we go full screen here on court number nine, where I believe we have our matchup continuing between all American finalists out of Old Dominion, Sesnuskaya, and uh, Stardust Seva, excuse me, taking on MSU's Lewis and Petrovich. But to answer your question, the thing I miss most, Chris, about doing this in person and with and with you is when you hit hour seven of these broadcasts, things get loopy. And the only person who understands exactly exactly what you're going through is the person who's been sitting beside you the entire day. And so right now I've just missed that feeling when we were in Wisconsin, where I would turn to you and give you a little look and it would just be like, you got two more hours in you Uh, because certainly that's where we're at tonight. Yeah. Hour seven, Wisconsin. That was like halfway through the day. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. The doubles had just finished for a second match and it was like, all right, perfect. Like we still got two and a half to go, but no, it's been a great day of action and all of our singles matches now, I believe, officially in the books. Uh, while we watch the doubles, while we zoom around here, we're going to focus in on court number nine here, Cessna Skaya, uh, Startup Seva, again, taking on Lewis and Petrovich of MSU. Let's talk about some of the results we've seen on the day, in particular on the men's side. 
I'd say the first upset was when Alafi Aini knocks out Gabe Diallo. Straight set win for the Cornell. I want to say third year now. How big of an upset is that to you? Is that just a reminder of how good Alafia can be? Yeah, I I mean, surely it's an upset, but I don't think all, really all that big an upset. We have not seen a lot uh, of him in the last couple of years. He's played a lot of futures, uh, so he's gotten some good experience, just not a lot of college tennis uh, for those guys. So I don't think it's uh, it's not huge, not totally unexpected. I think we had talked about that one last night as that, that was definitely a potential uh, upset of when you were looking down the list of seeds who got some – you know, some tough first round draws. And that was definitely one of the ones we talked about. Mm-hmm. One of the big ones I saw on the day, Mason Byler, and we talked again off mic, uh, not on the podcast, but about what a year it is for Oklahoma. SEC move on the horizon. It's a loaded Big 12 conference. You've got six teams, each of them, a juggernaut to go through. Uh, big win for Mason Byler, three sets over Taha Body to advance. I thought it was a good performance from their freshman as well. In his straight loss to Arthur Ferry, Jordan Hassan, I thought he looked good. The other one that stood out to me on the men's side, Holmgren, one in three over von der Schulenberg. And there are some, some scores I'm missing right now on my scoreboard, and we'll recap it all on the mini break podcast later tonight. But Holmgren, one in three over the doc. Is he the best player in California? Uh, we had this conversation before. I mean, I th- I, on one hand, I say you have to give him the advantage and make him the leading candidate, right? And then on the other hand, you made me pick and I took Steph to win. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how those two things level out a uh, balance with each other. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he's obviously one of the best, if not the best. But, yeah, that's very, very impressive win win for him. Uh, and, you know, on the, on the flip side, uh, you know, I'm sure you've been prognosticating a potential lineup, especially since you're going to have to give one when we talk to Coach Pedroso, or I'm going to have to give one, one of the two. Uh, is, you know, who's the leading candidate for their for the top spot there right now? Is you know, you thought coming in, Von Schulenberg, yeah. but Mont Inyaki is playing tremendous. I mean, two qualifying wins at the Charlottesville Challenger, then knocks off Polanski in the first round. I mean, he's 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 on cloud nine right now. So so yeah, the the Virginia outlook for Virginia is uh, is pretty good right now. Yeah, my bar bots replace five singles take ages better and better with every passing day, Chris. Much like your hair, better and better. Yeah, you, it might be high right now from the looks of things. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that won't happen and he'll come around, but yeah. Yeah, and on the flip side, and again, we're going to focus in on the matches momentarily, but while I have Chris, I want to explore his expertise. You look on the women's side, there were a bunch of fascinating matchups. Selma Ewing comes back from a set deficit drama in the third set. She ends up holding on against Kylie Collins. The one that stood out to me, Connie Ma, 6-3-6-1 over Snow Han of USC. The Stanford freshman looks outstanding. You had Emma Hamner. ITA All-American champion pushed to three sets. She ultimately gets the win uh, in three. Fiona Crawley, three-set win. Hule of Florida State, three-set win over Cam Mora. Who stood out to you? For uh, you know, what are what are the ones you you are seeing most most closely? I mean, uh, yeah, Connie Maz just looked tremendous in the. I mean, you know, obviously you have to give huge props to Hamner after what she did at, uh, you know, at the all Americans and, and now come, come here. But yeah, that the, Connie Maz, it, that's going to be uh, that's going to be an interesting one to, to watch going, going forward. I think that was, that was kind of the most impressive, I think for me. Mm-hmm. The other two I'd mentioned, Arena Kanto, 7-5 in the third set win over Ayana Ackley of South Carolina. That's a nice win for the Ohio state junior. Who's going to be counted on at the top of that lineup. And then, Georgia freshman Mel Riasco knocks out Lee Cesar, 7-6-6-4. I don't know where I'm at with Georgia. You lose a presence like Jokic at the top of your lineup. I just, how do you replace that? Even when you have Liam Ma, even when you bring in a Riasco and you have Kowalski coming back as well. But that's a nice win for Riasco over Zard. That was one I noticed on the day as well. Yeah, and and a lot of the you know a school like Georgia, you just know they're they're going to be up there. That's one of those schools. They're going to find they're going to find their way. Come you know 
come January and beyond to to be there. You know, obviously, you're not going to replace Katarina Jokic. And, you, you know, you're not going to replace her, period. You're just going to, you know, it's a different team. But but they'll they'll be there. Mm-hmm. No, let's play a trivia game. And I want all of you viewing in right now to try and guess uh, these names as well. Again, ITA uh, Indoor National Championships became the ITA National Fall Championships starting in 2017. There was a dabble with calling it the Oracle Masters event, but essentially the event moved outdoors starting in 2017. I'm not going to quiz you on doubles, but I'll quiz you on singles. Your singles champions, your singles finalists. Uh, it, champions is really the trivia question if you can name the finalist bonus points here how many can you name men's and women's side since 2017 from fall nationals from this event yes fall nationals from, from this event oh one my god one of them should be super easy for you yeah i'm gonna get like one okay <laughs> certainly we're going with nuno <laughs> <laughs> 2017 inaugural and that was, champion and i'm trying to remember that was either over petros or Red Licky, and I don't remember. It was Red Licky. He beat Petros, I think, in the semis, but he beat Red Licky in the final. Okay. Uh, that's 2017. Bravo. That's 17. Okay. I'm going to say somewhere in there has to be JJ. No JJ title. He won All Americans, not this. Oh, okay. Uh, how about Goyo? You hit right school, wrong player. Petros. Petros wins in 2018. Who'd he beat in the final? Did Petros He's a monster of sorts. In the final, a monster of sorts. That's a great clue. And by the way, again, we see here on court nine, Old Dominion, MSU. So not Keegan Smith. No. He would again, have been too young. You're close. Uh, Martin mon- Redlicky? No, he's a monster of sorts. <laughs> Martin Redlicky? Oh, no, that's a great guess. But no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I was close with the right school, and he was the biggest guy I could think of. All right, I'm uh, going to give this one away. The Kooky Monster, Daniel Kooker. Oh, geez. Okay. 2018 finalist. Now, 2019, That's- when you find out who the finalist is, you're going to be mad you didn't guess it because this is the non power only non-power fi- five finalist. Well, that's I'm not true because go- UCF last year was a double finalist. But I'm going to go outdoors. with, uh, oh, my goodness, I can't re- – his name escapes me. Damon Casares. There it is. St. Mary's. That's the finalist who okay. beat <sighs> Undefeated until Andrew Fenty gave him the deuce-deuce at National Indoors. Well, that's not true. You might have lost the round before. Uh, who did? Brandon Holt. Yuya Ito. Oh, Ito. So those are the men's finals. And then last year, I believe it was all UCF. Do you remember that final? I think that was Hildebrand and who did Hildebrand play? Mizuchi? No. Was it? Maybe? Mizuchi? No. I can't find the finalists. I know it was Hildebrand and someone. This is my struggle. I was banking on you here. Anyways, that's the men's answers. If you know the women's answers, submit them in our YouTube comments. No cheating. If it's from John Parsons, don't count that answer, West off because he doesn't count anymore as a viewer. I mean, he counts as a viewer, but he's on the inside circle, so he can't win this prize. But with that in mind, that's our trivia for all of you viewers. Can you name the outdoor champions plus 2020 winner of the ITA National Fall Championships, formerly the Oracle Masters? With that in mind, ooh, a bunch of good guests biggest forehand i like that question we'll get to it a little bit later blake but now let's rock and roll let's hop around these courts let's see the action we have on hand for us here down the home stretch in doubles and again doubles play going to take us home here let's start if we can on court 11 let's hop over to court 11 right now west off it, it was De Camps, by the way, Gruskin. De Camps was the, yeah, that makes sense. That checks out. But here on your screen, Hisler, Benishek, taking on the team of Katakova, Bezos of Iowa State. And again, for Iowa State, big program first for them at the regional. Sweep singles and doubles. Of course, those are the small victories we always celebrate here at College Tennis. The opportunity for a program like that to be on this stage. 
Mets matchup here on court 11. You mentioned Connie Ma. Let's go to 16. Let's watch her in action if we can, West Up. On 16 right now, Connie Ma. Injured League Blake, near side of your screen. If they just held for three all against the duo of Collard Shake. From UVA. I like this matchup, Chris. I've gotten to see a little bit, but not a lot of, of Connie Ma, and definitely not any in doubles. So I think this will be uh, be a little interesting to see. Just watch how easy the firepower is. It's slingshot. It's just her ability to absorb, redirect in her singles match today against Snow Han. I just, everything came so easily. It just feels like the better the opponent, the better she'd play as well. Dare I say the Nuno Borges sim syndrome. Did he, he had the day off today, right? His quarterfinals tomorrow. Day off today plays Verdasco tomorrow. Actually, he played doubles today. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, other, they, uh, into the semis and doubles. But yeah, his singles match with Verdasco is tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. By the way, Blake Caste confirming it was to camps in that final. So far, no guesses for the women. Again, if you can, 2017, 18, 19, 20. I think the 18, 19, 20 guesses are pretty easy. Yeah, I honestly have no clue, but I'm going to say Ashley Leahy's in there somewhere. <laughs> It's a good guess. Not her. Everyone oh, else. No, she wasn't even in there, huh? Uh, All-American champion. Not a finalist. Lost in the semifinals to the eventual champ last year. Wow. Navarro. That's exactly who you think it is. No, not Navarro. That's funny. It's who I think it is? Come on. You're going to tell me it's one of the North Carolina girls? It's uh, Graham and Davitella. Wow, yeah, okay. I just gave it away. There you yeah. go. Sorry, folks. <laughs> All right. I was going to not tell him anything. But 2017 is a tough guess. That's the real trivia here. And I guess 18. 2017. It's like... Why does that seem so long ago that it's almost impossible? When the 2017 ITA All-American was played... Uh, National Fall Champ, excuse me, you and I had never recorded a podcast together. Really? Lifetime ah. ago. I think that was a guest from Super Producer Daniel Westoff. No Jamie Loeb. Oh, it's from Blake Caste. I would have really preferred if that was a guest from you, Westoff. Lope won this event in 2013, so a little bit before then. See the change over here now. Yeah, I looked it up. There's zero chance I was going to get any of that. <laughs> On court 16. Uh, let's move now, if we can, court number six. Now, here's another fun fact for all of you. You go back. Oh, no, it was the All-American that Martinality, uh, the Yale team, ended up winning in doubles. I believe that was 2019. Martinelli, I want to say, and Gong were the title winners then. But you look here. Fascinating new duo. Again, we talked about that void at the top of Carolina's lineup without Graham, without Davitella, without McKenna Jones. Fiona Crawley and Elizabeth Scotty are who you circle to replace those sorts of players at the top of the lineup. Fiona Crawley has never lost a college tennis match. A college tennis dual match, excuse me. Her serving on the far side, of course, Elizabeth Scotty. One half of the NCAA championship winning duo in 2021. We knew North Carolina was going to come up with some sort of hardware. The last guess, though, would have been that Jones and Scotty were going to win the doubles title. Chris, that's – and by the way, Jones, McKenna Jones joins her father. Good overheads there. 
as NCAA double champion Kelly Jones, of course. Some nice overheads there from Elizabeth Scotty, but that had to be one of the most unexpected ones, right? Yeah. Because I'm trying to think the year before, like Broomfield and, and uh, I think Gabrielle was who she was playing with. That team made sense. Cressy and Smith makes a ton of sense as champions. Yeah. Walton and Harper make sense. Riffis makes sense. Navarro made sense. Super Press and Reba made sense. I remember watching the Cressy Smith match. I think it was the team they beat was not one that you would have expected to see there. Certainly not one I expected to see there. Didn't expect Auburn in the doubles final last year either. Yeah, same same kind of thing, exactly. Mm -hmm. So no, again, always interesting, but again, we're keeping our eye on this matchup, Crawley, Scotty, they hold you look for this duo for North Carolina. They now take a six two uh first set. Again, we're jumping around a little bit, trying to figure out what is what. Let's go to court seven next, West off. See if we can figure out via the clothing who is who. Of course, again, right now, shout out to our friends at Track Tennis. Shout out to our friends at Tennis Ticker, providing the live feeds, live scoring for all the action here this week. <clears throat> Excuse me. It looks like Michaela Gordon from a return position. Again, I'm, it's been a while. But I don't see her on court right now on the scoreboard. this as again we jump around that right now let's go to eight to show off the action on each and every court i'm pretty sure that's michaela gordon not willing to bet the farm on it but i'd bet chris's hair Whew. i'd let you bet it yeah all right chris who is this duo give me your oh that's the... is this wald even Spaziri? No. the server right away says no <laughs> yeah. it was you... it was the texas colors that looked like an orange for a second that is a wake forest that's, for that's sure. wake forest there yeah so that's gonna be who that's brillin and killingsworth boy no it's got to be two it's guys i definitely have not seen looking up and down the board here. let's check out the draw yeah you looked Right now, excuse me, Brillin Killingsworth. I was gonna say that's the women's. Oh, no. That's definitely not them. Here we go, Schneider and no, is this Schneider and Banthia? Uh, that's definitely Sid the kid. That is Sid, huh? Wow. It is. Now that I see the racket, now that I'm taking a closer look. I don't know why that looks orange to me. That's been that sort of day. And who are they playing? They are taking on the duo of Hooper and Moreno Lozano. From UNL. Where are you with Wake Forest this year? You know, it's a tough call. I mean, I think we're all assuming no squire, right? I mean... I love uh, the resignation in your voice. No squire. I know, because I think with squire, I mean, they're a contender. Uh, but with I, I would put them in that, you know, in that class of, I think, I, I can't, well, I think we were at, at about seven teams that we kind of put in the, uh, the mix this year of preseason contenders for the title, if you will. I would have had them there without him. Definitely not. I would, uh, you know, I've, I think without him, they're, they're in that realm where they're probably going to try to battle for top 10. You know, they're a, they're a 10 ish, uh, you know, 10 to 15 trying to be better. But uh, I think with, you know, again, without Squire, that's going to, that's going to be tough. Everybody's got to move up. 
uh, they're certainly still have a lot of guys and still deep, but I think that's a that's a big hit for them. No, I, I would agree with you there. Obviously, it feels like they've got a team of seven number six singles players. Yeah, <laughs> seems like they've had that for a while. They just had <laughs> other people that were solid up top. But yeah, exactly. yeah Tony's yeah. always got uh, an army of guys that can uh, that can play play deep. Now, if it was one through twelve, this duo, you know, in college tennis, this team would be a top five team, no doubt about that. The question is, do the freshmen from last year step up after obviously a COVID and just strange season for the Wake Forest program? Uh, you look here, Banthia, Schneider, momentum on their side, uh, number six seeds here at this ITA National Fall Championship. With that in mind, let's move to nine. Let's see if we can't figure out who's playing who. No match here on nine. Let's go to 10. Not sure if we're going to have anything on 10 either. But then, of course, we go to our friends at 11. And we have a matchup back on hands. And you look here at court number 11. Five ball here. Hisser. Benchek, and Kablikova, Bezos. That's the action on 11. Let's hop over to 12. This is definitely just a couple of players warming up here, and I believe this is the women's Wake Forest duo, Brillin Killingsworth, taking on Mize and Karasova of Mississippi. You know, on the women's side, one of the matches you didn't bring up as you were going through the uh, recap from earlier today in singles, I was just seeing, uh, checking all the scores, Riley Tran over Natasha Subash. Yeah, that was a result, and Subash had set point, 5-4, Deuce was serving for it. Tran kept swinging. She's good, and you know the rule is North Carolina has to have at least one two-handed forehand in the lineup. Now they've got two. <laughs> so we're back here on 16 now, near side of your screen, serving Connie Ma, Uber freshman, She's partnered with Angelique Blake. Girl currently has a 6-3 first set lead in the bag over the Virginia duo of Shake and Collar. Looks like we should have out there on one of those courts, we should have the uh, pairing we were talking about getting to a look at, and that was uh, Kentucky's Mercer and Lapidat. They're on court. Uh, they are playing, yeah, right now. Duarte and Grinvalds. Uh, I don't see a court number, so you might have to do a little searching to find that. That's half the fun. But of course, something we'll be keeping our eye on there. Let's see, can we try 17? See if they're on 17. Seventeen is warm up. Let's check. No action on stadium right now. That means, just so you know, Chris, courts 14 and 15, no broadcast, unfortunately. That's just a reminder to everyone. Oh, let's see here on 18. Who is that duo? Nope. I believe you found it. We have found the goods. I don't know. Is this Mercer on the near side? Well, I'm not sure. Unfortunately, we're, we're, they're both blue and white teams as well. I was going to say, lop it out to lefty, so this checks out. Oh, yeah, that's definitely Mercer. Because I, I was making sure near side wasn't him. Near side is not him. I was like, that guy's too tall. The guy at the net is absolutely J.J. Mercer. So, again, Lapidot, Mercer, Kentucky. And for this Kentucky team, we'll talk about it in our GSP preview of them when we record it. Lapidot, Mercer serving on the far side, 2-3. Doubles and bottom of the lineup. Those are the missing ingredients because we know what they bring to the table at one, two, and three singles. And just if they can figure out 
two of those four things. Doubles, four, five, six singles. They figure out two of the four, Chris. Now we're talking quarterfinals. Now we're talking maybe even better than that. Yeah, it's a very... Definitely a very talented team. And we know Mercer's got to fit into the doubles picture somewhere. Chris is making faces at me. That's always a good thing. So we see the big serve sets up the big overhead from Mercer. Again, 2-3 here on this court. Such good hands from J.J. Mercer. Of course, he and Robbie Cash started together at Ohio State. Such a prolific duo in doubles throughout their junior career together. She just didn't have the playing opportunities. He was looking for it with the Buckeyes. You know, talking to Coach Cedric Kaufman of Kentucky. He was super excited to get Mercer on the team. That was a guy they targeted specifically as someone they thought could fill a need right away on their team. here. Chris continued to new for a round. I'll take it back to us as soon as we can. Yeah, I might be back. I was having a little freezing up problem here. It's good. That's half the fun. That's that's why I am C. I'll take it. Certainly not the only reason. <laughs> so we see here, got Lapidot, Mercer getting pushed a little bit here. In Lapidot service game, I know Josh Lapidot's another guy Coach Kaufman has circled. But shout out to this duo, Duarte and Grinvalds. Solid fundamental doubles. You see the aggression they play with. So Kentucky holds 4-3 all here on court 18. Again, we're keeping an eye on a bunch of different things. Crawley, Scotty, 6-2-3 love. They lead on Gonzaga of Yale. Keep an eye on that as it uh, reaches, moves towards the finish line. There's the word. Of course, always want to watch Tommy Ma. She gets broken in that first game by Collar and Shake. Mon Blake of Stanford taking the first set over their Virginia opponent 6-3. Right now we're locking in on some SEC action. Mercer, Lapinat, taking on GSU's Duarte, Grimbaum. What a half volley there. On the slide. Dare I say, pickles the twine. Step all the land in, draw the error. It's now 40 love here. A little quadruple game point. See the energy. It's what you have to bring in a matchup like this. If you're Duarte and Grinvalds, they hold 4-4-3 here on court 18. Let's go back to six if we can. Crawley, Scotty, pulling away.
So is this the top doubles pair for, for North Carolina this year, Gruskin? It's tough to say, and we didn't get to see North Carolina much at all during the ITA All-Americans. I, I hesitate. I mean, Crawley got knocked out, I believe, by Hamner in qualifying three sets. So, like, tough loss, obviously, in the end. But didn't get to see much of them in the main draw. A lot of them were playing some pro events as well. I mean, you'd think the NCAA champion's at one with whomever she wants to play with. And then you can spread out Mora with the experience she has at two or three. And you work in Yavagata. Tran and Sanford were very, very good last year. No reason they can't step up this season as well. The idea of throwing Cam Moore at three doubles with anyone you feel promising about. That's the question. Sanford and Tran or Scotty and Crawley. Mm. I'd probably go Scotty at one. Just her size at the net, her presence, that serve. You feel pretty good about your chance. And then just the consistency of Crawley. You feel pretty good in trying to replicate what Jones and Scotty had. Yeah, I'm with you. I think, I mean, for uh, more for your former point, I, how do you take the, the NCAA champ and then tell her, ah, oh, you're coming back at two this year? Uh, I'm trying to think. Ask Chase Buchanan and Blaz Rolla, who they were yeah. like, we're just going to split you guys up. Does that work? And they're like, yeah, sure. Again, foot's on the gas pedal for Scotty and Crawley. I mean, I like the aggression Yields playing with. Yeah, I mean, that was a that was a nice nice backhand right down the middle. They're uh, they're definitely going for it. It's a uh, they may unfortunately just just be a little outmatched here. I'm trying to remember court numbers. Yeah, it's nice. Fiona Crawley splits the middle there. Hand drops in. It's got the inch closer and closer to that finish line. Stays alive here on court number six. Let's go back to 18 if we can. Duarte, Grinvalds, Mercer, Lampinat, 15 all here in the for all service game for GSU. It's a tough miss for Mercer. Now, normally you'd say, well, forehand's in the middle. That's his ball. Well, lop it out the lefty. He had a clean look at a forehand as well. I do love this decision. Forehand's in the middle. That's what you have to do when you go right lefty in doubles, right? Yeah, I think that's common. Uh, that's definitely the, the more recent line of thinking is now you want forehands on the outside for the return, and I'm like, no. That that that's the way I always was, only because I didn't want to hit a backhand no matter what. So, 
So so I wanted to play deuce court and take the forehand on the return uh, and, and make him try to go down the line. But, yeah, I think, I mean, at the upper levels, no, I, I definitely think at the upper levels you want the forehands down the middle. Yeah, you see there Lapidot capitalizing on that forehand. Steps up in the court here. Again, not quite an opening. 40-30 here. See if they can extend us to a deuce point. Put some pressure on GSU. By the way, 6-2-4-1 right now. Probably Scotty. Forgot to get that score update at the changeover. GSU holds 5-4 here in the first set. And for us to know who's exactly playing where, I do know. 4-1 here. You see Elizabeth Scotty at the baseline here for UNC. My hot take is that Fiona Crowley plays one singles for North Carolina. I don't even think that's a hot take. But that's one of my North Carolina takes this year, Chris. Really? Yeah, I think she is that good. Well, you know, the good news is it's probably only about two months until you find out. Yeah, exactly. Inching closer and closer. This is that final major event of the fall calendar. Yeah, I mean, you can serve and play plus one like that. This is your number one doubles team. Does that service game belongs at line number one? She'd been trying to poach the entire point, and then when she finally did, didn't, Scotty had no idea. Oh, that's good. She said, oh, yeah, she's going to take that. I don't need to move. The, the better question here, Gruskin, whose sock game do you like better? Oh, Scott, I, I mean. Scotty or Crawley? The answer is the sweatpants on coach. Yeah. I love that blue-black blend. But Scotty, I mean, I'd rock the high Scott. High oh, for sock. sure. I'm, yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah, that's what you have to do. That's nope. a national champion, by the way. You have to be that to have a high side on this event. And they can't be white. I will say, having the chance to interview Scotty and McKenna Jones uh, after their national championship run, Elizabeth Scotty is one of, if not the funniest player in women's college tennis. Just the candidness, the goofiness. She's great. Just a fantastic interview. Highly recommend if you have a go listen to that on the Cracked Interviews podcast. And yes, that's a self-plug. Would have been great there if you're like, I agree, Alex. That was a great interview. I listened to it like I listened to all of your shows. I was just thinking any interview that you can do with any women is going to be far superior for, for, for your benefit than, <laughs> than anything else. Not wrong. I oh, love the poach there. Oh. You're not poaching, though. You're not playing. And look, you're going to get beat sometimes. I like the move there. Same time, way to keep the focus if you're Yale, way to keep the pressure on. That's a good cross. And again, you're down 1-5 here. You don't have much to lose. But I like that play from Scotty. Yeah, good poach. But I think as, as soon as that happens, then, you know, the, you, you can't stay. You can't both end up on the same side of the court. Fair. But they probably have not, you know, not gotten to spend a whole lot of time playing doubles together either at this point. Mm -hmm. 
to see here, unfortunately. I don't think I got your. I didn't get your picks for for doubles uh, champions. Uh, you know. Well, you know, I'm on the broadcast. That's like Kirk Herb Street. You're not allowed to make picks. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, I mean, for the men, I think I went Fenty Aaron Schneider. I mean, I. You know where you can hear my predictions, Chris? On the pot. With that, I did with John Parsons, new Crack Rackets contributor. I don't remember. I didn't. I don't think I win Fenty Aaron Schneider, but I think I had them making a run. Oh, I think I might have gone Finn uh, Finn Bass and Sven Long. That's a pretty good pick. It's our horse pick too, right? Sven Long today, zero and one in about twelve minutes. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Felt bad for Max Westpaul, Columbia. It's a tough day for the Lions, but oh my gosh, did Sven Law play excellent? Let's see here if Crawley and Scotty can't finish out this match. Really good, good hands up there. Yeah, this has all the makings of a number one team. So where do you have Gresk this year with, with in the absence of the aforementioned players you talked about? Where do you put North Carolina as they finish the match off there? And they earn that straight set victory. I'm not going to give away their exact placement because it's one of, I think, our big twists in our Crack Rackets College Contender Series, which, of course, you can all follow on the Cracked Interviews podcast. You can follow on the Great Shot podcast. You can follow on our website, crackrackets.com, as we transition back to court number 18 right now. And I won't lie, my tennis ticker not exactly working at the moment. I'm not sure if yours is right now, Chris. No, I've got a blank one. Yeah, and it's, you know, again, it's been a long day for all of us here on the stream as we look court 18. Looks like we have the end of a first set, I believe here, or are certainly the foundations of the ending of a first set. I think we're on serve here 5-6, if I had to guesstimate. And given the hustle and bustle, JJ Mercer ran back to the line with. That feel like a good guess? 5-6 here, Wildcats? That'd be a tremendous guess. I was not watching close enough. I just know we were in that four-all range last we left, so. Mm -hmm. Is Mercer trying to just grow a little J.J. Wolf, dude? I would argue JJ's trying to grow a little Mercer too, but they're both JJ's, so it's just a thing. Yeah. JJ Wolf, that is, on a, a nice little run of his own, coming off a challenger title and another and another good run this week. Beat Dennis Kudla today. It's a very nice victory. Yeah, it's been nice to see him come back from his uh, his time off and his in surgery, getting back into it. Looks like he's rolled back into form well, and and hopefully hopefully can make a run into the top hundred to uh, join some of our other recent college guys that are on big runs in in Cam Nori and Dom Kupfer. Oh, 
think that's the set. That had it to be the set because they just came out of changeover. Yep. So it was 6-5, but it was 6-5 Wildcats. And we talked about the potential contributions of J.J. Mercer. And Joshua Lapidot. Seven five first set over the duo out of GSU. Again, we're flying a bit blind here on the red zone. We do apologize for that fact. As soon as we have any information, we will be sure to share it all with you. Yeah, let's hang out at seven. It's not like there's any bad tennis for us to watch. With that in mind, let's go to eight. All of these matchups enticing at this point. Oh, here's one I don't think we've seen. Looks like an Arizona red. But there's no. Oklahoma really? Oklahoma red? This time it's definitely red. Is this Bama? No. No. This isn't Planisek and Martin versus Bass and Law. No way. No, ne neither of the guys on the other side are Finn Bass. Okay. And I don't have a draw in front of me, so... Is this Montana State? Panic and Van Dyke versus Dostinich and Rubel? Well, I... I actually thought these looked no, like no. USC colors, but I do not believe that that's... No, timing-wise, it wouldn't make sense. Dostinich. Be Denver, Davis, and Summers. Versus hmm. It's Nebraska. You got a Nebraska duo in there? think so. Oh, UNL. Nebraska Lincoln. Oh. You know what's hilarious? You've been calling them UNL, that's Nebraska. No, it's it's in the draw sheet, UNL, Nebraska Lincoln. But you know what's hilarious? Far side of the court once again. Said the kid Banthia. Oh, is it? <laughs> we just can't tell. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, you can see him at the net, but certainly can't tell from Should have recognized Coach Mamie. Miami, my guy. Just look at Sean up there. Battery on the machine. Chris had to hop off for a moment as he he deals with some technical issues on his side. In the meantime, again, on court number eight right now. It's the Nebraska duo, Hoover, Breno Laz uh, Lozano, taking on Schneider, Banthia.
leave, much like many of you are flying blind right now on the scores as soon as we have any information. Of course, we'll get that to you. out wide there. Again, for this Nebraska team, it's been a struggle early on for them in the Big Ten. And for the last you know, coaching staff, really excited about the group they have their hands on this season. Feels like they finally established the culture they've been looking for. Obviously, to get a group into the ITA Fall Nationals here, huge accomplishment. Hold for the Huskers here on court number eight. Let's jump around a little bit here again as we wait for the tennis ticker to resume. And again, shout out to them. Shout out our friends at Track Tennis who help make all of this possible. Let's go to court number nine. Currently warming up on court nine. Let's head to 10 if we can. match on 10. I appreciate this. So the producer Daniel West off. We're back to 7. Where I remain convinced it's Michaela Gordon. Can't prove otherwise right now. She's probably not even in the draws. Let's see.
that's your action on seven. Let's go to thirteen. You know there's action happening there. As we're trying to figure out these duos. The uniform doesn't give us any indication. Bulldog on the shirt. I like that. Be a Gonzaga duo. Hollingworth, Kaluja, Treluja, excuse me, Kaluja, and Davis and Summers. Not one of my finest broadcasting moments there. I do apologize for that. you just joining in any comments requests you can throw them in the chat you want to follow us our coverage of this event you can do so at crack rackets or at great shot pod let's go to 16 west off see what else we have going out there on the board this one i recognize blake ma off the first set I'm trailing in the second set I believe collared and shake
Ball sails wide. If we can, West off, let's go to Stadium Court. See Ma Blake getting the Blake break back here. Again, on stadium right now. I believe we have a matchup here between our number six seeds, Kylie Collins, Charlotte Shvatapan of Texas, and Cherkis Zaid. Tavska of LMU. According to my sources on the ground, it's LMU with a lead right now. Let's pop back to uh, 16 while we wait here. I'll come back here on the, after the changeover. See if Blake can't serve it out with Connie Ma. Keep our eyes on that court. We know what's going on there. I like that they redid the high five. That's the enthusiasm. 4.24 p.m. on the grounds you're looking for. You didn't get the first high five right. You shanked it. That is not good mojo for the next point. That's the whole for Stanford here on court 16. Again, with that in mind, let's go back to stadium court. I know super producer Daniel Westoff on the ones and twos right now. Gets us back to stadium. Recognize that burnt orange of the Texas Longhorns. Anywhere you see it, defending NCAA champions. Kylie Collins, a finalist with Lulu Sun. Last year in the doubles competition as well was a brutal defeat for Collins in her first round singles match today. Was up a set against Selma Ewing. Traded breaks back and forth. Was down 5-2 in the third. Then it was 5-4. Ewing ultimately holds to knock out Collins in the first round. See if there's any bleed over effect from that result. I believe it's 4-1 here for LMU. Some of you may not know this, but I know the volunteer of volunteers over for LMU, a guy many of you may be familiar with, a man by the name of Steve Weissman. Of course, you know him best from the fact page six called him handsome. You know him from his coverage of small market Michigan sports. Oh, yeah. He hosts Tennis Channel Live now as well.
good net play from the LMU duo. And again, they're the more aggressive team right now. There's a tentativeness to Shavathapan. Of course, that tentativeness didn't exist with Lulu Sun, who's a lefty, of course, as well. The partner with Kylie Collins, the power tennis they were able to play. Get to the net, be the aggressors. The two got on a heater during their time in Orlando. And yet, I believe now 5-1 LMU here in the opening set. Upset brewing here on night number one of the ITA National Fall Championships. from Kylie Collins just to steady the ship a little bit. Excuse me, 4-2 LMU, not 5-1 still. Break lead here. on the ropes there's just an aggression they are playing with it's a freedom we love to see that here and again there's just disconnected right now Collins Shabbatapan So as we hit the changeover here on Stadium Court, you beat me to it, Super Producer Daniel Westoff. Let's go back to exactly what I was going to call court number eight. That's why he's the best in the business, folks. Sid the Kid Banthia of Wake Forest, half of the number six seeded duo. Looking on Nebraska. Swing and a miss, strike one. See the racket gets switched. As a matter of fact.
course, again, we're keeping our eye on that center court action. We'll get back to it. Unfortunately, no tennis ticker right now for any of us. Still trying to keep our eye on all of this doubles action down the home stretch. We've got an 8.30 batch of matches tonight as well. Looking forward to enjoying them here on the stream. Alex Gruskin of Crack Rackets. Happy to shepherd Nate one of our four days of coverage here. The ITA National Fall Championships at the beautiful Barn Center in San Diego. One of these days we're going to get a replay function. That's got to be the highest I have ever seen a tennis player jump on the court. That is a tops. I don't know how else to say it. From Schneider up at the net for Wake Forest. New contributor to the Demon Deacon roster. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Big season for Wake. Very disappointing 2021. Certainly Coach Bresky is never going to have to worry about his seat being on the hot, or being on the hot seat. Anything outside the top 10 is unacceptable, given where Wake has been. And there it is. Banthia Schneider. Straight set victory over Hubo, or Huber and Moreno Lozano of Nebraska. It's a good victory for the Deeks here. Kick off their campaign in San Diego. Let's go back to center. LMU, how do you do? They have the Texas Longhorns here on the ropes. It's the duo of Trikasade, Dovska. I like the intent or execution there. They've been the more aggressive duo. It's been LMU moving at the net, playing two up. Shabbat has been too content there at the baseline. That's why Kaylee, Kylie Collins was an NCAA finalist last year. Can't teach that forehand power. Surviving. Staying live here. In this first. Ooh, that's some firepower, right? That's what Charlotte Shavatapan can bring to the table. Beautiful center court here at the Barnes Tennis Center. I'm sure, all the other teams are jealous. Get the opportunity on stadium court here. Fantastic opportunities for both of these teams to start their tournament off on the right fashion. And again, round of 32 here. Singles and doubles. Played on day one. Can't believe that return landed in. in doubles, but of course, like that's a staple of college doubles. How connected are you with your partner? That chemistry is so important, particularly in the crunch time moments, particularly in the rat race that is the dual match doubles point. 
It's a slow burn high five here. And by the way, left side of your screen is Val Churkis Zade. Forehand sail a little bit long and wide on her. Starts brand new ball game here in this opening set on stadium court. Colin Shavatapan seem to have found their footing. Looking around at our other courts. We got anything going on, West off on the ground, so you should keep me apprised of. Can we go back to Blake and Ma? I believe that was what? Third I wanna say that's thirteen. I don't think that's thirteen. I think this is a different match, but we'll take it. It's the matchup happening everywhere. That's thirteen. What were they on? Sixteen? Maybe it was sixteen. We see a warm up going on at 16. That match between Collar, Shake, Ma, Blake recently completing. With that in mind, let's kick it on Stadium. We do know the matchup happening there. That's much better aggression at the net from Charlotte Chavatapan. She's rocking the white. Kylie Collins, the burnt orange. And that's how you can differentiate between those two on the far side of your court. And I apologize for repeating myself. It's the lefty. It's the belt sheriff, Zade. Righty, Waska. after that strong start all of the momentum with the Longhorns now to get from Shavata Pan better overhead from Isabella. She's heating up here on stadium. If you're not getting passed down the line, you're not playing good doubles. It just wasn't the ball to do it. Again, there was no coordination, it felt like, there. Synchronization, we saw the movements early on for this LMU duo. of a turnaround. For the Longhorns, they ultimately take a 6-4 first set here on Stadium. Again, we do apologize to all of you listeners for some of the lack of clarity here down the home stretch of this broadcast. We want to be better than that. You listeners and viewers deserve better than that. Unfortunately, Again, it's the day one issues that come with an event like this, and so difficult for us to monitor who's playing where. 
We're going to work on that synchronization over the next 24 hours, 12 hours, I should say, as we prepare for tomorrow's play to begin. I do want to remind all of you as well, you're going to look for recaps each and every day of this action in case you missed anything. We've got the place for you. Our website, crackedrackets.com. You're going to hop on the mini break podcast feed, hear recaps each and every day. I'm sure some of you are sick of my voice, therefore I'll bring on our cast of characters, John Parsons, Chris Helioris, Matt Stachowiak. I may even drag the aforementioned handsome, according to page six, Steve Weissman onto the show, given I know he's tuning in from afar. I just know he's a little bit busy over these next few days, does have himself a day job. But again, if you're looking for recaps each and every day, we'll have them available for you on our website, crackrackets.com. Something else really cool we're going to be able to do starting tomorrow. We're going to talk to winners, to coaches, immediately following their events with some help from our friends at the ITA. We're going to coordinate all of that to, again, be able to provide all of you listeners the complete picture, the full encompassing experience we know you deserve as the 2021 college tennis fall season comes to a conclusion now. Second set starting, first set after a shaky start goes to Shabbat Papan and Colin 6-4. See if that LMU duo can't find that freedom that they were playing with earlier in the match, that aggression. Certainly, Texas has raised their level here. Love 15, opening point of the service game. And again, given our technical difficulties, this will be, I believe, our final match of the day. Of course, scoreboard turns on between now and then. We'll keep you rocking till the last ball, but I don't think all of you want to hear me saying it. Who is that? What are these teams? Like, that's not going to broadcast. Of course, we are going to stick around here through the end. 15 all. Shabbat Tapan, sophomore. Played number four singles last year. Uh, that NCAA winning Texas team. Something I've noticed in particular, I wonder if some of you on the stream here have as well, is the confidence, the energy Shavat Tapan's playing with. And again, brutal loss for her partner, Kylie Collins, earlier in the day. Three sets to Selma Ewing. I think Shavat Tapan senses that, trying to bring positivity, just that extra spark to Kylie Collins. Because, of course, when Kylie Collins is locked in, she can play as well as just about anyone in the country. And you see the you put away a bit. Put away there. For the Longhorns, they're not messing around. Setting a one-love lead now here on Stadium. If you want West off, just flash all the... I mean, I don't know if it, if it goes that quickly, but any of the courts you want to flash to just to show some of the other action happening on the grounds. Of course, a reminder to all of you if you're looking for a particular match you can find streams to each individual court on the college ita college tennis website we are college tennis with our friends at track tennis who we are again eternally grateful to for having us here on the stream and for partnering with us here on, this man, week what are you guys saying we go get See some intense coaching going on here on 13. You love that. I'm not sure what coach that is, but give him a racket in that wardrobe. I think he can play right now. Okay, left with one handed back. There's not many of them. I think. Oh, hit the balls out. 
us. Here's our action on 13. Okay, let's go back to stadium. Just feel a little lost. Meanwhile, here we know. Set and one love lead for Texas, far side of your screen. That's better. It's the aggression we saw in the first 20 minutes of this match. There's again, big testament to the Longhorns here, picking up their level, the depth, the aggression they're playing with. you look for this LMU team just so happy to be back out on the courts As we watch our nightcap here doubles at the 2021 ITA National Fall Championships. Just worth looking ahead what the schedule is going to be like these next few days tomorrow. Round of 16 action. Picking up. In both singles and doubles, of course.
for the schedule throughout the course of the weekend overall. And tomorrow, singles and doubles, quarterfinals, main draw. Also got the consolation singles and doubles, 16 and quarterfinal rounds. You got round of 16 doubles tomorrow night as well. Saturday, we've got our main draw singles quarterfinal, main draw doubles quarterfinals and semifinals, as well as a plethora of back draw action. Some of you are wondering, is that an effect on the stream? Apologize for that. Producer Danny Westoff helping to fix that. Appreciate you asking, Mackenzie Collins, for that score. I'm just going to assume there's some sort of family relation there. Texas leading, setting a break right now as they close in on the finish line. Serve Isabel Charcuzaid. Lefty serving far side of your screen here. Telling me looks to just stay alive here in this second set. Gonna go away. A bit of a fight here. Shvatapan serving near side of your screen now. Like the intention. There from Collins, you can see the heaviness of the ball. Shabbat the punt hits. The serve as well. Hand there, great hands at the net from Collins. Texas put on the pedal here, some distance. 
between themselves and their unseated opponents. from Collins there. Casual. On the overhead put away. Getting points here now. Fourth Longhorns. Take that backhand on the rise, up the line. Beat the coaching player at the net. Bravo, Charlotte Shavakapan. That is one beautiful strike of the tennis ball. Texas stays in control here on center court. Can we go back to 13? I know we have action on 13. Better them than my face, I imagine, for all of you viewers. Although, again, comment in the YouTube. You want to see my face? You want to see the tennis? I'd listen to both arguments, quite frankly. on that backhand wing. It's the toughest volley to hit when you are trying to serve and volley. Work your way towards that net. That ball hit at his feet. The depth he was able to generate there. Bravo. Big hold. Coach is pumped. He might be the one most pumped of the group out there. Coverage there shifts over. Though that response ends up in the net. If we can, West, let's go back to center. Right now, LMU just trying to stick around, force Texas to serve out everything they're trying to win. It's 
a nice ball down the line. Beats Collins to the spot. Hitting from Charlotte Shavatapan. Forehand pace overwhelming her opponent. Knew that forehand was coming for her. Had the hands up immediately. LMU duo. They hold stay alive here on stadium. Wow, that's a play I've noticed they've turned to now multiple times. Whenever Collins, Shavatapan seem to find themselves in an aggress aggressive position on the court. You see this duo just sneak the bump lob over the head of whomever's at the net and neither Collins nor Shavatapan right now seems to have any particular interest Playing that ball as an overhead. That's just too good. Front foot tennis at its finest. I like the aggression, though. At this point, you have nothing to lose. Leave it out on the court. Play to win. Go for your cuts. Good Vasca tried to do there. Just ends up missing a little long. That aggressive mindset. Shabbat upon misfiring on that second serve.
That's such an excellent volley from Charlotte Chavatapan. The high backhand volley, the most difficult to execute, in my opinion, in all of tennis. I believe we've got a 5-2 lead now here for the Longhorns as, again, they close in. On this first round, round of 32 victory. Again, tomorrow's matches, main draw for singles, both round of 16 and quarterfinal matches. We've got consolation action as well. Only one round of doubles being played tomorrow to compensate for the two rounds of singles, of course. Then on Saturday, Semi-finals main draw for singles, quarterfinals, semi-finals main draw in doubles, ditto for the consolation rounds. Then, of course, we had Championship Sunday, and boy, is that going to be an exciting day. Now, of course, we are thrilled to cover all of the action each and every day here on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel. I assume coverage resumes tomorrow at noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific, probably come in about 15 minutes, 10 minutes before that as well. Work a little pregame show in, maybe show you clips from the mini break podcast summarizing today's play on the stream. So again, if you want to tune in 10, 15 minutes early, wouldn't be a poor decision on your choice. But again, we will be covering all of the action here throughout the weekend on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel. And a huge thank you to our friends at Track Tennis, Tennis Ticker, for helping us follow the action. Of course, to follow the links for those individual streams or all the scoring updates, go to the ITA website. We are College Tennis. A huge shout out to Tim Russell, Dan Johnson, the entire ITA team for not only putting on this event, but of course for allowing us to participate in it as well as we try to celebrate the end of this 2021 fall college tennis season. In the meantime, LMU can stick around here. It's a very dangerous Shavatapan Collins team. Yeah, that return goes a bit AWOL. They can hit port three. But not quite what Kylie Collins was looking for. I mean, can you just stay alive here. On night number one against Texas. with a few just choice questions for her coach LMU holds 
on the racket I think of Charlotte Shavapapan. Either 4-all or 5-3. I promise you it's one of those two scores. I believe it's 5-3 horns. Let's see here, Shavapapan's got the goods. If they play again, we know it's 5-4. Ball a little bit long there from Isabella. Fifteen love here for Texas. Coach. Yeah, Shavathapan's been striking that ball so cleanly. It's been the biggest difference for the Longhorns. The aggression she's picked up over the past 40 minutes. So, 30 love. into the body for Shavathapan. Love here for team points and I believe match points as well. Maybe for all. Again, we'll find out after this one. Oh, she got the ball she wanted. Wood for that same exact shot. Two X ping head seven XX. The alternative to add space, go join our Track Rackets Patreon members. The more Patreon members we have, the less need we have for advertising. And of course, for Charlotte Shavatapan, Kylie Collins, they have no more need for this match. They end up earning a straight set victory. Hen heck of a fight from the LMU duo, but ultimately too much firepower from the defending NCAA doubles finalists, NCAA team champions in Texas. Again, Colin Shavathapan advancing in straight sets. And that will do it for our coverage here on day number one. Now, yes, worth mentioning, there are still a wave of 5.30 p.m. matches to go. Unfortunately, we're flying a bit blind here at Cracked Rackets, and as you saw in the YouTube comments below, that's something we are working on heading into day two to ensure all of you fans get the sort of coverage you deserve of this 2021 ITA Fall Nas uh, National Fall Championships. Excuse me again. Rather than me flying blind, rather than me trying to guess who's this player, what's this score, where are we at in the match, we are going to wrap today's coverage here. But again, if you are looking for individual stream feeds, perhaps you will recognize your son, your team, the play you're, you are looking for better than I will. You can find all of the individual streams with our friends at Track Tennis. You can find the links to the Track Tennis streams on the ITA website, vrcollegetennis.com. Of course, a huge thank you to our friends at Track Tennis, our friends at Tennis Ticker, and all of our friends at the ITA as well for all of their support throughout the day. I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to super producer Daniel Westoff on the ones and twos, mimicking and mirroring much of my work and stuck hearing my voice from start to finish. So again, a shout out to our super producer for his work behind the scenes. All of that said, Recapping day one podcast going to be available for all you listeners, you viewers tomorrow. You'll probably see or hear clips from that on our stream throughout the day. Of course, we'll be back for the first ball of action tomorrow. Hopefully have all of the technical glitches worked out. Action starting 12 p.m. Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific round of 16 matches and singles. You don't want to miss out on any of the action. So with all that said, for our friends at Track Tennis, for our friends at Tennis Ticker, our friends at the ITA, and all of us here at Crack Rackets, I'm your host, Alex Gruskin. You have been watching our coverage of the 2021 ITA National Fall Championships. Let's start with the women's singles competition. We look up and down the board here again. A couple
couple, I would say there are fewer absences in this field, certainly, than there are on the men's side. Yes, there's 